Hello again, friends! And you are our friends, and welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through. I'm the great Brian Last. There's been a lot of negative BS that's been spewed this week, right? There has. S*** that! I want to talk about the positives. And if you're a fan of pro wrestling, man, it's a great time to be a fan of pro wrestling. There's a whole lot of positives right now. Like this man, the leader of the cult of Cornette, Mr. Jim Cornette. Brian, I can tell you one positive thing. I have defied Mother Nature. I have stood and stared death in the eye and backed that son of a down. We have survived to live and breathe and talk and review wrestling another day despite the best efforts of the cosmos to wipe Louisville, Kentucky off the face of the map a couple of days ago. We're still here in broadcasting. You make it sound like you put up a valiant fight, like you were standing in a doorway with a shovel or something. No, I was ready to huddle under the fucking pool table, <laughs> covered with a blanket, <laughs> squeezing my dog. But we still got by with it. I, 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 when I first talked to you here shortly ago after this incident, I said, well, there was no fatalities and only a few minor injuries, so we came out okay. But the, to all the people on Twitter who wrote in, uh, wrote in, <laughs> send your coupons, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> for all the people on Twitter who posted, as the kids say, you know, hey, hope y'all are all right. Well, we were okay. But Tuesday, we did, we had a busy Tuesday is what we had, because Brian, you and I, in the middle of all of this, we had done the early breaking news update released on the YouTube channel that will also, if you haven't heard it, it'll be uh, inserted later on in this program on the CM Punk interview with Ariel Hawani on the MMA Hour. But Tuesday was the day they were calling for bad weather here in Louisville. And it started first thing in the morning, said so we're going to get an early wave of storms. And sure enough, I'm up with Harley and Stacy, you know, sitting at uh, watching TV at like six o'clock in the morning or whatever when the first thunder started. And, and, we get the wave of thunderstorms, nothing big, mostly, except they did have a fucking spin-up to the west of us, but a lot of rain, a lot of thunder, a lot of lightning. We're watching the news, everything's okay. It's just thunderstorms, but that's when Mark Weinberg, my weather guy here on WDRB, he's my weather guy, ladies and gentlemen. This guy is not only a meteorologist, <laughs> A meteorologist. Not and only a, that. Not only that, but he's a meteorolala. He's all he's a weather nerd and he loves this shit, right? He knows everything. And he's a storm chaser and he's a he does astronomical photography. I mean, if it's in the cosmos out there, we lost old what was his name? Carl Sagan, Mark Weinberg's next best thing. And he's got the weather team there on, on WDRB, and, and they are fucking crack staff, right? So he says, well, now the first wave has gone through, and we'll have a few rumbles this afternoon. But if we get sunshine and the atmosphere heats back up, we're going to have some problems this afternoon. And he's been saying this for a couple of days. And so after that, that's when I watched the uh, punk interview, and then there was, just, there was, like I said, a few rumbles, and we got sunshine. And I was telling you when we did that update, I said, well, after we get off here, I got to go watch 4 o'clock news because we got sunshine, and we might have some shit. I you might remember me making that remark. I do. And we had some shit, ladies and gentlemen. So I go down there and start watching the four o'clock news and they get about 15 minutes into the program and we get the first warning. And then they go to weather because of previous events here in this part of the country. I don't know if they do it everywhere, but if we get tornado warnings or a certain type of severe weather warnings where it's imminent and going to be here and things are possible, they go, all the local stations go off of programming and go to weather commercial free for the extent of the warnings, right? And what they have now on television, it's fascinating, the weather radar, the color radar, the different types of 
is things that they can pop up on the screen to show you wind velocity and fucking hail and whether there's tornado debris in the in the atmosphere and it's amazing and it's like watching a war being conducted from a command center where they're just running back and forth from one station to the other telling you what's going on all over the viewing area which stretches you know like 100 miles across in a circle what would that be in english 100 miles in diameter approximately and so anyway we're watching this and they've got the warnings and the first thing that comes up is he's sitting there he's watching the, the radar and all of a sudden he goes oh wait this is bad this is bad news. That that's a torn and you're looking at set to the naked eye. You don't know what the fuck you're looking at, but red and green, right? He's that's that's a tornado. If you're in horse branch, you've got three to five minutes. Exercise your tornado plan. Get to your safe space. Your lives are in danger, right? That's pretty clear fucking warning. 30 seconds later, the National Weather Service confirms, yes, we got a tornado headed toward horse branch. He's out calling the National Weather Service, ladies and gentlemen. And then the shit begins. And it, th this thing is going toward Brandenburg. More on that in a minute. But then they start getting other things. Piped. This may be a, a hook here. Of There may be rotation in this area. Bottom line, before this was over, they were on weather for the next three and a half hours. And before it was over with, we had a an F1 15 to 20 miles northeast of us, actually north and northeast. It crossed the river. That's another thing. They think tornadoes can't cross the river. Tornadoes can cross the fucking river. They've actually got it on video. But we had one 15, 20 miles to the north, northeast of us. We had another one to the immediate west of us. The one I was talking about was to the southwest of us. There was one to the straight east of us, and this shit starts popping up and traveling and diminishing, and you've got like minutes notice, right? So anyway, the big deal, at least closest to me, was that it forms in, in, in southern Indiana, and it goes through Jeffersonville and crosses the Ohio River near the, the it's following like the interstate crosses the Ohio River, and Brian, if I still lived in the house that I was living in when I first moved back to Louisville here before I moved back into the castle after my mom passed away, I would have had a tornado go down the next street. Wow. It was, and there are giant trees cracked off at the base and tur or uprooted completely with fucking, you know, lops of sod on them 20 feet high. And it took people's roofs off. I'm not talking shingles. I'm the roof where the drone can look down into the house. And I mean, a variety of things, power outages, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but on the in it crossed the interstate and there were people out driving in this weather, right? Even with the forecast. And I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. But they they have video of the aftermath, but then they got a guy who was, for some reason, had a dash cam in his car and was caught in the middle of it. More on this in a second. But you're you're looking after the storm at the at the video within a hundred yard space on the interstate. Two giant eighteen wheeler tractor trailers had been blown over sideways. One on top of a car, and then on the overpass at the same location. A third one was over the over the on its side and almost over the bridge. So this guy's dash cam, he said, "We we saw the storm coming. And I was trying to get on the interstate to see if I could outrun it because it was coming toward us, right? But he couldn't make the left turn, and suddenly here comes the fucking storm. He pulls over to the side, and this shit's going in front of him. Blah 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 blah. All the fucking." traffic lights bowing out and everything signs going over and then you see there's a car on its hood just fucking in the middle of the goddamn street in front of him and <clears throat> so anyway i'm not taking joy in this but it's got it's insane the power that this can generate and like i said in in minutes a hurricane you know you've got days to know that it's coming but this can happen 
travel a couple of hundred yards or miles, you don't know, and then just break up in, in minutes. So anyway, the point is these warnings are popping up or continuing or shit's going on for like three and a half hours through the whole fucking area until finally it's uh you know everything is passed by but they they have either they've confirmed three tornadoes and they suspect they're they're going to confirm three more that all happened within a 50 mile fucking radius of me and we got not nearly the wind we had last february and about three or four minutes of hail and pouring downpours here but otherwise nothing was was touched here but you never know and that's the thing and and here was the kicker brian what was the date of tuesday this past tuesday this past tuesday was uh today is this yesterday was this the second april 2nd april 2nd what date do i mention every year that scarred me as a child that I recognize the long time listeners have heard it, maybe for the kids oh. they haven't. Was it September 17th? No, that's my birthday. Oh. April 3rd. This was happening hours before April 3rd, 2024, which was the 50th anniversary of, I, I've got goosebumps right now, can't get away from it, of the deadliest tornado outbreak in the history of the state of Kentucky is still uh, maybe second or third of all time. 150 tornadoes over 13 states, 300 people killed, 5,000 plus injured. The property damage in this area alone would equal a quarter of a billion dollars in today's money. And the first tornado that they've got is headed toward Brandenburg. Brandenburg, Kentucky in 1974 was a town of 1500 people 30 were killed and 120 something 30 something injured do the math that was like 20 percent of the population of the town physically involved or killed and the the town was pretty much gone and they have they had already scheduled the remembrance for the they they had a ceremony where they said each person's name that was killed and rang a bell for him blah 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 the news retrospectives they do every year they had already done the packages for the 50th anniversary and the first tornado is coming headed toward brandenburg 50 years later can you imagine those people shitting themselves it was and then that's why again to this day because I've, I've, I've said this before, my mom, that's the only time I ever saw my mom scared. Because by that, I encourage everybody out there that's listening, go look up any local TV news show from the 1960s on YouTube, from any local station. Watch the weather if they've got it. A guy stood in front of a map of the United States in black and white on a wall right? And they had hand-sized cardboard cutouts of like the sun and clouds and rain and with Velcro on the back. And when they gave the weather, they would stick that motherfucker up on the goddamn map to tell you if it was going to rain or not. I'm serious. And you didn't know what the fuck was going on. And so that day when our power went out and the storm and the thunder and the lightning and you've never heard or seen anything like it, and the only thing we've got is a transistor radio. And Brian, it was a poodle radio. A friend of my mom's had given her this stuffed poodle with a fucking transistor radio in the belly of it. And we're in the crawl space listening to the fucking poodle radio. And what they did then on the radio was they had, for traffic and weather, they had a guy in a helicopter. And I just retweeted something earlier today. Dick Gilbert was the WHAS helicopter guy right and they didn't fly him right in the middle of a tornado but he would go around and serve he'd either be in front of it and see the storm coming to let you know or he'd be in back of it to look at the damage or whatever and i don't know you know where he was in that 
particular moment, but we're in the crawl space, we're listening to the radio, and either the the radio newscaster or the helicopter guy or somebody says, ah, we're getting reports Brandenburg is gone. And we're like, what the fuck is going on here, right? This is, a, is the only F5 tornado ever to hit the state of Kentucky, 250 mile an hour winds. Boom, gone. So here's a factoid, and I'll get off of my weather report. But apparently in 1974, the National Weather Service of the United States was still using radar to, for the weather that was from the 1950s. And they had never had a catastrophe to smarten them up that that was probably not a good idea, you know, 20 years later, right? And because of that day, April 3rd, it instituted the National Weather Warning System. What we've got now where the, no matter what channel you're watching on TV, cable, whatever, it pops up, severe weather warning, the sirens around towns, the uh, the goddamn, the whole, the thing that they called my landline with a recording, take cover, tornado warning. That all came because of so many people were killed and injured that day that Congress appropriated the money and the National Weather Service was upgraded then the emergency warning system for weather was put into place. That was some shit. You were not aware of that, were you? No, that was some shit. <laughs> well, you assholes up there don't have tornadoes. We have nor'easters. You just got big bags of nor hot air. Nor'easters. Well, they can, go, they can go to the north or the east or the south or the west with a tornado. See, they're like that, the fucking chess piece that can move in any direction. Well, You, you don't never wanna, know what you're going to get. You don't want to live where there's going to be regular tornadoes. No, who wants that? Well, if you don't live where there are regular tornadoes, then you live where there are regular earthquakes or regular fucking droughts or regular goddamn snowstorms or regular goddamn hurricanes. So, at least we, you know... Uh, the tornado can go five miles from me and I'm fucking fine. The tornado can go 500 yards from me and I could be fine. Or it could go over the top of me and I could be gone. But the hurricane's going to hit everything for a while. So pick your poison. But Jim, uh, before we move on with the show, why don't we stay on the uh, topic of... Uh... Oh, well, just, just no, sell, no sell the fact that you're, you're, you're doing a show right now with a man who has defied death and who has stood in the face of adversity and triumphed like the brave coward that I was. I have the window open right now. Oh, God damn it. So we're both braving the conditions to make sure that we bring great audio to the listeners. Is this going to be a story of if you hear any background noise from a team of gardeners or potential Department of Justice fucking trucks going down the street, confiscating your property, that you, that you apologize for the sound in advance? There are no gardeners in the distance. Nothing I see. My guy, Julio, and the gang were told do not dare come on this day every week. I bet Julio's wife is upset about that. Well, we... <laughs> We will see what happens there, but no one else has any, but you never know. Sometimes you get so into the show, you don't realize there's a bird twerping outside. So <laughs> Jace will probably tell me, hey, there was a bird. That you there was a woodpecker in the background. You didn't hear it? So I'm we, apolo we apologize for any twerking birds or birds I with twerp, wood, in, not wood in their peckers. I said twerp, not twerk. All right. Well, let, uh, listen, pecker wood, let's get... <laughs> Let's get moving with this program. Right. Enough of this frivolity. Well, real quick, let's stay on the topic of you. Cornets collectibles, what's going oh. on? <laughs> you just want to get that out of the way at the top of the program. See, I wasn't going to. There's a lot going on. I wasn't going to be a commercial of, 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 of a capitalist pig at the top of the program and just start shilling and barking for my various high-quality, low-priced merchandise available at jimcornet.com. I was not going to belabor the listeners with the the fine variety of merchandise that can be had by simply clicking on collectibles and going to the store at jimcornet.com where you will be blown away by the cornucopia of autographed merchandise midnight express action figures limited edition sets and more available at the aforementioned jimcornet.com i didn't want to make this all a commercial broadcast brian 
unlike you who just have to get to sell, sell, sell. That has nothing to do with it. I just wanted to get to all the big things we have to talk about. It's WrestleMania week. It's nonstop things we have to watch, review, Oh, so you're just skipping, about. Right, skipping right over Cornette's collectibles like they're an afterthought then. That's even worse. It was my thought to put them here, so it was your afterthought. It was my before thought, and I put it here. Well, if you had aforesaid what I had said before, then you'd have known, you well, dirty old whore. <laughs> I had to finish it some way. <laughs> Well, listen here, uh, I don't want to talk about the uh, foreskin or whatever it is you're just uh, referring to there. Well, then pull it straight back and get to the point. Jim, let's get to the point now that we've gotten past Cornet's Collectibles. Let's stay on the topic of weather. And cloudy days continue for Vince McMahon. (laughs) What a transition. An article in the New York Post, Jim. Vince McMahon accuser Janelle Grant wrote love letter, and that's in quotes, to ex-WWE CEO after alleged sex abuse, but claimed she was coerced. Article by Shannon Thaler. Did you see this article? You've been following this? It's been a lot going on this week. Well, I've had a lot going, like you said, trying to keep up with everything. and, and But I have heard the initial story, had read the initial report that there were love letters Whether they were in the sand and they were uncovered is not for me to say, but there were love letters that have come to light written from Janelle Grant to Vince McMahon that are all lovey-dovey, and the rebuttal at the time from the defense was that she was coerced into writing these letters, and I don't really have any other details because of, you know, subverting death's intentions and all that type of stuff this week, so can you... Brian, elucidate me along with the rest of the listeners as to more facts of this situation. A woman who alleges she was sexually abused for years by Vince McMahon wrote a gushing love letter to the former WWE CEO in which she declared the duo was, in quotes here, in love with a capital L. And she now claims McMahon coerced her to do it. The Post has learned. Janelle Grant, whose bombshell lawsuit landed a day before the wrestling icon abruptly stepped down, as executive chairman of WWE parent TKO Group Holdings, penned a lengthy email to McMahon dated December 24th, 2021, Christmas Eve, in which she called him my best friend, my love, and my everything. The quotes continue here. After almost three years together, it's like my life isn't even real to me unless you're there, and in it, and I'm sharing it all with you. Grant, 43, wrote in the Christmas Eve So she is 43. We've confirmed that. We confirmed it a while ago. You, I think, assumed for what the story was that she was younger, and it was briefly... There was reporting to that that end, but but she is, yes, an older, older woman. The love-struck letter stands in contrast to the allegations in her explosive lawsuit filed in Connecticut Federal Court in January which claimed that McMahon allegedly defecated on Grant's head during a threesome in May of 2020, some 18 months before she wrote the alleged love letter. But Grant, well, I'll stop there. Uh, any <laughs> thoughts on this initial story at all, or do you think he Well, no, I have some, but I'd rather you get the whole thing out because I don't want anybody to misconstrue my comments. But Grant's attorney, Ann Callis, told the Post that McMahon actually instructed Grant to write the note. Here's a quote from the attorney. Frankly, it's pretty disgusting that Vince's weeks late attempt to defend his horrendous behavior, behavior he claims to this day never happened, is to try to showcase letters that Vince himself coerced her to write. His psychological torture of her continues. As is typical of abusive predators who respond to women speaking out, with increased threats. While Janelle isn't a stranger to his intimidation tactics, this is a new low, even for him. And I apologize for any noise in the background, because I hear something now. (laughs) The window may have to close soon. Asked about the coercion allegations, McMahon's attorney, Jessica Taub Rosenberg, of the law firm Kasowitz Benson Torres, by the way, that was the law firm Representing MLW, that was the law firm that I, Court Bauer's wife worked at. I, I was about at. to say, a very uh, interesting correlation here. Uh, as they said to the Post, this is revisionist history. 
No one coerced Miss Grant to write that letter. She wrote it on her own accord. The fact that the letter shows it was the 24th draft speaks volumes. Now, explain to me what that means. So if you were on your computer, like in a program like Word, and you were going to write an email to, let's say, me, and you wrote your first draft, and then you read it and you said, you know, I, I got to make a few changes. The changes you make, that's draft two. And then if you want to make more changes, draft three. You may not make that many drafts. You may just send it out the way it is, the first draft. She made, according to this, 24 drafts before she sent the letter. Well, but now, okay, does that mean like if you back up and if you mistype and you put an S on the end of the word and you back up and delete that, is that like another a new draft? No, I think it would go with each save, probably. But uh, okay, I, I've been, I will say, I'm not see, exactly certain, but I think see that's that exactly that's the thing. If every email I send would have 45 drafts, <laughs> the case, but okay, I just wanted to confirm. Go ahead. I'm I said sorry. fuck where I should have said shit. What? Yeah, the I, yeah. I, oh shit! I put an extra, and I always put T E H instead of T H E, and I oh, can't because of my OCD. Thing. I can't send out anything with misspellings. So I always anyway. Go ahead. Continuing with the quote from uh, Vince McMahon's attorney Rosenberg, nowhere in her voluminous complaint. That is replete with fabrications, does she mention being coerced into such behavior? The language of the letter is consistent with other communications she made to Mr. McMahon over the course of their consensual relationship. <laughs> Meanwhile, a spokesperson... I for wonder how long he worked on that statement to get all the good words in. And by the way, I have the email here, so I'll finish the article and we'll see how much of it we want to check out. Uh, Meanwhile, a spokesperson for Grant revealed that on December 21st, three days before sending the letter, Grant texted McMahon that she had surgery on her pointer finger, <laughs> saying, and this is a quote, I think I'm tapping out today. In the alleged text exchange obtained by the Post, and the picture of it is right here in the article, uh, and I've sent this to you, Jim, in case you did want to see it at some point. Oh, well, I'll, I'll look for that while you're reading. Uh, which was not included in Grant's lawsuit, but alleged as genuine by a spokesperson for Grant, McMahon responded, Damn it! Sorry, baby! Following it with two more... I can't believe this is Vince McMahon. Following it with two heart emojis. <laughs> and then she replied, How will I write your letter? I can type and read it, or try to write it in a couple of days... I'm so sorry if I mess this up. I want you to have a nice letter. Oh my God, it's his Christmas present. With a frown emoji. Oh, and, and she's got a picture of her fucking finger taped up uh, to indicate that. She, she just had surgery, a port in my right arm and just had a surgical procedure on my left finger and there's a picture of her finger all wrapped up in her hand and everything. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> the dirty old man demanded that she write him a fucking gushy letter for his Christmas present, don't you think? Well, let me continue here. Grant's rep, who asked to remain unnamed, also said that Grant had written love letters at McMahon's request so many times that she resorted to padding them with existing material from pop culture <laughs> including a GQ interview with Megan Fox and Machine Gun Kelly, published two months before Grant's letter. In the GQ piece, for example, author Molly Lambert said of the celeb's relationship, here's a quote, the carnal component is clearly off the charts, but they could also be sweet and funny. Language that was lifted nearly word for word in Grant's letter. Fox and MGK are in love with a capital L, the story also states. Yet another phrase lifted by Grant. <laughs> in another passage, Grant wrote, I feel, <laughs> I feel understood, accepted, loved, and appreciated for who I am at my core. You see my heart. You see my soul. There are few people who know the secret <sighs> of making a heaven here on earth. You're one of those rare people. 
Grant's spokesperson said the sugary sweet lines were ripped verbatim from the 1947 film The Bishop's Wife. The Bishop's Wife! <laughs> so she's stealing from the Bishop's Wife to give him material to flog the Bishop. <laughs> That's fucking classic. I mean, let's stop here for a moment. Again, when we start reading the article and you hear that she wrote this email and you hear what's in it, it sounds a little suspicious. And then the more details you hear... She's running out of material. She's going to movies and <laughs> magazines. To get well, that, that's what I was going to say is because I had seen a couple of, I, I'm in love with a capital L and I didn't know it was from, you know, Hoochie and Coochie or whoever had wrote it in the magazine article or whatever. But we heard Vince's attempts at dirty texting, right? And it sounded like a fucking teenage boy well, what does a fucking teenage boy want to hear? Oh, I love you. You make me come out and die. So he, he's, it's like he's fucking... <clears throat> do you see where I'm going with this? It's like, I thought he was telling her what to write based on how fucking odd it sounded for a 43-year-old woman to be using verbiage like that, but she's speaking to a goddamn emotionally stunted teenager in there somewhere and she's stealing shit from fucking pop culture to do it because so of course a, a normal adult man or woman wouldn't be you know speaking in these verbiages would they even if they were trying to do dirty shit the diddle letters and again let me read you some of this and you ask yourself how it sounds does it sound natural does it sound like someone talking to their companion? Or does it sound like someone said, it would really be a solid for me if you could write this letter about how I create heaven on earth. That's yes. what she just said. Heaven on earth. <laughs> and it was on Wednesday night. They got to stay up late. Here's some of the letter. Here we go again. Draft 24 which is even harder to begin after we spilled our hearts to each other a few nights ago. In some ways, I wonder what's left to say after a beautiful evening like that. And then I realize there's so much more to say to my best friend, my love, and my everything. Is there any way that I can adequately tell you how much my life has changed for the better since we met? How can I put into words, let alone a lawsuit? No, how can I put into words how you have filled the void in my heart that I thought would remain empty forever. True love cannot be found where it does not exist, nor can love be hidden where it does not exist. It's not something that you find, it's something that finds you. That sounds like a song lyric of some kind. If she hadn't, and I'm not blaming her for plagiarizing this, I mean, if she was forced to do this or felt compelled to do this for one reason or another, and it's ridiculous, plagiarism's okay, I think, in in those kind of situations. But if it wasn't plagiarism, I would say she has a career writing some kind of, you know, nice book, a self-help book or nice quotes. I don't know what kind of, actually, I don't Har know if there's Har any market. Harlequin romance, maybe? Maybe cards. I don't know if there's any market for this now that maybe, I think about Maybe it. the, whoever the uh, Hallmark competitor is these days. But th that's, and you've got to think that what's the matter with Vince mentally? Either he believes that she's talking about an 80 year old silent movie villain here. And he's got to deep down realize and he probably did. That's why he fucking tried to make himself look like Wayne Newton. That so how could he as as the uh, adult, intelligent human being that I experienced believe this shit coming from her or anyone? It, in that position, so was he just using it for, for wanking purposes? But then, goddamn, can't she get to the... It, it, that's what he's wanking on. You, you hung the moon and the stars and, you know, the, made the waterfalls. What the fuck? How does that conversation happen? How does he sit down and say, listen, I need you to write a testimonial about how much you love me and say all these flowery things about how great I am? Like, what reasoning did he get? What, like, what would be the reason he would ask for that? That's what I would want to know. Like, but, but listen, li and this print is so small. If I get too close to the microphone and you can hear me breathing and it screws up the audio, I'm so sorry. Oh, no, you're not. But 
I, I'm looking at the thought of you makes the day begin. The tune of your laugh makes my heart sing along. Your smiles, your ups, your lows, your brow furrows, your joys and your woes are second nature to me now. That's a song! Like breathing out and breathing in. That's a fucking song! She's stealing... That's the, the what is that song? It's a it's a classic. It's a Frank Sinatra. Well, what do you think of this part here? As I always say to you, the answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. Oh, good the God! The answer is. <laughs> but it's so long. She's got. To, he must have given her a word count because nobody would. This is not a love letter that you it's would over write three pages. to someone. Yeah. Small print typed over three pages. The thought of you makes the day begin. The shadow of your smile. I don't. What Here's what's crazy too. It says it's not even the only letter she's written. How many times does she have to write multi-page essays about how much Vince loves her? Ooh. <clears throat> well, there's a few other. Uh, let me just scan this uh, document here. The sense of heaven is a very real thing. Is, is the very thing I want to give back to you. I want nothing more for you to come home to love and happiness. Even though so few people know about us, the most freeing feeling this year came when we got to act like a couple. Openly. Freely. When Mikey, Paul, and the chef were around us. We never had that luxury before. <laughs> what a treat it was. Wait, back up now. Let's not bury the lead. Who are Mikey, Paul, and the chef? It doesn't sound like the morning team at fucking WQMF. Vince, we got a problem. Call the chef. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that guy? <laughs> he's, the, he's the cleaner, baby. This is my friend, the chef. He'll just be in the corner. I mean, is everybody going to jump on Paul Levesque? It, but it could be, you know, Paul Capistrano. We don't well, know who, the, because would, would Paul Levesque be hanging around with Vince and his personal chef? Or is was that... And it's Mickey, not Mikey. You, let me let me just correct myself. Mickey, well, not you, Mikey. Well, yeah, Mickey Finn, maybe. But if um, when I went to the Hall of Fame in 2017, and hadn't been around Vince in nearly 20 years or whatever the fuck, and when I went to his office to speak to him briefly, and I've recounted that story. It's not for this purpose, but he had. Two assistants. He had two guys that were dead. And this, this was never something that Vince had in the nineties. He did at TV during the attitude era. He didn't have a goddamn assistant. He had Briscoe or he had Patterson. He had me, he had Bruce or he had Jr. whatever, but he didn't have assistants that carried his bags and ran his suits back and forth from the hotel and pressed his shit. I'm wondering if he had his two assistants and fucking his personal chef. Well, here in we, this public gathering. According to Callis, who's the attorney for Janelle Grant, she did an interview. Uh, you know, I saw it, and I don't remember where it was. I want to say it was with WrestleNomics or something, but don't quote me. Maybe I'm wrong there. Uh, but according to her, the Paul being referred to is Paul Mangieri, an executive assistant at WWE. You know, I just made up Paul Capistrano a minute ago, and it'd probably be preferable, but I didn't realize that we were, I was maligning the Italians. People familiar with WWE also said that Mickey Mangieri worked as an assistant to Vince McMahon. Boom! So apparently the Mangieri brothers were part of Vince McMahon's crew. And that was what The Mangieri she, brothers and the chef. Man, it sounds like they got some crazy scene going on there. But but that was what I'm not we're not trying to make allegations that there was any kind of five-way uh fecal philia going on, but what I'm saying that's what she considered she was probably bugging him. Hey, why why can't we be seen in public? What's going So, oh, I'll bring pre and he had his assistants and the chef at a private thing, and, and she felt like that was in public. Or I don't, what the fuck? I don't know. Can I ask you a question? Um, you know, we don't know everything, obviously, but other than estate planning reasons, is there any reason why Vince and Linda can't get divorced? I mean, they're not living together. Everyone knows that they're not together. <sighs> Vince has obviously, for a long time, been into other things. And they always say that they're, you know, Vince said it according to Janelle Grant's lawsuit, they have a thing on paper. It's an understanding. Why? Like, why can't Vince? I mean, now he's going out with other women. I remember there was pictures of him having a birthday party at Cena and Pat McAfee, I think, and a few people went to. And it was Vince with a woman that 
looks somewhat appropriate in her 50s, 60s, maybe with some surgery. I don't know. <laughs> All right now. No, no, I'm being honest. I was trying to feel like, you know, how old is Vince McMahon dating? He's 80. But why do they have to stay together? I mean, if I mean, to her thing, unless it's just he didn't want her around because he didn't see her that way. You know, what would that be? Isn't it the law that a wife does not have to testify against her husband in court unless she wants to? I think, I don't know if it's that simple other than in, in <laughs> movies, but there's something to that, yes. Maybe, I, maybe Linda is still in some fashion, you know, being compensated for her, you know, standing in the, in the McMahon family. They've got some kind of uh, personal agreement that everybody's happy with the way it is. Uh, you know, I don't know otherwise than, as you said, it, it has got to involve financial planning or potential prevention of criminal procedure, one would think. Yeah, Tony Khan didn't even have to ask Edge to go out there and read a love letter on TV. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I just... But at least he didn't rip off the fucking birds. So again, now that you've seen this story and we've read a good portion of it, we've read some of this letter here and we've seen the photograph of her hand and the actual text message exchange, at least according to her side, what are your thoughts on this? Well, th that's the thing is that none of this sounded natural on either side. And it sounded to me like when, when I, we heard Vince's text, it sounds to me like the the equivalent kind of thing, unnatural shit that he would want in return rather than someone, in, unless somebody can do a goddamn a mental evaluation of this woman and find out that she's stark staring out of her mind, she didn't write this shit because she wanted to. That's, uh, you know, so, or, or that... Give me three pages. Like, what? Yeah, I, I mean, it's almost like it's like a fucking book report assignment. Give me three pages on, you know, why I'm the goddamn center of the universe. And, I, it, it, I, again, Vince McMahon, it, this has to be a, a spank material for him in, for in some fashion that he asked for, in, in if not verbatim he had tell me whatever the fuck i don't know because the intelligent human being that i interacted with that still had his various quirks wouldn't buy this shit as legitimate for a second because it's so far fetched and one would think that even vince would catch the fucking stuff ripped off from 50 years ago even if he doesn't know who, you know, she got the other stuff from Beyonce or whoever the fuck, right? I, I, I don't... Uh, yeah, based on his look, you thought he was watching a lot of those old films. It, it looked like he was in them. But that's... Timeless you know, Vince McMahon. <laughs> he should be, yeah. He, when he comes into court, they're going to shoot him in black and white. But With I'm, a chef. I, uh, you know... I, <sighs> I'm just I'm I'm stunned that that well with, with the idea that, that he would he would be interested in this plethora of effluvia. Well, I guess to end this specific to what this article is, and at least according to what I think is being alleged here by uh, Miss Grant's attorney, the idea that the McMahon side leaked this letter to show that she did it, and that they have the receipts they say to show that. She was told to do it. In fact, here's where she pulled all the dialogue from. <laughs> just the idea that this was a tactic. This was a public, not even a smear tactic, but just something to get some positive PR for the other side. What do you think of that? Uh, and well, again, speaking of the other side, how is it that uh, uh, Rabinowitz and Harris, what's their name, the law firm? The the uh, the firm that Kazowitz, uh, Torres and um, Benson and Hedges or whatever the fuck they are. There was another person, yeah. Yes, there's another person involved. How could they represent MLW against the WWE, but be representing in cases that almost look like they're overlapping here? 
in cases that are uh, they're representing the WWE in a different case uh, against them. Isn't that some kind of conflict? And wow, that's crazy too. That's the last case of Jerry McDivitt. Vince went with the lawyers that were in Jerry McDivitt's last case against him. And 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 how how are we to determine it? This doesn't it, this doesn't make either side look particularly good, but it makes Vince look even more bizarre that he would encourage behavior like this if it was unsolicited to begin with, doesn't it? That, that, I mean, here's a Grant's rambling 2,200 word email. 2,200 words? Yes, was taken (laughs) from Grant's laptop as part of an investigation on behalf of WWE's board by white, white shoe law firm, Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett. So I'm glad to see Les Thatcher still in the thick of things and is expected to appear in court filings as the case progresses. Well, that's it. Hold on. That's very interesting. It was taken, the way that was phrased, it was taken from her laptop as part of the investigation. So the investigation had her laptop. Did Vince know there was an investigation and tell her to, like, what did she do with the letter? Did she send it to him? And no, well, yes, but I'm I'm thinking that it's still in. Why am I, why am I telling you how the internet works, you fucking technological motherfucker? They, if she sent it, they've got it on her side too. It could have been five years ago. See, close, no, I, close the no, close the close the window. That. The air is getting to you, going to your head. I get that, but if they had it, again, they they got access somehow to well through her, obviously to her laptop, and they found it there. But it's almost like it was planted to be there, unless she sent it to Vince and he put it in an envelope and said, "Here's a you know testimonial to the board of directors about what a wonderful lover I am, or whatever." That well, no, it's was. on his email too, right? Yes. Oh boy, I'm not well, gonna. You, you know, we're, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna stop the email talk right here. Hey, one well, last thing. The, uh, the point. Hold on. The point I was gonna make is that if this was something that was written to him, even if he didn't want her to write it. One would think the average uh, 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 unaffiliated observer would think that this 80-year-old billionaire, if he received an unsolicited letter like this from someone in his social circle, he would not encourage this type of obviously obsessive, weird behavior and (laughs) and verbiage and language going on. (laughs) And might try to counsel this woman down off the fucking ledge. If you got a letter like this from your wife, you'd be like, oh my God, what the fuck? Yeah, no, you're, you're on the phone with the fucking 911. Give me Bellevue. So that, that's what I'm saying. The fact, if, if they're releasing this as a defense of him, yes, he, that, well, then that means that he apparently encouraged and or allowed this psychopathic fucking behavior to go on with someone that he was interacting with personally, which doesn't look good considering the things that he's goddamn accused of. Ah. Vince, she's suing you. I was prepared for this. Chef, give me the letter. Like, what, like, what is this? <laughs> kind of tactic is this? But uh, Jim, one last thing in this uh, article from the New York mm-hmm. Post. As, as Swami barks at someone. Uh, Laura Nitus's attorney, Edward oh, Brennan. He's still, he's still around. Edward Brennan declined to comment on the letter, but noted that the 61-year-old ex-pro wrestler, known in the ring as Johnny Ace, a.k.a. the Drizzling Shits, <laughs> here's a quote, denies all of the allegations made against him in the complaint and asserts that he is a victim in this matter, not a protagonist. I can't wait to hear that testimony. Hopefully that won't be sealed. Hopefully that'll trickle out or leak or drip hey listen if there was ever a case for like court tv or someone to fight for the rights <laughs> to wrestling gets ratings there's never been a wrestling trial on tv there you go come on there you go can you imagine the number it would it would beat smackdown you got t- johnny ace testifying about being a victim in a sexual three-way with an 80 year old billionaire who was also defecating on people's heads. And then when I left, Mrs. Baba, I went to work for Vince. Hey! Nobody involved in there had a billion dollars. <laughs> well, um, he was very wealthy, though, Baba. True. But still, there are, there are levels to this shit. Uh, I, I, 
I, I can't, yeah, I can't wait to hear Laurinaitis's uh, account of the proceedings from his viewpoint. That's what I'm waiting for. The defense calls Brock Lesnar to wonder, the stand. No, no. <laughs> I don't know if they can extradite him from Saskatoon. But uh, think about this. I would, is, is Laura Nidus, was he required to write any letters to Vince? Vince, you're the greatest boss I've ever had. You create heaven on earth. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Jim, uh, just like this segment just went off the rails, sometimes yeah. life goes off the rails and you need something to, you know, give you a little bit of uh, su mental support. You want to rest. You want to rest. Clue. That's what it is. Give me a clue. Well, what I was going to say is maybe you want to rest. Maybe you need a good rest. Maybe you're a little achy from things that happen. Maybe you need yes. some CBD and the best CBD there is from CB Distillery. You think, I'll tell you, you don't want to get any of that goddamn <laughs> off-brand CBD. No, never. I'll tell you, folks, do not take the brown CBD. Only go for the good stuff from cbdistillery.com. Because a person does not want to mess with some of this contraband CBD that's been floating around the area. And if, it, as a matter of fact, there is a tent set up right outside of Last Manor. No. Where they have medics. If you have had a bad trip on the illicit CBD, you can get treatment there and lollipop. That is not true. However, if you end up here, Wavy Gravy may give you some granola. Well, that's I, I thought he made gravy. Granola at Woodstock. That's Granola. when they introduced the hippies to granola. Well, fuck, I've liked him all these years because I thought he was the man that invented gravy. You thought wavy gravy invented God gravy? Damn it. Yeah, I thought if I ever met him, I'd get some gravy. The hog farm? God damn it. Well, what, what goes on pork better than gravy? That's where the connection. <laughs> anyway, let me guess, folks out there. Your medicine cabinet is crammed full of stuff that doesn't work. You can't sleep. You're sore. You hurt. You're stressed out. You got anxiety. Tornadoes are coming. Get in your safe space. Your lives are in danger in three minutes over in Horse Branch. Well, that's how it is for everybody. But now you can do something. But you can take all that stuff out of your medicine cabinet. Medicine cabinet in quotation marks. Jerk it right out of there. Put it in a box and dump it out the window. Of course, if you live in one of these big city high rises, you could be committing mass murder, but hey, that's a chance people got to take in a big city these days. If you're walking down the street, you're fair game. But folks, once you dump all that stuff out of your cabinet, your window, reset your health with CBD from CB Distillery. And here's a, you're going to have more room left over too. Because without all of that, just one big old jar of the CBD from CB Distillery set right in the middle of your medicine cabinet. Hell, you, you can hide your porn in there now. What? what? You can do whatever you want with the rest of the Hi room in that on. medicine cabinet. Hide your porn. How do you think people consume porn in 2024? Well, on DVD. It's space age now. No more VHS, Brian. What are those DVDs in the medicine cabinet? Oh, surely not porn. Well, no, of course not. Put them in a plain brown wrapper. But anyway, you get, you got all kinds of room in that medicine cabinet without all that goddamn dreck and that contraband and then all that over-the-counter, uh, up-your-ass type of stuff that doesn't work because CB Distillery's targeted formal formulations, targeted formulations, I've had some CBD today, folks, are made from the highest quality clean ingredients, no fluff, no fillers, just pure effective CBD solutions. And they support in two Non-clinical surveys, Brian, I'll have you know, 81% of customers experienced more calm. 80% said CBD helped better with pain after physical activity. And an impressive 90% said they slept better with CBD. And 4% said they were able to ride the edge of a tornado. <laughs> no, that, <laughs> that from is... From top to bottom without no, being harmed. I've got the copy in front of me. That's not in the copy. Well, I, I, it's because the only people at the 4% talk to was me. But if you struggle out there with a health concern and it's kicking your balls and you haven't found relief, well, make your change. Change, change, uh, turn and face the strange changes. Go to CB Distillery like the over 2 million other customers. Now, is that 
10 people that have been there 200,000 times, or is that 2 million individual people when they say 2 million customers? I think that's the connotation, 2 million individual people. Well, there you go. And you can, you're allowed to come back, though, twice, aren't you? It's not like one you, and done. You can return as often as you like. They are a store that does not shut out customers. Well, then they've got 2 million customers going multiple times. So that's a lot of million people. And they got a 100% money back guarantee. Every time you buy something there, it's a 100% guarantee you get your money back. Right? Well, how do they make any money? Well, their stuff is good, so people aren't really asking for their money back. The guarantee, oh, the guarantee is there for a reason. They really believe in their fine products, so they're able to make that comfortably. But you only get your money back if you ask for it, and you got to give the shit back, I guess. But it's not like well, they just you buy something and hundred percent they give you your money back every time. Well, we See, don't have to worry about that. Sense. It's fine. If someone's going to buy CBD product, this is the CBD product to buy, so we don't have to worry about the returns. Well, right it, now. it would be a heck of a deal if you on anything if you could buy it and then there was a hundred percent guarantee they'd give you your money back no matter what. But if you've got to not enjoy it or be displeased or whatever and ask them for the money back, well, that's not anything revolutionary, but still, it's a nice thing to have. All right, well, another nice thing to have is a good night's sleep, which you will get with Helix Sleep. I can use one right now, Jim. What? Where are we going? We're going to CB Distillery, the promo code, and all the other fun stuff. Yes, there we are. You want to get 20% off on the CBD? That's uh, almost, C is almost gone. You just have BD left. 20% off, go to cbdistillery.com and use the code JCE. You're going to get 20% off these fine products cbdistillery.com and they have a plethora of them folks code jce for 20 percent off everything in the house and 100 percent money back guarantee but only if you're not happy and you ask for your money back and then they'll give it to you but you're going to be a prick if you do that because this stuff's going to make you ecstatic you'll be able to hear colors you won't but it's a nice thought to have and Another nice thing to have is CB Distillery. Once again, promo code JCE. Well, we talked a minute ago about the former fearless leader of the WWE, Vince McMahon. And <laughs> Brian, for so many years, oh, if we were to lose Vince, and for many years it was true that we'd be fucked. But now they've lost Vince. Vince ain't welcome. And they're on a fucking roll. Raw. On April Fool's Day, April the 1st, of course, April, the April Fool's TV show is on Wednesday nights. But on April Fool's Day, they fooled Brooklyn with the 13th straight TV sellout. Was that 15,000 people or however many was that? Um, and another, they've got the stars and they're doing the angles and they're they're doing adult shit and trying to simulate and and coming closer than in quite some time the violence of the attitude era and they're fixing to do a goddamn you know mega show while the other guys maybe still doing mega show what'd you think of raw monday night i've enjoyed raw mostly obviously because of the segments that are not wrestling yeah <laughs> because none of the matches are really with any of the things that are happening but the happening segments with the happening people are great. They're happening. And the production, it has to be said, this is more than just, there's a new director. There's a new feel. There's a new look. And it feels more fresh. And a lot of the backstage stuff and just the shots in the crowd and coming into the building and the way everything's being done has just made this whole show more watchable. Yeah, the the guy and see a lot of people there were Kevin Dunn, he, boy, he's the one that's doing the the quick zoom ins and outs and the goofy cuts and everything. No, he that was his vision. He Kevin Dunn wasn't the actual director. He hired the people that would do that. He but they all the camera people, the directors, the technical staff were doing his vision because he was head of production and even though he was smart enough to hire younger people as time went on that knew because he started, he never worked anywhere but there, but the WWF slash E. And he was a 20 year old kid when he started. His father was 
you know, a, a local television guy that had been involved with Vince and was doing their program back back then. And he's never been anywhere else, so he was hiring younger people that would give him ideas or suggestions, but he couldn't see. It's not like he came from network sports. It's not like he came from HBO or NFL films. You have to be able to see this kind of shit in your head as the director or production or head of production, whatever the title is that they've got. And then you need to be able to find people. You can't just have some fucking cameraman that you pick up for, you know, $250 in Cleveland that can do the sweeping shot where he's taking the steady cam through the fucking concourse and into the arena or whatever. You have to get people that know how to execute the look. And even if you, if you rehearse ahead of time in a production meeting, the camera angles for a certain promo and the, the expressions that you want to get, or the, the facial expression that the wrestling producers tell you they want to see in a finish. You've got to have crack people. And then the director, whoever he's got directing, it's a live broadcast. And I'm sure he's got, I don't know how many cameras they're using in totality with some backstage and some wherever, but they've got at least six or eight on the ring, I think, between handhelds and whatever. So the director is sitting there watching eight television screens at the same time at minimum and calling the shots to the technical director, who's the guy who actually punches the buttons. Camera four, ready, camera four, take four. Over and over and over, these are highly talented people. And it looks like it's looking ever more like a fucking, you know, high-quality network production. And when network TV had some cachet to it back in the day. Well, it's the production and the presentation, because... Like, you know, the backstage interviews, it's being presented in a serious fashion. Yeah. And the interviewer isn't asking, I mean, sure, the questions are scripted, but it's not as, I mean, nothing happening as the Vince McMahon era questions were. It's all working really, well, really well. And and also at the same time, it's more adult, more serious because it's the Triple H and this guy, head of production. What's his name? Do we even know who this guy? We remember they announced Kevin's replacement. I can't remember his fucking name. He's from ESPN. That's all I remember. Well, at any rate, it's Triple H's idea of wrestling and a major sports television guy's idea of television, which is better than Vince McMahon's cartoon idea of childish wrestling that he was you know wallowing in for so long and kevin dunn's vision is whatever vince's vision was and that's how he was trained that's what wrestling was supposed to be that's why you know that's why kevin dunn so this is a whole new game here and they they did commercial free for the first hour and thankfully because i don't want him to take commercials during the bloodline segment and this way it could go 35 minutes from beginning to end without any interruptions. But the, the rock comes out and the people go crazy and you can assassinate his character in a second. But they cheer and they chant Rocky and they go because he's a movie star and he's the biggest wrestling star and he's in their midst and it's Brooklyn, right? But then they've... <laughs> And you've talked about he's doing so much babyface stuff and the people like it. He did a heel promo here. They like him, but they worked this thing to the point where the people are interested enough in the in the story that they they will boo the rock whenever he knocks Cody or the Cody crybabies. And so Cody still has some life. And and, and also part of them, I'm sure are working with this a little bit because they know what the responses are supposed to be, but they're interested enough to work with it instead of sitting there on their fucking hands like they've done for so long for so much stuff up there, like we have too. And he does the heel promo, I made that boy bleed. And he's so quick that when they what him, he can make it fit and he can get a boo at the end. So, and and you can tell that Rock is loving this. He loves... He knows the field is wide open. This is goddamn 
this is Sir John Gielgud in a high school play at this point, right? And he's having a ball. He showed the video on what is the the video thing the kids do? Chit chat, TikTok, TikTok. Yeah, whatever it is. Well, they showed video of kids crying over him beating up Cody, and he got shit bleep twice. And <clears throat> I just I just enjoy it because it's nice to be able to if they're if they're only going to show us talk, and that's what they've been doing for quite a while. At least now they got a bunch of talkers. And 15 minutes in, he does the finally, the final cut boss has come back to Brooklyn and he didn't come alone. And now we get Roman and Paul and Jimmy and Solo. Sounds like a Beatles tribute band. But they come in and Roman does a great promo. Where his family above all, I'll do anything for the for family. And he thanks The Rock for, you know, for what he did and putting this whole thing together and they're going to smash the fools in the tag match and they're going to have their way with Cody on Sunday. And, you know, just unobstructed promos from two of the biggest stars in the in the business on the show this coming weekend, the shows, plural, this coming weekend. And I like, Roman gave him a little bit for the... For the smart fans, he said, you know, when we all started making wrestling cool again a few years ago, Cody was off doing a whole lot of nothing. But when he saw what I was doing, he wanted to be involved. It's and so what, interesting they keep ahead. it's so interesting they keep going back to that phrase because when AEW was first announced, that was the phrase they were using. Yeah. <laughs> wrestling is cool again. Well, and and it was very prophetic because I can't think of a cooler wrestling promotion that has cooled off any more than <laughs> AEW. So you you see, they're, they're calling these shots. And one would think that when he said, you know, he talked about Cody, it would be Cody's music, but it was Seth's music. And here comes Seth Franklin Rollins to the ring. Well, not to the ring, but he comes out from the stands because he's, that way you got to fight all of Brooklyn if you're going to attack me. And he was more serious than usual here, which you got to be in this situation. With the, he's working with The Rock, and this is the WrestleMania main event, so he's still doing the the drawl and that Seth freaking Franklin, whatever the fuck does. But he was more serious, and this is when he's good. And you know, basically, the talk is over. They they crossed a line last week. And he made a challenge for that night, Brooklyn one on one, Seth versus The Rock, and it got a big pop. And he said, or it could be me and Roman, got an okay pop. And he left it up to pick it, pick the stipulation, pick the one who's got the balls. And the fans are chanting, Rocky, Rocky. And again, why not? By God. You mean we get to see Rocky wrestle and advertised, but. And Rocky responds, well, you you don't want any of any of me or any of Roman. And Solo steps up. Yo, Seth, you ain't fighting them, you're fighting me. And it was kind of a a light spreading of letdown booze. Did you hear that? It was like, ah, ooh. Cause let's face it, you know, poor Solo in that position. They'd rather seen their mother hooked up to a machine than see Solo instead of the Rock and Roman. But anyway, and then Rock added that it was bloodline rules. And they did 35 minutes, and they promoted the not only WrestleMania, but the main event at the end of the show uh, to, and you know, you just know something's going to happen later on, don't you? But that was a quest. That was a pitch back to me. That's what that was. That, that was a that was a question that was being asked to you. I didn't Mr. realize. Mr. Soli, right. Mr. Soli. Well, thank you very much, Jim. Did did, did I uh, did I ever tell you that the one time, uh, the, the we were pre-taping the TBS show on Sunday night, but it was a a, a weekend where there was going to be a pay-per-view that night. So and, and Jim Ross was going to be on color, so he couldn't be in Marietta. It's at 6.59 p.m. and 
fucking wherever at 7 p.m. So they had me and Gordon Soley do the commentary on the taped TBS show. And I'm thinking, this is great. I get to do commentary with Gordon fucking Soley, right? And if this was 19... 19- 89 or 90 or whatever, but he still had the voice. He wasn't that motivated. Might have been imbibing a bit. But me and Gordon Soley is great. So the very first match, I can't remember who it was. I can't remember what it was. But I asked him a question. And it was within the the realm of commentary. It was like, well, Gordon, have you ever seen uh, you know move like that in your years? Or whatever the fuck it was. It was just an innocuous question in commentary. And he gave me the side eye and just kept going right on talking about whatever was going on. And then when we finished that match and went down in in black for the break, he said, don't ask me questions. It throws me off. (laughs) (laughs) That's why I got along with Freddie Miller so well. (laughs) He said nothing. (laughs) So the rest of the show, I didn't ask him any questions. And he didn't tell me any lies. (laughs) <laughs> but anyway, the the announcers came out of this segment with why would Seth Rollins offer this seemingly right before these, you know, big matches this weekend, seemingly dangerous offer for Seth. Why would he do this? So we know something's going to go on. Your your comments. Can't add too much to what you said. Excellent segment. The Rock was great. The a bloodline, just the feeling. It all felt real major league. And uh, it sticks in my head because I just watched Dynamite. But (laughs) it felt just like such a big deal. The crowd was eating it up. Even the Rollins thing, as lame as it was, the energy in the room, it felt like a big deal. You knew more would happen. Did you see the one guy trying to get on camera when Seth is in the stands and surrounded by the fans? The one guy was trying to... Well, I think he was trying to take a picture, but he went down in front of Seth and you see him holding his phone up or whatever. You see this guy in the black security guy. He runs past Seth. And yanks this guy, don't get the fuck out of here <laughs> so they can take the shot. But great opening segment. And and it's it's happy, it's again when you look at this and you're just the average person, which is who they're appealing to now. They've got their audience hooked, but they want everybody to watch WrestleMania. You see this big building in Brooklyn with 15,000 people in it, this network production, and all of these people are going batshit over what's going on with these talents and in the ring or on the microphone or whatever. And if, if it doesn't appeal to you at this point, it's almost like what you're saying, what's the matter with me? All these people are going crazy and it's a, it's New York city. It's fucking NBA arenas and blah, blah, blah. As opposed to being in NBA arenas that are 20% full in Saskatoon. And uh, then we went back, unfortunately to the wrestling. And the Judgment Day, all four of them had an eight-man tag match with New Day. Why don't they make one team drop the day, have the match of the days for the name of the day? Or a, 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 a name of a day with a Y in it, or something like that. Can we get rid of one of the days? Can someone come out to Deo? That'd be something. Deo, Deo. <laughs> That's not how it goes, but yeah. Well, he works on the banana boat all all night long, or is it all night long or all day long? Did we settle that? Well, again, you're you're mentioning parts of the song, but none of this is actually how the lyrics flow. We're talking about the flow of things here. Well, speaking of flow, let's get back to the sewage. So the Judgment Day wrestled New Day and DYI in the or do your is that do yourself in? DIY, D, do it yourself. DIY Man, is who they are. If one of those guys ever gets popped for anything on the road, they're done. DIY and DUI. DI, you know, just it'll kill them. That would be the headline. That would be the headline. Yeah. Well, a judgment day one. So fortunately, <laughs> DIY aren't going to be in the headlines. And, uh, hey, well, go ahead. What I was going to say, in case you just wanted to get all the Judgment Day stuff out of the way <laughs> right now, just um, I admire that they take their darts everywhere they go. <laughs> <laughs> they always have darts set up, and then people are always playing it right next to everyone else. It's the smallest, most cramped party. See, that's the thing is I've just started skipping through the the Judgment Day in their clubhouse because it's so... it. It hurts the judgment day. I don't want to see Rhea like that. 
it's just nonsense because they're 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 doing their own you know in planning meeting on television for okay you're gonna take out so and so and you're gonna handle are you gonna handle this well i'll handle that and what the fuck and then ria who goes from like i'm ria bloody ria is all of a sudden like guys i'm really concerned about yes. everything you yes, don't want to so see that i'm very concerned i'm clutching my pearl necklace <laughs> uh, so, well in this uh, context here let me ask you this question he's still mr money in the bank or whatever he has the briefcase. I guess he is Mr. Money. Yeah, Senior yeah, Money in Senior. the Bank. Senior. If Cody wins the belt, because he's running out of time to cash in, that would make you think that if, again, this is all big if, that if Cody won the belt, Priest would be one of the first things up for Cody just because they have to get that briefcase out of the way before the end of the year. Has the way Priest has been booked for the last few months made you excited for that? Oh, no. I haven't even thought about it once. Um, he and I'm thinking that, well, who, let's see, who's going to have Seth or Drew? They, at this point, they, they're going to feed Priest to either Drew or to Cody to just get beat because they've got to get the case right before the end of the year. Can, have they ever, maybe that's the angle. Maybe he's still going to have the case and hadn't cashed it in. And they say, well, you, you know, you lose it now. No, I've still got it. And you have two guys with cases, and they start fighting with each other. And then they put the cases on the pole. They're going to feed Priest to either one of the two champions, because how can they not? Because he won't be taken seriously. I don't. Maybe it'll be a, a big Raw match or a SmackDown, or maybe they'll put it on a pay-per-view that has a, a strong card. But uh, no, there's no reason for anybody to be excited about Priest at this point wrestling for any either of the world titles because nobody believes he's going to win them because he's been in this group of maladjusted dumb fuckery. Does that answer your question? Indeed. The maladjusted dumb fuckery. Could that be the, a, a new faction? It probably will be on some mud show somewhere. There's the troubled young team of maladjusted dumb fuckery. Would you like me to move on? Some would say that's us, but yes, please move on. Sammy and Gable. And now, yeah, I don't know if, if they're going to keep doing more of this stuff. I would love for them to keep doing more of it. Because under the, the dirty old man, we had shorty Gable. We had shoosh boy Gable. We had a fucking complete idiot, right? Now we got a serious guy. And they did a video where Gable is and Sammy are training at the performance center. Gable is the coach. He's motivating Sammy. He's he's putting him through physical exercise, putting him through training in the ring, and he's trying to motivate him. And it 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 worked, except for the the cheesy music throughout this whole thing, which I could have done without, and the melodramatic backbeat. Gable was good. He's serious. He can talk. He's an athlete. We saw he and Gunther is one of the best matches they had all year. And now, and Sammy, think about when I had Steen and Generico in Ring of Honor, I thought Steen was the talker. But what Sammy's done over the last year, of course, you know, it was hard for him not to be when the other guy was a fucking mute. But over the last year, Sammy Zayn is a better talker than Kevin Steen, who's his smart Alex stuff and the temper thing that he had him do is old or eh. And Sammy, you believe the shit he's saying. And so, even in some of these completely preposterous positions, you feel like this guy's stressed out and losing his mind over this shit. And Sammy's afraid of letting the fans down and himself down and his family down. But Gable's pumping him up. And it was, you know, they wouldn't pay to license Rocky. At least, da -da 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 -da. But otherwise, but yeah, I'm glad you, you tipped me off to this early that they were actually treating this like they were grown adults. It caught me by surprise, too. It was such a well-done video. Gable is being presented perfectly. <laughs> All of a sudden, in these videos and in this stuff with Sammy, 
and this is the best stuff Sammy's done in a while, and it just kind of snuck up on me. Well, and then they had the match with Sammy and Bronson Reed and the rematch, and Sammy's finally, I mean, they had a good match. We're not going to go blow by blow into it because let's face it, it's still, we, we, we want to see the angles, folks. Sammy was about to win, and Gunther from the entranceway drags Gable out in a fucking limp dish rag type of way, uh, drags him out and, and leaves him in the entranceway. Well, Sammy jumps out and goes and runs to help Chad up, and Gunther's left, but Gunther comes back and jumps on Sammy and beats the shit out of him back and forth all over the entranceway. And every time he goes to leave, Sammy won't stay down. And he's Sammy's doing the fucking baby face thing where he's boom, boom, trying to put his hands in under him and get the people going. And he fights to his feet and Gunther comes and levels him with the fucking title belt and walks off again. And while this feisty little underdog, Sammy can sell and you, you feel for him. You feel for him. You think you love him. Sammy you know, Zane, let me love you. Let me love you, Sammy oh, Zane. Just stop. Oh, oh, just stop. I'm, I'm, you're making I'm a fool got, of yourself this time. I got carried away. I Even you know away. it. Even you know you're making a fool of yourself. What I was going to say is, a week before Mania, they really got me to care now to see Sammy versus Gunther. Because that was, missi- that was missing this entire build for me, at least. He's still not going to win now. I hope he don't win, because we got bigger fish to fry with Gunther. But... You know, it's going to be a good match. I think I called that going to be one of the better matches when we previewed everything last week. Oh, you snapping your fingers over there? No, I, my pen. I got oh. My pen, see here. I was capping my pen because I had no further notes to make. All right. Did you see the official announcement of the induction or indictment? She's had both. Of Leah Maivia, the first Female wrestling promoter. <laughs> that was a quote. Give me a break. <sighs> to be inducted by The Rock at the Hall of Fame. Um, she was the first female wrestling promoter in the state of Hawaii. Christine Jarrett beat her as a promoter by about 12 years and had, at that point in time, 37 years total in in the wrestling business. Eileen Eaton may have been in name only. She wasn't in the goddamn locker room giving the boys their finishes, but that goes back to, what, the 60s? And Gunkel beat her. And Gunkel was 72 to 74 with a uh, not well-received return in around 87. And we can't forget the illustrious Miriam Springfield down in Tupelo in 1982. But otherwise than that, and a few other people whose names we aren't even mentioning, Leah Maivia was the first female wrestling promoter. Again, it's the WWE Hall of Fame, so you try not to go too crazy because it's not, you know, you could argue about what is a Hall of Fame and what isn't. This is really just, let's give certain people a gift. It's not Cooperstown. It's what it's you're not saying. Cooperstown. And Cooperstown's not even what it used to be, but it's not even that. And Leah Maivia. Co- Cooperstown used to be a place you could get laid with a fucking. For anyone who doesn't know about wrestling history, let me just say, Leah Maivia is in no way a Hall of Fame wrestling promoter. She was not a trailblazer. There is no one who followed that trail. <laughs> She's not a trailblazer no, no, in no, that, any that, way. It was the end of the road, wasn't it? That was the end of the road. You know, there's a great book. It's, it's just a fantastic book. It's still available that, uh, before he passed away, Ed Francis did, called 50th State Big Time Wrestling. And it's all about the history of wrestling in Hawaii under Ed Francis, who bought it from Al Karasik. And later, after they brought it back and things weren't working out, Peter Maivia obviously bought in with his wife, and when Peter Maivia died, Leah Maivia, The Rock's grandmother, took over. Ed Francis writes in a book, yeah, we came back to Hawaii and we got like messages from Leah Maivia threatening us. <laughs> threatening Ed Fra- Gentleman Ed Francis! <laughs> Liam Maivia was threatening him for just being in Hawaii. You better not try anything. You better not, you know, open up. You better not do anything. <laughs> she really thought it was like a territorial thing, but the difference is, other than the threats and the actual violence that could come from the threats, there was nothing promotional. There was no promotional muscle behind it. 
her and Lars Anderson as a name forgotten in this story as people are telling it weren't lighting the world on fire no, no. in Honolulu. And, and, and now to be fair, they still had names for the first couple of years to come in because of the respect and connections that Peter Maivia had had. And the connections and the, in the flights. That's yeah, what it and, was. And, and the fact that a lot of guys wanted to get paid something to go to Hawaii for, you know, for free. But no, it was, this was not the glory period. And, and the thing is also, this was not a business that, she started, as you said, it was a failing business that her husband had bought and she inherited. And that was the end of, uh, when she went out of business, so did local territorial wrestling in the state of Hawaii. So uh, Hall of Fame career, I'm not sure, you know. Uh, I would have voted for Mrs. Springfield. There's two ways to look at it, too. One is The Rock wanted his grandmother in the Hall of Fame. Which again, you know, you, you could say she's in your grandmother Hall of Fame, but this is a wrestling Hall of Fame. How are you supposed to take it seriously? This is like putting in Vince McMahon's driver, James Dudley. They did that. They did that, I hey, know. I, that year, I had to ask. Me, who uh, was having to tell everybody in the studio who some of these people were when they would induct them in, in terms of the historical wrestling figures. And when I heard that announcement, I asked Bruce, I said, who's James Dudley? I had never heard that name. They called him manager extraordinaire. And he said it was Vince Sr.'s limo driver. They were very close. And I said, how was he a manager? And he said, back in the early 60s when Bobo Brazil was the top guy in Washington, D.C. because the African-American population, Vince Sr. would send James out to get Bobo's jacket so he could get a round of applause from the crowd. Okay. Exactly. This is a gift. This is a gift thing for The Rock. So the question is, did The Rock ask for it? Or did Triple H strategically, because they keep saying this is Triple H's first year of picking the Hall of Famers, did Triple H strategically <laughs> say, I'm going to give The Rock a win here, and I'm going to put his grandmother in the Hall of Fame, that'll make Dewey happy. To, to get The Rock to do the induction speech for their broadcast. That's right. Who else at this, Rocky Johnson's already in. Who else would uh, Peter Maivia is already in? He could have Rock could have inducted his daughter, but she's she's not going to be in for a couple more years. She's already in management. So anyway, is this a redeemable thing if they do an angle? They're in the Hall of Fame. They're in the Rock speech for Liam Maivia. They do some kind of angle. <laughs> the, the baby faces come out and bust the plaque over Roman's head. Let me tell the truth about his family. Yeah, that's something like that. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I th That one will probably be angle-free if I had my... Yeah, me too. But the WWE Hall of Fame, anyone can get into it except Jim Corn. <laughs> 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 They're going to put your driver in before they put you in. That's a bridge too far. Oh, everybody knows I always drove myself. <laughs> and then they had a girls' tag team match. And then... The Drew McIntyre video did by the coffin. Did you see it? I did. Drew McIntyre is there by a coffin. It looks like he's, you know, at a funeral. And he turns to the podium where they give the eulogies. And he says, look in my eyes. What do you see? CM Punk has no match in Philly. <laughs> This guy's great. Have they been hiding this under Vince McMahon thought he's a Scotsman. He's got to have a goddamn sword. And that's the extent of it. You know, and I just watched the uh, Roman Reigns biography and I know we're going to talk about that likely on the experience, although there's so much stuff happening. Yeah, we'll but, see what's hey, going hey on. let me say this publicly as in, in front of people, but with all the things going on this week, I know that Heyman was involved with the Roman Reigns biography. I want to give it my undivided attention. It's a couple hours long, so I'm not going to just zip through and get highlights. I'm going to watch the whole thing. We'll talk about it when I've had time, so we're not sloughing that off. We're trying to give it respect. But much like Drew McIntyre, Roman Reigns was someone that Vince McMahon saw as a project. And they were saying what, you know, suffer and suck attached. They were saying things that Vince McMahon thought would work, and it really didn't. Now he's not just some guy coming out with a sword. Now he's showing you attitude like a real person. Like the kind of attitude you would get if you bumped into him in the grocery store or something. Yes, and, and he's, but he's witty, and he's wry with it. And 
he's not uh, again he's a perfect tweener which they haven't had in a long time and also which is a newsletter or smart fan you know a, a modern day uh, verbiage invention but a guy that's in between, he's neither baby-faced nor healed because of this change in attitude, and it's a slow thing rather than just stabbing the baby face in the back and you're hugging him all the next week, all in the heel locker room. Um, but he did a eulogy for Punk's WrestleMania dreams and some wicked shit, and then skewered Seth and talked about his match and said he's going to put him down for good at WrestleMania. The and. You know, he's great with this. So that's a, a, a Drew McIntyre has been elevated in the last year from we didn't particularly care if he was on a show or not to now he's one of the highlights that we can't skip. In just the last six months, not even a year. Yeah. So there you go. Good stuff. Again, it's it's the stuff around the wrestling. <laughs> and well, the fans are into the wrestling. It's not like they're sitting there bored. They, they You know, the... Eight man tag match, you know, they want to yell at Dominic. They're into the Judgment Day stuff with R Truth or whatever. They're not bored. It's just that stuff doesn't accept me, but all the angles and all the now the video packages are starting to get even better. Yeah, and and like you said, they're not shitting on most of the matches. Uh, but at at the same time, they understand, well, you know, we're gonna see this match, and then uh, oh, then here come the stars. So the next match was Ricochet versus Ivan the Viking. And then we sat until the 10 o'clock hour and out came Becky Lynch. I like the match, by the way. Well, I'm sure it was a good match. But it was a good that's, match. That's the thing. It's that, well, I was actually it, impressed by the Viking. I had never really paid attention to him. Like, right opponent, maybe? No, they, they, were, really they were great. Both him and his partner who was hurt, they were great when they were real people and, and the tag team war machine and they could move for those big guys. But now they're Vikings and... Eh, but, you know... It, that's the thing, a good match, <laughs> but it's between people that are not being featured, so you'll sit and enjoy it. It's not offensive to the business, but we got bigger fish to fry here. The stars are about to come out again, and that's the philosophy they're taking. And maybe if one of these guys suddenly you know, breaks out and gets over and people are jumping up and down and screaming instead of being polite and cheering and excited at the big moves but just to see this guy or that guy or the other guy then they'll they'll let him quit wrestling and start talking and then they better be able to talk because if they can't they're going to go back to wrestling and we know that's a path to fucking nowhere anyway speaking of talking becky lynch came out talking but she came here looking for a fight <laughs> That's the same thing Seth said. Seth said in the stands, I came here, I, the time for talking is over with, I'm looking for a fight. Who's going to fight me? Well, she says, I came here looking for a Should she and Seth, as a married couple, be in some kind of counseling for anger management? No, it sounds like they're peas in a pod. Well, yeah, but that sounds like a explosive combination to share the same house. But anyway, Becky called Rhea out. We're going to fight right now. And instead, Pierce came out and brought a whole phalange of security guards with him so that they don't jeopardize the big WrestleMania match with this tomfoolery and shenanigans and nonsense. Please leave, Becky. Respectfully, please leave. But suddenly, Rhea's music. It plays, and out she comes. And Adam says, save it for Mania. And Rhea chucks the title belt at Pierce and then does a fucking zigzag and blows past him, blows through all 10 of the security guards and hits the rig and they have a big fight and a pull apart. It was short and it was good. In the, unlike most of the girl stuff, these girls don't work like girls. They work like guys. They have intensity and it didn't go on forever where you would think it was ridiculous. Although I would think that some NFL team would be interested in Rhea Ripley if she can get through 10 full-grown men that quick, don't you? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Because, I mean, boom, 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 you know, the the broken, it looked like Marcus Dupree there. Marcus Dupree, there See? you go. There you go. There you go. There you go. He was a big deal still in Louisiana when I was down there. 
I apologize if you hear gardeners in the oh, background. Oh, God damn They're it. They're not mine. They're not mine. They're not mine. <sighs> and Can, then you, hear we Can a... you hear them? No, I can't hear them. I've never heard them. It's like the buzzing of flies. <laughs> you know, have you had a CAT scan lately? No, but uh, maybe I can set one up. Well, I understand. A, 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 a cat scan. If you if you've got if you've got a cat, I know somebody can scan it. But then they had a girls six man tag team match, and then, um, they we were time for the main event, or it was time for the we were time for the main event, and on the way to the ring, in the back, as you mentioned, one of the new production pieces. The uh, Seth is going to the ring and they're following him and he passes Drew McIntyre just sitting there lounging around on an equipment case. And they faced off and exchanged some words. What, what was it? Uh, oh, God damn. Something like uh, Seth said to Drew said, I'm not dead. And Drew said, yet. And then Seth goes on out for his his deal. And I was I was worried about this main event because Solo is, is doing a great job. He's he's working hard, but his matches are not. I, he doesn't need twenty or thirty minutes with a fucking top guy because it it tends to get somewhat redundancy repeated redundantly, right? He's doing a, kind of the same basic stuff most of the time. So I was afeard of this when they jump started it a hundred miles an hour and they had 20 minutes left on the air. I'm like, Oh shit, this is going to take a while. But three minutes into the match was the first time that they actually got into the ring. It was to set up a table because by the, this bloodline rules. So I, I say, you know what? with all these things considered, I'm skipping to the finish, but I didn't have to skip as long as what I thought I would. And by the way, the break spot was, uh, they broke that table. But don't worry, because by the time they got to the finish, they'd pulled out and set up another table so we could see it again. And Seth powerbombed Solo through the table, but suddenly Jimmy Uso came in and super kicked Seth. And then Jay came out to fight Jimmy. And Brian, I know you'll never guess this in a million years. I know you saw it. But can you tell the people what the Usos did? They fought off, which you usually don't see in WWE. They fought off. <laughs> they just fought off. They got in a fight. They immediately went out the back door. And they were gone for whatever goddamn period of... They were gone. But meanwhile, Seth and Solo stayed out there. And then, no, wait a minute. I'm sorry. They fought off, but then Jay flew back out because there was the Rock. And Rock had thrown Jay out the door, but then Rock went to the ring. And then you didn't see. There go. Anyway, the point is, Rock goes into the ring to get Seth. And then Seth starts smiling at him. And that's when Cody's music plays and Cody hit the ring and beat the shit out of the rock. And Seth and Cody were bouncing the rock off the table and Cody hooked him up and was going to go to rock bottom him on the announce desk when Roman saved the day and pulled him down. But Seth got on Roman and then Roman posted Seth and then he posted Cody. And then the fans started chanting for punk. And boy, if Punk was still healthy, that would have been a heck of a thing, but they've still got that in the future. And then Roman Superman punched Seth and speared Cody, and I'm just, where did Solo go? Because Solo had been gone for fucking five minutes at this point. And where are the security that we established that we had earlier that came out to separate two women? But when this goddamn chaos has taken place, and... <laughs> What happened? And then finally, the heels shook and hug over the fallen baby faces, and then Rock whipped Cody with the weight belt, and then whipped Sol or Seth, and then Roman wailed away on him, 
with lots of bleeping, and then Solo finally came back and held Cody, and The Rock whipped him, and Rock said, fuck your story, and we went off the air with the fans chanting, Rocky sucks. But I, I hate to nitpick, because I love this shit. We got violence again. We got some profanity. We got some edge on this thing. We're seeing some blood every now and then. But I just, I still hate it when people just... It went too long. It, it, it goes too long, and people disappear for long stretches. And pieces of logic that we have established in the earlier part of the program don't apply to a later part of the program. There's security there. They were ready to pull the girls apart. Why wouldn't they try to stop this? There's... So I, I, I like the action and what they're trying to do. And obviously they're heating up WrestleMania like crazy. And the modern fans are more used to this than you and I are, Brian, because they've never seen logic thrown into a lot of these things. But it would be a, a bigger scene of chaos if, if people just didn't disappear. And I assume solo or i mean the usos at least could disappear but i assume that solo was just laying there for minutes at a time till he was needed but if people were all involved and people were trying to stop it even if they were ineffectual in doing so it would add to the pandemonium of, of the scene but otherwise than that boom shakalaka all right, and that was Raw. Strong ending, strong ending for the go-home show for WrestleMania. I thought it went too long. Uh, this is two weeks in a row where the baby face just gets the shit kicked, or in this case, they, two yeah. of them, get the shit kicked out of them for they, minutes on end. They got to kick a little shit back this time, but then they got the shit kicked back in their face. So that's Raw, and boy, was it. And perhaps, Jim, coming out of Raw, you want to listen to some good music or a podcast or two. The Gardener's killing me. The, oh, for this, heaven's sake. It's just st strong buzzing in the background. Maybe the strong... Well, and again, we talked about don't eat the brown CBD, Brian. That buzz would go away. Is there a buzzing in your hedgerow? Anyway, I'll tell you what. There's you a budrow in my hedge. There's a budrow in your hedge. It's just a spring clean for the May Queen. But if you, ladies and gentlemen, would like to stick something in your ears so you don't hear the constant buzzing, or potentially if you'd like to just disguise the sounds of real life and the actual existing world that are going on around you and program your own soundtrack, well, I think there's no way better to do it then with the Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds. As a matter of fact, Stacy just got a new pair. They just came in the mail yesterday because she likes to keep restocked. Uh, you know, every once in a while, she accidentally takes one of these things out. Normally, they're in there 24 hours a day, so she can't hear me. That's what it's come to. But she takes one of them out every once in a while when she you know, takes a shower or whatever. And every once in a while, one of them will roll down between the couch cushions, so she keeps a couple of pairs around just in case, and just got a new pair. They've got the optimized gel tips. They fit perfectly in the ears, as I believe I mentioned. The thing you can do if you just like to help people out is just walk up behind people on the street and just stick a pair of these in their ears, tuned to a, a melodious piece of music or something they might want to listen to, and just watch the look on their face, Brian. When these things get shoved into their ears and they're 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 overjoyed, they're overcome with emotion. They're really they're overcome with with all manner of emotions that you'd be so kind as to do that. Well, no, of what, course, what? of course, you're not going to do that to anyone. You buy Raycons for yourself. You stick them in your own ears. Well, no, but you can give them ears. for gifts. Are you are you against? You gift can gifts? give them in their box sealed as well, gifts. Well, I, I don't know whether you ought to be able to stick something in somebody's box without asking them first. You're not sticking anything in anyone's box. You're getting a sealed box from Raycon. You're taking that sealed box. You're delivering it as a gift to someone you like. I would think. And they're opening it on their own going, oh, I can't wait to see what it is. Well, they know what it is. It's just cellophane. But whatever. They're getting inside and they're excited about the earbuds they're going to be placing in their own ears and removing from their own ears at will. <laughs> the, the, the consensual removing or, move, or intruding or protruding or the insertion 
consensual insertion of earbuds, courtesy of the Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds. And it says here, remember to take them out for any CAT scans. Yes, do not have a CAT scan with the Raycon Wireless Earbuds. Unless, actually, if you put on the awareness mode, could you wear them? Because then you'd be aware of the surroundings. Well, I guess maybe it would cross the wire. That's why they tell you to turn your cell phone off when the plane takes off, right? So don't have a CAT scan while wearing the Raycon wireless earbuds because it could catapult you into another dimension. But otherwise than that, it's okay because they got three customizable sound profiles and they've got the tap functions right there on the earbuds where all you have to do is tap them. Don't tap them too hard. They're in your ear. You give yourself some kind of concussion. And you can completely block out all outside distractions with the noise isolation mode, but be aware that there may be tornado activity in the area when you're doing that, because elsewise you might end up flying across downtown Poughkeepsie. Be aware if there's tornado yes, activity. Yes, okay. in, in good The way you phrased it, you made it sound like this will cause the tornado activity. Well, no, they're still working on that. They're not that, working on that. It. Well, that, that would be the extra added button that they're coming out with, the weather altering mode. But they haven't got that patented yet. But folks, eight hours of playtime, a 32-hour battery life, it sounds just as crystal clear as the voices you hear inside your own head. The Raycon Everyday Wireless Earbuds. And right now, if you go to buy Raycon, that's B-U-Y-R-A-Y-C-O-N dot com slash J-C-E, you're going to get 20% off your order plus free shipping. So if you want to get one pair, or if you want to get multiple pairs and and have them inserted or give them for consensual insertion or self-insertion, if you've got a family or a close social circle of friends that are self-inserters that, that insert themselves many times per day, give them these everyday What earbuds. the hell are you talking about? Okay, you can get 20% off any number of... <laughs> of, uh, of 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 earbuds here, so you can right. give them to everybody you know, and then they can insert them if they're people who insert or self inserters. You've got things to work through, but once again, Raycon, a wonderful solution for those. They go in your ears too. That's a, now I'm trying remember. not to use the word insert. Yeah, you you can they, buy them and you can use them only in your ears. Only in your ears, just like we are right now, Jim. What's that promo code? One more time. It's buyraycon.com slash JCE, 20% off and free shipping. They're going to ship them for free all the way from their factory straight to your waiting ears. No other orifices, just your ears. Well, Jim, little known fact, CM Punk would still be with AEW today if he had just put in a pair of Raycon and gone with the flow, just not paid attention to anything and just said, yeah, sure, it's great to be here. Hello, how are you? Or if he'd have had the Raycons on and wasn't watching the monitor when Jack Perry decided to go into business for his own little self, then the right. Raycon could have avoided this whole thing. That's right, and throughout all this time, then months and years now at this point, we've been talking about all the drama in AEW and the stuff that happened with CM Punk and the Elite, CM Punk and Jack Perry, Hangman Page, all of these people. He finally spoke with Ariel Hawani on the MMA Hour. You and I recorded something about this that we released on YouTube as breaking news audio. But let's go to this right now before we get to the AEW section. CM Punk talking with Ariel Hawani on the MMA Hour. I think I need to do time travel. Hold on. Huh? Premature. <laughs> All right, there's no time like the present. Here we are, breaking news update. <laughs> the great Brian last here, you there, and of course, Jim Cornette here. You'll hear this on the drive through or on YouTube. I'm not here, I'm here. You're there. You're over there, I'm over here now, and of course... Where are they? CM Punk was on Ariel Hawani's MMA Hour, and the listeners are blowing up our notifications saying they want to hear what you think of this. Again, it it's, an ex it's a testament, ladies and gentlemen, to the newsworthiness of our friend CM Punk that not when he talks, not only does he draw ratings, not only does he create controversy, not only do people want to know what he has to say, 
but it's to the point now where people want to know what other people have to say about what CM Punk said. And the people are demanding, and I guess there's some ulterior motive in their demands, Brian, because a lot of what CM Punk says validated and or confirmed some of the things that we've been saying and or the flavor of those things about the smear campaign against him, about the general lack of leadership and structure and organization and discipline, as in the romper room kind of discipline over in AEW as a company, and about the way some people feel about the business. And it was, we, we've got some audio clips, and I, I, but I've got to see, you got to listen to this whole thing. Ariel Hawani hasn't paid me a, a dime here, but it was a two-hour conversation on the MMA Hour. You can find it all over YouTube and everything, and Ariel is the host. We encourage you to go listen to this thing because there's no way that we could recap everything, but I'll tell you my general takeaway was it was refreshing. Brian, how long has it been to hear whether an interview on TV or a shoot interview or a, a, a out of character, as the kids say, interview on a mainstream program where somebody in the wrestling business in the modern era actually talked about the wrestling business like an adult, like people in the wrestling business used to talk instead of, oh, it was always my dream to be in, in the, the WWE. And so me and my friend got together and we thought of a bunch of a wild stunt, so we put our bodies on the line so that the fans would roar, and we got a five-star match, and oh, it was so great. Instead, he's saying, hey, this business is about selling tickets and drawing viewers, and if you're more happy that some goof says you had a five-star match in a building a quarter full, then we're in a different business. And he... He was articulate, well-spoken about a variety of topics or just an interesting conversationalist there, not a raving lunatic bouncing off the walls screaming, I'll choke you out. But also he, this is the difference between a star in the mainstream wrestling business and these guys that got their smoke blown up their ass on the indies. They understand that there's things that they need to learn and processes they need to go through until they figure the business, understand the goal of the business. And he has done that and respects it the right way and understands what his place is in it and how he can move uh, the needle, as they say, instead of going out there jacking around with his buddies that nobody gives a shit about, doing stupid shit to entertain themselves. And it's not just, there's a lot of people that fit that category and not many people that I think that can sound as, as well-spoken and professional and as clear-headed and reasonable and explain the wrestling business to the layman without exposing every goddamn dirty little nook and cranny of it. But it's a business and it's a professional sport. It's not playtime with the lollipop guild. That was that was my refreshing comment. That was your refreshing comment. You're declaring or that my, your, your own comment is refreshing. No, that was that was my that was my comment on why it was refreshing for me to hear that. Is what I'm trying to say. All right. Well, to you. Funny enough, it was a refreshing comment. So you win on both counts. Well, it was almost a fresca. You know, I watched it too, and I have to say, I was afraid for my life. I've been watching <laughs> wrestling interviews for so many years. I've never felt so much fear <laughs> in my life. That's because this place is a joke and you're a clown and I quit. You know, and I think part of the story, we'll talk a little bit about it later on, has been, you know, the usual suspects, the reaction from the Ninny fans, from, quite frankly, the Tony Khan kind of fans out there. If Tony wasn't a billionaire's son, these are the fans that are on the message boards with him. Weak-minded, don't understand the business, believe anything that's said to them by the people they like, and... Earlier that day, I don't know if you got a chance to see it. A lot of the listeners were sending it over. Punk and Randy Orton did a watch along of their old WrestleMania match from whatever, 2012, 2011, I forget. I, I heard that happened, but I have not seen it. You need to see it because they talk about the fact that they did not like each other. 
they had issues. Punk caught Randy Orton running his mouth on him to Arn Anderson. <laughs> walked in on it. And you know what? They ended up making money together. And it all worked out. And now they're sitting there like old war buddies, having a great time. You need to see it. Because it's kind of the difference between the wrestling business and Tony Khan's dad-funded hobby, which is all it is. And we'll talk more about that stuff a little bit later on, but fascinating interview. Went on for a long time. Yes, I, it, it was the same length as an episode of SmackDown, but it took longer to watch because you didn't want to fast forward through anything. Although I've, I zipped out a little bit early when the lightning and thunder started and I was wearing the headphones. I figured, well, I don't want to go to old Sparky just to hear Punk's closing comments, but I got the, 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 the main portion of it. And, you know, that's he, he touched on a lot of stuff. Uh, obviously, there's an NDA on the, the, the what are they, the brawl out, the... The big, the big uh, dressing room kerfluffle. And so uh, uh, Ariel Hawani asked him, he said, well, why did, uh, why did you sign an NDA on this? He said, I didn't sign an NDA for anything that I did wrong. Well, why'd you sign an NDA? Well, you'll have to ask Tony because he's the one that wanted me to do. <laughs> yeah, he'd love to be able to tell people what happened in that room. There's a reason why Tony Khan and AEW don't want people talking about the behavior of the Young Bucks, Kenny Omega, Mega Parikh, and everyone involved in that affair. And it's and not so, CM Punk. So that, but that's the only, because he doesn't have an NDA on uh, Wembley and old Jungle Jack off. And not only that, but he revealed he didn't have a no compete. They fixed it up. They, I'm talking about the the elite and their ilk, fixed it to where the Tony ended up firing his biggest star and at the same time letting him go free and clear so that he could join the opposition anytime he wanted. And, I mean, we don't know the particulars. I understand Punk has a good attorney. His number is 877-50-STEVE. But uh, he might have, you know, might have got a little bonus just to just go away. You're upsetting my friends. And the, the, the fact that that he is now, Punk is now in the position he's in and Tony and his friends are in the position they're in. It's a, what the fuck? With friends like that, you don't need enemas. See, here's the deal. Punk went in there, no matter what you think of him or what side you're on in terms of what wrestlers you're like, Punk went in there thinking, I'm going to work with Tony Khan, who's professing how much he loves me, and I'm going to try to make this place great, and I'm going to try to produce great stuff, and I'm going to, at this point in my life, let alone my career that I'm returning to, be able to help people. I mean, you could tell in this interview, he kept referring to himself as Phil the Booker. He thinks a lot about this. This isn't just a job. When you're really in deep, it's in your head all day. It's in his head. And he wants to be able to do more. And he said the same thing that people that talk to me who love Tony Khan as a human being, love him, say to me, which is that he's a tremendously nice guy and he's not a boss in any way. And I've always said it from day one. You can go back. We've been saying all these things before anyone else jumped on him. Tony Khan's a nice guy. He's not a boss. He's not capable of doing the job of being a boss. We'll talk about it on the drive through when we return from time travel. I think it, the quote was, he's not a boss, he's a nice guy, and that's a detriment to the company. You know, it's funny enough, the day this interview comes out, AEW released a bunch of wrestlers or a bunch of wrestling personnel. <laughs> well, I don't know if... We might read the list. I, I've, I'm going to say wrestlers loosely at this point. Well, there's just the idea that no one ever got released and all of a sudden... The day that the issue kind of comes up a little bit in this interview, there's a bunch of releases. Well, but at the same, these names have not been seen in public by their own families in fucking months. It's like they were held hostage somewhere. Well, a few of them so, have been seen. A few of them have. My God, if, if, if they've had a job for two or three years or whatever, it was a fucking gift. What is this, make a wish? But again, a lot of the point of all of this is the center of all this drama is Tony Khan. And again, you hear people saying, I saw a couple of comments that were just so ignorant and stupid online that what Punk is saying here is wrong because it's never been about the ratings 
or anything. It was about getting the big TV rights renewal. But that's like Vince, <laughs> but that's like when Vince Russo used to say, it doesn't matter that the pay-per-views are dropping and attendances are low. My job is the ratings. He's well, saying in this interview, he was trying to make this a real company. That's not what it's there for. We've said it from day one. It was Shad Khan throwing a bunch of money at his son so he would shut up about wrestling, and then he could have his wrestling company hopefully make a profit somehow. And the the problem again is you don't get the the for the people. Oh, it's about the renewal. Well, you, if you don't have any ratings, you don't get the renewal or the big renewal or the the raise in the renewal. And again, it's it's two different mindsets. The the reason why the Lollipop Guild, the Trampoline Cowboys as a whole, work with any kind of audience is because. On the indie level, they were allowed to, because they had no bosses and no structure and nobody to tell them what to do, they were allowed to do, as we've talked about many times, whatever the fuck they wanted to do, which made up for their lack of size or their lack of promo ability or their lack of personality or, in many cases, their lack of talent. But that doesn't sell to the mainstream. It sells to the hardcore nerd fans like Tony Khan. And it just happens that that's the first time that one of these hardcore nerd fans has had a billionaire father that wanted to finance anything. We've had some lottery winners. But th so then these guys get paid a fortune by a mark because he thinks that he can translate what they want to see in rec centers to what they want to see in NBA arenas, and it don't work that way, and they found that out. But the dipshits are scared to admit it and acknowledge it, so instead they find other people for Tony to be concerned with or make problems with or whatever to keep him distracted from the obvious, clear, empirical data in front of his eyes. In my opinion. Yeah, for the people saying that nothing matters except for the television rights deal, what about the ratings that are going down every week? You can't blame that on just people dropping cable. Raw and SmackDown are not having this problem. It's an AEW problem. The other excuse you hear, and we'll probably talk about this more in detail on the show, but I heard Dave Meltzer say it. One of the reasons AEW is struggling is because WWE's hot. Oh, good lord. That because they're hot, it takes everything away from AEW. Okay, that's only contradicted by the Monday Night Wars, by the promotional war in Detroit and Indianapolis between the Sheik and the Bruiser, by it... Uh, the Monday the Night Wars is the best example of... What happened to the old saying? It's, but I mean, it's been going on for 50 years in the rest, or more than that in the wrestling business. The rising tide lifts all boats except when one of the boats has a fucking hole in it. Right? And no stars. But let's go to some audio, and there's a lot. So we're going to go to the section we're going to start with because it's one of the things everyone's talking about, Jim. CM Punk, London, all in, Wembley Stadium, the incident with Jack Perry. Stop this. Let me know when you want to say something. There's a lot of audio here to play. I'll raise my hand. Once again, this is CM Punk talking with Ariel Hawani on the MMA. Is it the MMA hour? The MMA hour, but it, it lasted four hours. No, because the uh, YouTube page says MMA fighting on SBN. But I believe it's the MMA hour. Let's go to this. That's the way it was sold to me. August of 2023, London. You arrive in London. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I forgot about this. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> How does that go? What happens? Um, there's nobody there to pick me up, and it's not a big deal. I just got on the tube and I was like, adventure, you know? And you have then, to figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Yeah, but that part was fun. But it's completely irresponsible as a company to, you know, leave somebody stranded at the airport. But, you know, I, I, I understand the sentiments. You know, people, you know, all the smarties on Twitter, like, oh, can't you just take an Uber? Will you big cry, baby? I never cried about it once. Not once. How do people find out about these things? That's well, there were fans on the, the, oh, the tube. Okay. And they're, they're, they're taking yes, pictures. Yes. You know, like I'm sitting there, I'm just sitting on the tube, and I'm just like, this is yeah, neat. Hey, yeah, hey, hey, yeah. hey, just, just real quick. 
Brian, how think how easy you think it is to find an Uber in a foreign country to take you to a goddamn eighty thousand seat stadium for a major event, and you're the fucking star? What do you think would happen if Mick Jagger pulled up in front of the goddamn stadium in a fucking Uber and the people saw him? Well, I don't know. I mean, you can get Ubers anywhere. It's a pretty long drive from Heathrow into town. Well, no, that's but... what I'm saying is they left him floating around. And how are you going to get an Uber to go to Wembley Stadium in the middle of a giant event when you're the star of it and get in? And they, there's it, Punk has, I'm sure, worked Wembley Stadium many times. I've been in this position. Where the fuck am I supposed to go? It's a goddamn stadium. I'm on the show. Tell the fucking parking guy, let me in. It's bullshit. He's the biggest star they got in a foreign country, and they can't even send anybody to pick him up to the airport. Let's go back to more audio. Tony's big idea was separate show. We're going to separate everybody. And I said, that'll never work. Just let me go. Just get me out of here. Just pay me my money. Like, um, I'm, I've already been off TV. I, I hurt this arm. Just, just get me out of here. You know, no, I can't let you go. Why? Just let me go. Who cares? I'm, I'm, it's, it's best. I mean, they, these guys don't want me here. This, this, isn't, <laughs> this isn't a real business. This isn't a business predicated on making money, drawing money, selling tickets, you know, doing business. It's, it's, it's not what it was sold to me as. So let me go. No, oh, I can't let you go. Hey, hold Let's on. Let's stop here. it there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> because, well, first of all, what would you think if you were a responsible adult that had put this much money into a venture or a project or a business and the biggest name that you have that has been the one that's drawn the the biggest numbers for you tells you flat out he thinks your business is a fucking joke? Would you not ask, why do you think that? Tell me in detail for hours so I can fix it instead of, oh, no, no, no. Because Tony thinks he has all the answers. That's the problem. You have to be able to admit you're wrong and admit there's a problem. I mean, it's like drug addiction or anything else. You have to be able to admit yourself that there's a problem. But do you think Tony you address it? Do you think Tony knows deep down, but he just doesn't want to admit to Punk verbally that yeah, I know that they're assholes, and because he's there, they're his friends too, and then they'll be mad at him. No, does I he know this, or he's just oblivious? I think Tony is a son of the observer. And he thinks he knows the right way based on everything he has read without any direct institutional knowledge or anything. And because a lot of people who know better, instead of saying, Tony, you're not good at this. Why are you doing this? The locker room isn't a great place. Like there's all sorts of issues. Instead, it's here's what Tony needs to do to improve or AEW doesn't have a problem. WWE is hot. Like all these different excuses mm. instead of, Tony Khan is not good at booking. He's good at matchmaking for pay-per-views with New Japan stars, but I think a lot of people could do that. A, well, lot, of people could, a lot of people could say, oh, gee, who would Takesh to have a great match in the ring with for 20 minutes where they go back and forth? Let me see. That's easy to do. But now, wait, but now, wait a minute. He's not a great matchmaker because he's also had Ishii going 20 minutes with whoever, and that ain't, that ain't, any good, brother. But but here's another thing. Punk said, this was not what it was sold to me as. Now, I may blame Punk in part for probably not watching enough AEW before he agreed to, because, boy, if he'd seen it every week and it's brutal, grisly clarity like we have, he might not have fallen for this, but they probably sold him on the idea that he would be having control of his stuff and be able to do what he thought to increase the ratings, sell the tickets, whatever, which he did at first, especially until they started doing everything they could, including on air to sabotage him. But anyway, let's go back to this Wembley story. I'm going to do this new show. You're going to, you know, you're going to have blah, blah, blah. And then the second day we have this show, I'm sitting in catering, minding my own business, and Tony Schiavone comes in. Now, come on, that's our line. <laughs> Minding my own business. Gets I wasn't me. even there. Like, <laughs> Tony Schiavone came up to him, ladies and gentlemen. Kay, can I, I really need your help? And I was like, what? He's like, Jack is, you know, cussing me out, and he's cussed out Mike Mansuri, and he cussed out Daryl from production, and he's cussing out the doctor right now. Why? What? And and I was immediately like, dude isn't supposed to be here. 
you know, I was told the sh people are getting separated, so there's not problems, and you don't want me involved in this because just like everything else I've explained before, like, y'all need to handle this because if you don't, I'm going to handle it, and you're not going to like the way I handle it. Let me stop it there for a second. Before the whole thing with Punk and Jack Perry, before this one and then Wembley, how's Jack Perry get away with cursing out the producer of the show? The doctor? He's just cursing at everyone backstage? Tony Schiavone? Who Mike Mansuri! Used, used to it from the old days, but... <laughs> um, because... Well, I guess he figures he's untouchable because he's from California along with the rest of the Raisins. Prophetic words. <laughs> so he's begging me. Now, please, he drags me out of catering. I go up. Um, uh, Hook and Jack are doing uh, an angle. I don't know anything about Jack going on vacation. All I know is there's a litany of people that um, don't want they work one day a week and they don't want to. So they want to show up and wrestle and then film vignettes and then sit at home for four weeks. Great. Not my company. Do what you want. But not on my show. That was my attitude. So I, I said, Tony, you really want me doing this? Yeah. And I walked up to Jack and he was sitting in a car. What he wanted to do is it was a rental car. What he wanted to do was smash the window of the rental car with a pipe. And I was just like, it's a rental car. <laughs> and I very politely, because I like Jack, I was just like, Doc's told you no, Daryl's told you no, Mike's told you no, Shivani's told you no, and now I have to tell you no. And apparently you've cussed them all out, so I'm telling you no. We don't do that here. If you want to do this, go to Wednesday and do it, right? You know, we've just talked oh. so much about double standards. And... You know, you've said it, and CM Punk actually even said it in this interview about The Rock. You know, there are double standards when it comes to top guys in the business. Even Punk said, I think I have one. Top guy. For Jack Perry to behave like this when he's not someone who moves anything. Like, he's not a draw. He's not a ratings draw. He's not a pay-per-view draw. He's not a merch seller. He's not a star beyond the mid-card. How does a guy like, see, I mean, I can understand why people said like, oh, it was petty for them to kick guys out of the show. I can understand why you didn't want certain guys around an environment that was trying to be different. But, it, well, it, he was comfortable, Jack Perry. He was comfortable because his friends, the EVPs, had told him, oh, you're fine, you're good, you can do whatever because you're figured in with us. And he sees the way Tony sets examples and he figured and... Probably nothing bad would have happened to him if, uh, you know, if, if Tony would either said, oh, go to your locker room, Jack, when he came by, or anything, whatever, but Tony wouldn't do anything. But go ahead. And by the way, this is collision. Tony Khan was there, right? I mean, he uh, hasn't well, been brought up in this story, but you have to figure he was in the building. One would think he's always there, but nobody's actually said that he had any interaction whatsoever. And nobody went to him to do anything. All right, back to Punk on the MMA Hour. And he had no problem. He said, okay. He said, well, I just thought it was a really cool idea. And I said, it might be, but this is a rental car. The boys ruin it for the boys. You're going to smash the window of a rental car, and you're going to return it with no fucking window, and now whatever <laughs> national yeah. budget hurts, whatever is going to be and like, by, don't. By, by, by the way, by the way. You've talked about this with hotels and stuff. Well, also, that was a fucking thing that happened in Columbus, Ohio in 1982 or whatever. 80, whenever they started going from Georgia to Ohio for the Northern Tours, Tommy Rich wrecked so many cars from, I don't know if it was Budget or Hertz or what company it was, that they, they quit renting to wrestlers. And it was a pain in the, and I think more than one maybe company, and they, it was a pain in the ass for guys to get around up there because guys kept fucking wrecking the cars. Well, Jim, let's return to CM Punk talking about the backstage incident or getting to the backstage incident at Wembley Stadium with Jack Perry. Match is over. He goes to the back. What happens? Uh, I went I went to Tony, and I was just like... Which Tony, by the way? Con. Con. Okay. And I was like, please handle that. Like, please. And he was like, what do you want me to do? And I was like, I'm not telling you what to do. Just be the boss, please. Stop right there. There you, you go. What do you want me to do? Would you ever say that to, when you ran a wrestling <laughs> company? Would, you, would Bill Watts say that if someone came out? Would any wrestling promoter say that? Only if the wrestling promoter agreed with it and wanted to get rid of the guy that was fucking complaining about it. 
Uh, otherwise, no, it's ridiculous. And that's a th that's why I said when we talked about it before, I would have been the one standing in front of fucking Punk with my finger in Perry's face, firing him first before Punk could snatch him if I was the boss. But Tony's the boss. And Tony said, what do you want me to do? Like, I'm tired of this shit, you know? Like, I told you this was a mistake, and I told you separate shows wasn't going to work, and now we're all here, and, you know, like, it, please handle it. Because if you don't, you're not going to like the way I handle it. Did he handle it? No. <laughs> <laughs> so you did. <laughs> what happened? <sighs> Jack came back from his match. I was the next match. I'm sitting there. And I got... I got people with me. I'm not going to say who they are, you know, because I got a lot of friends who work there and I, I, I wish them all well and I don't, don't want them to be punished because they're friends with me, you know. What does that tell you? The fact that he thinks his friends could get punished in AEW? Well, I mean, it's fairly obvious, isn't it? That if the Cucamonga Kids' campaign to rid the cancer of the locker room of CM Punk was successful, if you get rid of Punk, you can get rid of about anybody, can't you? They've got Tony by the fucking balls, the dick, the short hairs, the taint skin, and everything else. And I walk up to him, and I'm just like, Jack, why do you insist on doing this dumb internet shit, like, on, on TV, you know? And he's just like, well, if you got a problem about it, do something about it. And I was just like, man, come on, man. <laughs> you know, I'm going to fucking kill you. <laughs> like, what are we doing, you know? And it just, you know, it's like Chael says. Sometimes he just... Can't let you get close, you know? I thought I was doing a responsible thing, you know? I didn't punch anybody. I just choked somebody a little bit. Is that, yeah, see there? He was trying to be responsible. He did not punch a single person. He just choked one little nitwit. I think that, that showed a lot of restraint, don't you, Brian? Well, again, what he said, too, was something, I guess, Chael Sonnen said, don't let someone get too close. And if someone's aggravated with you and they're get if they're walking towards you, if they're getting yeah. in your face, at what point do you say this guy may try to do something? I can't let that happen. I'm I'm pretty sure that they were already pretty close. And I'm thinking that maybe old Jungle Jackoff made the mistake of when he said, Well, what are you gonna do about it? He got a little bit closer and that was a little too close. What I really want to know is did Jack think he could take punk? Was there a no, second where, was there a second where he fooled himself into thinking, I could take this guy? He My dad had, was on 90210. No, he had no idea in his mind because these these guys have been in a wrestling indie bubble. They've never been in the actual adult wrestling business. They don't know that people snatch each other in a locker room when they're when somebody's talking shit. And if Punk mentioned it on this interview in some places. He said, guys have had fights and Brett and Sean, and they go out and make money. Or baseball players or basketball players. If you're a professional athlete and you haven't been in a fight, I don't know actually what uh, how good you are because all the stars seem to do it. So, and then you go on. You don't have to make up with some dip shit that you got in a fight with at a bar, but if you're going to make a million dollars with that dip shit. But that's, uh, that's the thing is that Jungle Jack had no idea what, oh my God, he, he grabbed me. Cause they're, they don't think that they come from the land of the, the county carnival where everybody's the land of no you know, repercussions. Well, it, it's, but it's all fun on the indies with all of their friends putting on these shows and these five-star bangers. They don't understand that people would get mad about being fucking double-crossed on TV, talked about whatever. But anyway, go ahead. Responsible thing, you know? I didn't punch anybody. I just choked somebody a little bit. Samoa Joe was there, told me to stop. And then I quit. I turned to Tony and I said, this place is a fucking joke, man. You're a clown. I quit. I went to my room and then Joe and Jerry Lynn came and got me and they're like, let's just go out there and kill it. Let's just, and I was just too fired up and I'm fired up now and I'm probably going to regret, you know, talking about all this shit, but that's, that's what happened. 
What do you think of that though? Going up to Tony, uh, Tony Clown. I was about to call him Tony Clown. <laughs> going up to Tony Cod, calling up a clown, saying this place is a joke. I mean, how many times does it have to be some kind of childish incident that happens that you're just standing there and it happens and nothing is ever done to you know send anyone to detention? And then this is a year or whatever after the goddamn press conference where Tony sat there dumbfounded with his bug eyes popping while Punk told him that and the rest of the world that he worked with children and they couldn't manage a target. And he still ain't got it. Punk was saying, let me go. Just let me go. Oh, no, I can't do that. Then... Then tell them I'm going to stay. Oh, I can't do that. What the fuck? He's in numerous times. Uh, fix this. Settle it. Squash it. Get us together. Kenny's lawyer said, don't, don't contact Kenny. Remember, we heard about that months ago. The Bucks canceled the meeting that they were supposed to have or that they was wanted for of them to have. So what the fuck? He's going to go around and front face lock some fucking people. How, how many times you got a promo doing something before you finally just say, fuck it, I'm going to do it? They didn't want him there. They didn't want anything that was going to fuck up the endless summer camp that was AEW. These guys having Tony Khan pay for an endless summer camp with no responsibility. Where nothing matters. Just do whatever you want, work with whoever you want, nothing matters. So obviously someone like CM Punk, who wants everything he does to matter... And based on what he's saying here, didn't want things around him on the show to not matter. He was a problem to them from day one. But let's go back. Uh, here's CM Punk talking about Tony's reasoning for firing him. Did you, did you have to have a conversation? Because what was told to us was you were fired with cause. So you said quit. The devil is in the details there. But did you have a conversation with Tony to say, okay, this is it. We're done. There's not going to be. You have not talked to him. Really? The last time you talked to him was backstage at Wembley? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> he went on air several days later and said he's never been <laughs> afraid for his life like this. He's been going to shows for 30 years, <laughs> felt fearful for his life, for the safety of the workers. When you saw this, what is your reaction when you see this? Not only was it a, uh, it was a promo on TV, but then he also spoke to the crowd, right? There was a, a, a clip that surfaced of him talking to... That's right. I forgot about that. He also went in front of the house and tried to explain himself. Yes. Yes. And he said to them, I was afraid for my life. And here's the thing. And we said this also, you can go back and listen to any of our clips contemporaneously at the time. One of two things, either the substandard legal advice that Tony was getting from his in-house crack legal counsel, and because the legal counsel might've been on crack, who knows? We, we know, saying, we, we don't have any reason to believe that they were on crack for the uh, legal record. No, it, no, not for the legal record. Uh, but uh, so, Tony, if you fire him, you've got to say because you were scared for your life, because you can testify to that in case it comes to it, because he might sue us because we're fucking him. Or some of his little buddies, Tony's little buddies, got together and said, well, you know, the fans are going to be mad, but tell them that he's just a crazy maniac going around beating people up and you got scared for your life because people were in danger in the back. And then the, at least all of our gutless little pussy fans will have sympathy for you over that or both. I think either one of those or both is why Tony Khan went out there with that deer in the headlights look and those unblinking eyes and said, I was scared for my life because somebody called you a clown, Tony. Ooh. I think it was an attempt to try to put something in the field to block a CM yeah. Punk lawsuit. I think that's yeah. what it was. The lawyer said, this would be really helpful if you go on TV and say, you were really scared for your life behind the monitor at uh, Gorilla, at Wembley, in front of all these people that were there that worked for you that wouldn't let anything bad ever happen to you. You were so frightened, you didn't yes. know what to do. Yes, And I didn't mean to insinuate that any members of the legal staff may have been on crack. I don't even... I'm just thinking that maybe some of the people were getting some crack from the legal staff, but nevertheless. You never know. It could, nowadays, it could be pink cocaine, but let's go back to CM Punk. The people in your town, right? I, I believe it was in, uh, in Chicago, mm. just outside. Yeah. When, when you saw that version of the story being put out, what is your reaction? Um, I mean, I can't tell you what Tony felt or what he was thinking, but I never did anything that would make him fear for his life. But... You know, he's a, he's, he's 
he's who he is. <laughs> Did you feel like your reputation was being slandered? Uh, sm- you know, of course. Of someone course. hears that and you think, I'll be honest. Again, this is the first time we've heard him do an interview on any of this stuff. Everyone else has been running their mouth about everything. He may have talked to some reporters, you know, on background, but this is the first time we've heard Punk's voice on any of this. And that's the thing is that every time one of these incidents would happen, it seems like that the the party line over there on the AEW side would be out instantly with numerous people to quote unquote corroborate. But yet it would be like a day later, the real story would be whispered by a rumor or whatever, because punk wasn't out there fucking screaming to all of the goddamn alleged reporters on Twitter. What his side of the story was, it had to go through the, the, the telephone, telegraph, telewrestler back channel of, no, what really happened was, imagine what this dipshit did. And then you found out what was really going on. Let's go back to Ariel Hawani and CM Punk. To be honest, I hear, like, I hear that, and I like, did Punk attack Tony? Yeah, I know. And everyone's like, oh, my God, think of the billionaires. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, they're very much uh, as a part of, there's a concerted <laughs> effort to... Um, I guess, slander me and try to ruin my character and stuff like that. Like, and it, that's kind of the genesis of the, all the drama, you know? Like, don't do that. Don't, why are you doing that to a guy who works for your company? Why are you lying? Why are you spreading rumors and lies and, and bullshit about your top guy? It doesn't make any sense. You're only hurting yourself. Boom! You're trying to- that's, that's what we were saying all along. That's what everybody that had half a brain was saying, now that you've got this golden goose from the start, there were already the rumblings, and Cole Cabana, I don't care if CM Punk walked in the first day after signing his contract and said, I would like to see Colt Cabana disemboweled in the middle of the fucking ring tonight at 5 o'clock. They should have done it. Who the fuck is Colt Cabana? Good God. <sighs> Well, let's go back to this. There is a quote that everyone's talking about coming up. To dim my stuff. I don't know, you know, jealousy, envy. I, I, don't, I don't really know. And again, it's not really the time to, to litigate it all and everything, but like, it's an unfortunate situation. Um, I have a lot of friends there and there's a lot of good people that work there. I hope they continue to get paid um, and I wish them well. How would you describe what it's like working for Tony? <sighs> Man, it's a loaded question, you know, because... I don't want this to be, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't like the drama, you know, but I mean, it's the, the truth is the truth. Like he's, he, he's not a boss. He's, he, he's a nice guy, you know? And I think ultimately that is a detriment to the, the company, but it's not my company. Mm-hmm. You know, I just, I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an outsider. I thought I was brought in to, you know, sell, merchandise and tickets and draw, you know, numbers for pay-per-views and stuff. And I clearly did that. And, but that's not what the place was about. And some people didn't like that. What does that tell you? And and, well, it, it, I mean, it's not like we haven't seen this. It's not like if you haven't been following this business for a while that you can't look at what they're doing and see what's going on. But a lot of people wouldn't believe us until a lot more people started saying it. Well, Jim, another topic that everyone's been talking about are the issues with Hangman Page. and the Oh, yes. Of- oh, yes. And I thought that this was a very calmly, reasonably thought out reason for not trusting this fucking crooked dipshit. Because, again, you can't, you can't just have somebody go out there on live television when you're supposed to be working together to garner interest in a pay-per-view main event and just start doing some tirade that, number one, not only do the fans not really get, but that you don't get. You don't understand what he's fucking talking about half the way, and that you, the guy was not talented enough verbally to make any of it make sense in any context, much less a double entendre co- context. And we talked about that when the time came up. We said, what the fuck was he talking about? Now we know he was trying to put 
CM Punk on the spot verbally on live television when he was unaware and thought that everything was okay, which is the same as punching somebody in the face on the finish and, and double crossing them. But <laughs> Hangman Page to try to out joust verbally CM Punk. Is that one of the more ridiculous mismatches in the history of fucking television? Well, again, he was mealy mouth and we didn't even understand what he was trying to say. Even whatever yeah. point he was trying to make, he did a bad job of making it. He didn't and make that, a point. And that's what I'm, why would you even think I, this is a good idea for me to do. I'm not going to look like a fucking idiot doing this to CM Punk. I can't imagine why Paige thought that somehow he didn't care about what the fans thought or if he didn't care if the fans understood it. He was doing it for an audience of the locker room from fucking Rosita. Well, and as we'll hear here, uh, here twice there, as we'll hear here, they talked about what they were going to do before they went out there and plans changed on the spot. Let's go to this. How this all started. So then we go to the the feud with Hangman Page, right? Adam Page. And it seems like, correct me if I'm wrong, when you debut in August of 2021, up until like the spring of 2022, it's pretty good times, right? You have that great... I, I thought so, yeah. But then when he says, I'm not here to just, you know, fight you, I'm here to protect you or protect the locker room from you, right? Yeah. In so many words. And the story is that he, you know, went off script, so to speak, and really pissed you off by saying that. Did you feel like that was the first time that your reputation, that your character was being slandered? What, what he said didn't it, it didn't, it didn't matter to me. But um, when you sit, you know, peeling, peeling the curtain back, ladies and gentlemen, and again. And let me say something. This is something he mentioned multiple times in this interview, Jim. He's uncomfortable doing, even though he's doing it here. Yeah. He's still uncomfortable with the idea of talking about behind the scenes in front of the camera. Well, you know, one of the comments that he made was, you know, everybody's talking about pipe bombs or shoot promos. He never, and if you think about this, it's true. He never says anything that exposes the business itself. He refers to shit that fans know is true in some way or says things they know that he's not supposed to say on television, uh, but he doesn't expose the business in any of his interviews. And... You know, and I don't blame him for it's, I mean, it's stupid anyway, but it's like nuclear disarmament, you know, it's, it's past the point of where anybody's going to give anything up, but he's the only one with a proper outlook on it. That's a problem when the boss doesn't have one, but let's go back to CM Punk talking about the issues with Hangman Page or the origin of the issues. And if you want to believe all the bad things about me, please do just leave me alone. Um, if I'm working with you and we sit and we talk and, you know, like I, I think one of the biggest criticisms about WWE was it's overly scripted. Mm. There's writers, you know, pro wrestlers don't need writers. Some people don't. Some people do. Some people prefer it. Right. It's, you know, uh, but I sat down with them. And we hammered, I was very gracious, hammered out this promo. Oh, if you say this, what if you say this? Okay, I'll say this. Oh, if you say that, I'll say this. Okay, great. Great? Yeah, awesome. Great. And then he proceeds to go on live TV and not say any of the shit that we talked about. <laughs> I can't hear him because the crowd's so loud and I'm looking at him and I have to really pay attention to what he's saying because my responses matter. I can't just say what I had planned because it's not going to match what he's saying to me. And he's Bingo. saying some shit, and I don't know what he's talking about. And I'm just like, man, why would you... If you remember the promo, just the look, Punk was kind of leaned over a little bit, almost like he was half listening and half looking yes. at the mouth of Adam Page to try to see what he's saying. Well, and, and also one of his comments, pay, or Punk's comments to Page was, man, I, I don't know where you're coming from or why you're saying these things, because he's like, what the fuck are you doing? You do this. Why would you, why would you ruin... TV is very expensive. You know, every minute of TV is hundreds of thousands of dollars between production and all that stuff. And you're just shitting on me and you're shitting on the business. Why would you do this? And I knew the promo ended with him punching me. And there's very, I had to fight the, just double leg him. Just double leg. Why, why is he doing this? I don't know what's going on, but I was a professional. And afterwards, I spoke to him and I was like, why did you do that? And, you know, <laughs> he thinks I got one of his friends um, who hasn't been fired, fired. 
but I went to Boom! Tony's. Boom! <laughs> All that, and again, has anybody overlooked the fact that Colt Cabana, whose best years that he never had to begin with are far behind him, and he was just patient zero for comedy fucking wrestling, has still been drawing a check from Tony Khan for five years. You never see him. Nobody misses him, but he's still getting paid. He wasn't fired. The only time he was on the goddamn television, whether Punk was there or not, is when the friends brought him back to put him on one week after Punk was gone just to get back at Punk. And Jericho. And Jericho. Remember Jericho had the match with him. Yes. Well, I mean, all the friends. And because Jericho's a fake friend, he'll he's latched on because that's his retirement plan. So, again, the whole thing was bullshit. But that's probably, to save face, what Colt Cabana was going around and telling, well, they'd put me on TV if he wasn't here. Yeah, no, they wouldn't put you on TV because you suck. Fuck. Anyway, I'm sorry. Editorial time. And the lawyer, and I said, you need to fix that. Because if I do, you're not going to like the way I fix it. And I thought I was being professional by not just murdering him on television. <laughs> you know? Uh, it's, uh, sorry, I know I know some people are going to be upset about that. And some people are going to be like, oh, he's talking about this guy again. Uh, but with me, respect is the default. I respect everybody until you do something that makes me lose my respect for you. And I had never done anything to any of those guys. If they're basing how their attitude is towards me based on some bullshit their friend told them, well, I can't help you. But I got plenty of friends who don't like certain people and I keep relationships business. Right. Right. Uh, and yeah, that's uh, everything went off the rails from there. It's that's, a shame. And that's really where everything, I mean, there were incidents before that the Bobby fish match is one that people look at, but punk was mostly tied up in this feud with MJF, which was the, maybe the highlight of AEW's five years so far, that feud. Yeah. As soon as that feud ended and he had the mix with Jen pop, you know, all of a sudden <laughs> there were some issues. And, you know, but again, it's nice to hear a responsible, reasonable adult in a wrestling business tell what happened. He didn't want bullshit, but he wasn't going to put up with bullshit. He didn't want to fucking punch people, but he had exhausted all of the, the opportunities for requests he had to the guy running the fucking company to do something about the children that were slandering him. And he'd asked to be let go. <laughs> and he did, what, the, what the fuck else could he have done at that point? You won't let me go. You won't stop these fucking assholes. You won't get everybody together and come to fucking Jesus. Lord knows we're not ever going to work and take advantage of this by making you some money. So what the fuck else was there left? But him to just say, tell you what, next time you do that, I'm going to fucking pop you. What other... <laughs> Was he supposed to fucking no-show and just stay home? I bet he'd still got his check if he'd have done that. He would have still been paid, absolutely. Well, let's talk about this now, Jim. Let's go a little bit forward. Again, there's a lot of audio. We encourage everyone to check out the full interview on the MMA Hour. Even the little angle he shot afterwards. I don't know why he's doing angles on his <laughs> show with Rhea Ripley and Becky Lynch. <laughs> well, that's so they could clip it for Raw. But, Jim, let's go to this. This is going to be Punk talking about the aftermath of everything that happened in Chicago with him and the Young Bucks and Kenny Omega brawl out, as we call it now, his relationship with AEW after that, right after that. Let's go to this. So you, so you, you go away, and it's kind of good timing because obviously you never want to get hurt, but we don't know if you're suspended, if you're hurt, if you're recovering from surgery, you just disappear. Did you ever get close to being let go at that point? You said at the beginning of all this, you said, please, you know, let's just do it here. Well, nobody in the company spoke to me for, I don't know, six six months? How's that possible? I don't know. I Not paid, a soul. <laughs> paid for my surgery, booked my surgery. See, how is that possible? How is that I, possible? Uh, I don't know. And Top he doesn't stars know injured either. under contract. No one talks to him? Well, you know, when uh, th that would normally fall under the heading of talent relations, but I understand the head of talent relations was real f good friends with the buckaroos, and that might fall under the legal, but the legal head, I understand, was 
quite close friends with a number of the boys, including in that camp. Um, it, it, let's I'm trying to think who in charge of anything was a friend of CM Punk's besides Tony, who was scared to call him. So yeah, he's about to tell you, but yeah, if he hadn't have already had history with Andrews in Birmingham, he might still be one armed. He had to do his own surgery, his own rehab, his own goddamn everything. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Well, let's go back to this. And again, we have a few more things we're going to play here, but here's CM Punk once again, talking about after everything at brawl out, you know, thankfully Dr. Sampson, who I knew from WWE, I have a good rapport with, like he helped me with that, but like all, I was on my own and all that stuff. And you know, if you think I deserve to be, you know, fired or treated like that, that's your opinion. It's none of my business what you think of me, but, um, it, like, you know, doing this one and the recovery for this one, based on how the recovery went for that one, I'm just like, man, it's, it's night and day. The comparison between, you know, places where there's structure. He's talking about his triceps, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when he says this one and this one. He's talking about his two different triceps interviews. Uh, interviews uh, injuries. <laughs> injuries. For those who haven't realized, they're two different arms that he got hurt on. It was uh, not the same arm two years in a row. Let's yeah, go. and and uh, also I said Dr. Andrews. He's the guy that used to do everybody in Birmingham. He might be dead now. He no, was old alive. back then. Is he okay? Well, James good. Andrews, he's yeah. done a lot of good work. But of course, it's Doc Samson, the man of bronze. But um, but also he book his own surgery, do his own physical therapy, etc. No support from the office. That's uh, again, he's making the statement. Now he's hurt. He's got support. He's ahead of schedule because they've got a world-class team of everybody involved in their athlete's recovery. Whereas before it was, oh, he's, he's hurt. Well, we ought to call him someday. This is what we've always said. If you're a wrestler who has the choice of the two companies, you have structure, you have management, especially now with Vince out of the way. And Nick Khan is a competent executive. You can't take that away from him. You have competency on top. There's that, and then there's, we can get a bunch of money to do whatever we want, no structure, but that also means I'll show up at the arena with no idea what's going on. It's a complete mess, but it's run by someone with enough money that they can just keep it floating. Now you hear what he's saying, you hear what it's like on the other side. Let's go back to this. And there's protocols, and there's professional people in charge of things, and I'm not having to research and find a, a, a PT spot. You know, I had, I had no help, N like nothing. And that's insane to me. Is that how they treat the Jaguars players? I don't know. <laughs> oh, you know, hey, but... hold on. Yeah. I saw a comment. I've watched this on YouTube, the MMA Hour with Ariel Hawani. We love you, Ariel. Everybody needs to listen to this thing. But some of the comments, one of the comments was from a football fan, apparently, who said the Jaguars are... The, the league did some kind of survey with the players of how they felt that, and how they rated their treatment by their team with certain things like the food and the medical care of the family, the way they take care of the families. And the Jaguars got D's and F's in everything and said that actually because they couldn't give a grade to the player's family room because there's not one provided, so they've seen players' wives breastfeeding their kids on the floor of the public bathroom. So that's how they treat the Jaguars. So maybe if you're a football player, you might ought to steer clear of that thing too. We've been hearing more and more stories about this function with the Jaguars lately. And again, the problem is, if you're a baseball fan, Tony Khan is Jeff Wilpon. The really rich, successful guy put his kid who's been rich because his dad is rich in charge of the things he likes that he loves, and he's not good at it, but he loves them. Well, let's go back to CM Punk. Again, there's a lot of audio here. Let's go to CM Punk talking about when he returned to AEW right before Collision started. I guess when Collision started. Let's go to this. Could you tell, though, right away, I mean, you mentioned the, the Jack, you know, conversation, but could you tell right away that nothing much had changed? That it was, like, was there a moment there where you're like, you know what, this could work? This no. is nice. No. No. <laughs> no, I knew. I was like, this is, it's, it's never going to work. And I, yeah, I, you can't, that's, that's not the way you facilitate things. 
I, you know, let me just stop it there. I think part of it is, you know how every now and then you hear about like the girl that dates the guy because she thinks she could fix him. Yes. There's no wrestler that's going to be able to go to AEW and fix it. There's probably no human being that's going to be able to go to AEW and fix the problem, the institutional problems there. And Punk may be case zero is someone who, actually Cody, uh, before Punk, who found out the hard way. You can go in there, you can think Tony's a nice guy, you can realize he has all the money in the world. Nothing's ever going to change. The chaos is only going to become more chaotic. The bigger star you are and the more serious you are about your career and wrestling in general, the crazier you will get, the quicker that you will get there if you work there. It's for the indie guys that desperately dream about being on television. It's for the veterans who have outlived their usefulness for the WWE and want guaranteed money in the sunset of their careers. And there's not a lot in between right now. And if poor MJF, I, I hope he's out the rest of the year and I hope he stays undercover and doesn't speak in public and nobody hears about him because they have to forget everything they saw from him the previous six months. And then maybe he'll be free to pursue a life of religious freedom. But it, it's, it's, it's either the young guys that are glad to be on TV or the old guys that are glad to get a pension. And I don't see anything in between. And that's where all the money is. Let's go back to CM Punk talking with Ariel Hawani. You know, and I always, I'll always go back to so many different stories in wrestling about people flying off the handle and socking each other and then going on to make money. And how many times does it happen on a basketball court? How many times? Like, it happened a couple of years ago in an NHL practice game, like the, the St. Louis Blues started beating the shit out of each other. It's just like, I, you know, I don't know. To, to me, that's, that's life and that's where I come from. And to other people, it's like the most outrageous thing in the world. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm the devil. No, you're not. It's Adam Cole. Well, no, it's not. You don't want your locker room fighting, obviously. Well, you don't want your uh, Tony Khan has been quoted, uh, at least has been uh, not maybe not quoted, but it's been referenced that he said, well, you know, if the guys have some tension, it's like Brett and Sean, right? The difference is they were two professionals that stood to make a, a ton of money for the time, even a good, good amount of money for now, but a ton of money for the time working with each other, whether they liked each other or not. And I can understand if you didn't want to work some with somebody on an indie for 500 bucks. Okay, fine. Hey, who gives a shit? But for main event pay-per-view payoffs of six figures back in those days, 25 years ago. Yes. But they, they, that's, they had to be, they were adults and they were great talents and they knew what the business was. And that doesn't apply to most of the people that punk is talking about here. Well, Jim, a couple more clips here, and then we'll wrap it up once again. And the MMA Hour with Ariel Hawani. Everyone should check out this episode. Newsworthy, to say the least. Here's Punk talking about AEW's business and his role being brought in and how he thought he was brought in to make money, but what the AEW business model is really all about. Regarding your time in AEW, is there anything that you're proud of? Yeah, because I, I think people expect me to be like, bleh, bleh, burn it all down, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I made a lot of great friends there, um, which is ironic because I'm the guy that's just like, oh, I'm not here to make friends. I'm here to make money. But again, the people you work with, you know, you, you, know, you wind up becoming friends with. Um, and I did, I did cool stuff. I got to work with Sting. You know, let's talk about like a weird thing. Like it's not even on the bucket list because it's just something you don't consider that is a possibility. You know, I worked, I worked with Sting in the Greensboro Coliseum. Like, it's fucking wild. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's pretty crazy. Um, I apologize. I accidentally pressed the button and sped him up there. It wasn't oh. CM Punk all of a sudden speeding up. I did that, but let's go back to CM Punk. I, I think the positives definitely outweigh, you know, the negatives. Really? It's, yeah, I just, I, I, I look at it more like I was, <laughs> I thought I was. I thought I was coming in to to help 
to help business. Um, if I could teach something, great. Uh, and I, I think I was just brought in for other reasons, you know, like the, 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 their, their business. And I know a lot of people are gonna be upset. It's just not predicated. It's not a real business. It's not about. <laughs> what do you mean by that? It's not about selling tickets. It's not about drawing money. It's not about making money. It's just not. What's it about? I don't know. Really? I, I, I think have a good mattress, <laughs> maybe. And there's nothing wrong with that. I was recently at an indie show. Well, let me stop it here. He goes into some advice that he gave someone at an indie show that was actually pretty interesting. But let's talk about the big things there, that AEW is not a real business, that it's not predicated on the traditional things that professional wrestling promotions were predicated on, making money, drawing money, in the modern era, pay-per-view, merch, ticket sales. Even if you want to believe it's all about just the rights fee, you still can't pretend that it, this has all been run right. And just because Tony had hundreds of millions of dollars to throw at this, you can't pretend that there weren't ways he could have been more successful, even with his success. Well, but again, for the people say, well, it's all about the rights fee renewal. Well, you got to have the ratings to get that, or the better ratings you get, the more renewal you're going to get, right? I mean, you know. And and then, why are the fans sitting there going? Well, it's all about the rights fee. If the program sucks, if the I mean, Heaven's Gate is that too old of a reference now? That's that's recent history to me. But they poured a hundred million dollars or whatever it was at a rotten movie. I was going to say the movie or the cult. Well, no, the movie. You know, you, you can have all the money in the world and still make a bad fucking show. So it, it, so I don't know why that the fans say, well, if only they get the the renewal, then they can keep doing this. It's, it keeps sucking. The show is bad. It is not, not good. And if the ratings are not good because the show is not good, then the renewal will not be good. This kind of all works hand in hand. And the network doesn't give a shit if fucking, what's one of their goddamn darlings, if the goddamn, you know. Charles Barkley. Uh, uh, no, the, the acclaimed oh. have a fucking. I think the network. No, I'm saying the, the network doesn't care if the acclaimed have an eight-star match with goddamn light switch white and. Poor old juice, we hardly knew ye. They don't care. They just care if people are watching and they ain't gonna watch if it ain't any good and they're already quitting watching because it ain't any good. Well, Jim, let's go to CM Punk. This may be the last clip we play from this interview. Asked if he thinks that AEW will continue to exist in the future. Do you think they'll be around, like, given the fact that you say, like, it's... Oof. Will they be around in... This is a loaded question. Uh, I think... No, it's... I, it's you, three, like the company? Yeah. As a whole? Yeah. I think it it's always going to exist as long as Tony wants to put money into it. Okay. There you have but it. Can they be as successful? Like, do you feel like they're trending? Do you watch them even? What's successful, though? Like, what's the yeah, definition? Of, see, this is... And this is what I'm talking about, like, levels. You know, because, like, I started on the indies. And to me, successful was... Uh, I can eat tonight. I have gas money to get to wherever I was going. And man, I, golly, I had a good match, you know? And then, you know, you get to television. And as somebody coming in who doesn't know jack shit about doing television, like I have to lean on people and ask questions and watch and learn and grow. And a lot of people, I think, are still just stuck in that indie mindset. And again, it's where I came from. Mm. There's nothing wrong with it. But if you're more happy with some goof saying that you had a five-star match and the building's a quarter full. We're not in the same business. Right. Well, there, there you is. have it. There it is. And, and before I forget to say this, because a lot of people are going, wow, Carnat likes those 15 minute headlocks they had back in the nineties or whatever the, the line is. No, we, and I've always talked about, boy, we had a great match with the Rock and Roll Express. We had a great match with the Southern Boys, or it was a pleasure to work with so-and-so, right? You're supposed to want to have good matches, too. You're supposed to want 
the angles and the promos that you do about the match you have with an opponent you want them to sell tickets and to create interest and then you go and you have a good match with the opponent that they're already interested in so that maybe you can have a rematch and get them to come back and buy another ticket you're not trying to suck at any step of the equation but if just as we've said so many times just because a guy can have a good match and can do all the moves, if he was a goddamn wallpaperer and it, that was working on the arena and you just had him walk in in front of all the people and do the moves like a professional can, people would go, well, that's a bunch of shit. You, got to, you can't have one of the part of the equation. You've got to have all in a nice little mixture and to be honest, it's great to have a great match, especially when you have an opponent that you can make magic with that, that you know, works like the Midnight Rock and Roll or whatever. But the, the, the getting them interested in who you are, who they are, and why you are fighting them is more important than the match you have. But they're all important. But everybody has lost sight of... You've got... The Nick Waynes of the world, I'm a droop-faced teenage knucklehead with no body and no ability to cut a fucking promo and no goddamn star look, and I might get over in a small territory, but they don't have those anymore, so now I'm on national TV and it looks ridiculous. But I can do a fucking moonsault. You got too many of those, I'm sorry. Yeah, everybody should be able to live their dream. But <laughs> not on television, playing parts that you are not goddamn equipped for. So what if all the fucking porn actresses were 280 pounds and fat and had warts on their nose? How much money would they make? And maybe the end of the porno business. It would be a specialized market, at least. We can say that. That's the point. You got to look like what you're fucking doing if you're trying to sell it to other people. We've been telling the truth about AEW since the very beginning, and it's a very inconvenient truth for a lot of AEW believers. For people that believe the AEW dream, I guess we can call it. For some people that believe what Tony Khan says, and for someone that accuses everyone else of being bad faith, Tony Khan either says nothing or is just <laughs> dishonest about shit. So you don't know who's really bad faith. But this is something we always talked about. We said one day, we said this like at the beginning, there's going to be shoot interviews and someone's going to start saying the truth about what goes on there. The chaos, the dysfunction, the lack of management, Tony's behavior. And trust me, there's so many more stories about Tony <laughs> ripe for the picking that'll eventually emerge. A lot of guys don't want to say anything. Because you always want to be able to go back someplace and get some work. Not everyone's in a position of CM Punk. But this is the first person who's really gone on the record explicitly explaining the problems with AEW and specifically Tony Khan as the management of AEW. Well, and, you know, that it was... I think there's two sets of fans. I think there's the fans that believed in the AEW dream that that had... Good reasons for doing that, because we all wanted a sports-based presentation of wrestling with a budget and TV that could be an alternative to the WWE, who were stale and phony and bleh. And so that was great for people to wish for or want or hope to see. But for there are some element of the fans there that still think that this goddamn trained chimpanzee wrestling that Maddie and Nikki have shepherded into our midst is going to get over with anybody instead of being a goddamn, you know, everybody's source of sour belches. And it's child, silly, phony fucking wrestling. That is why the wrestling fans are offended because they don't want what they liked all those years, being a bunch of phony bullshit with children. And that's why the normal people don't start watching this show, because they look at these guys and they go, who the fuck does he think he's kidding? 
This guy's going to beat somebody up? Or how phony can that be? Or these guys are horrible actors? Or all the things that your average people say when they see bad indie wrestling? And that's what they, they've got the same, a little bit less than the same group they always had to begin with. And that's kind of trickling off, and they haven't got anybody else new except when they had Punk, because he was the one that could grab the wrestling fan, the mainstream fan, the WWE fan, or just an adult that didn't want to see stupid fucking kids playing stupid fucking games. And the guys who just wanted to play with their friends, it's the same friends. It's the same friends that were on the indies with them six years ago. It's one of the reasons everything's so stale. You'd have think Muffin Top Taylor's his skin condition would have cleared up by then. Now, he wasn't released. Lots of other people have been released, but he wasn't released. No, he, he escaped, but they brought him back. Before we end this segment, though, I think that's one of the issues with the release thing that I brought up earlier. AEW had a bunch of things they put out there to try to make themselves publicly seem different than WWE. We're going to pay women the same as men. We're going to have health insurance. Those were early things that went away quick. Sports-based wrestling, again, something that went away very quick. Very quick. Tony Khan has bragged, I want to say maybe in the last year, maybe a little bit longer, but he's talked about that they don't release people. That's why it was a big deal when Kevin Kelly got fired recently. Wow, they fired nobody. Nobody gets released. Jelly Nutella and all those people that were under contract for months and did nothing on TV. They ghosted that the same way they ghosted CM Punk. <laughs> Turns out this an AEW way. When they're done with you for a while, no one talks to you. That's a weird thing. But they just released people for the first time. It's interesting. Is this a sign that they're going to start taking things a little more seriously with their new COO? They're actually releasing people. We'll see. I mean, well, I'm, again, it's do, a do fiscally we... irresponsible operation. And until people admit that, the idea that you start a business to lose tens, if not over a hundred million dollars, whatever it may be right now, just to eventually get to the point where you're going to get a television rights renewal, but meanwhile, you're, you're driving the popularity of your company down through the presentation and the booking and everything else. It's stupidity. It's stupidity. But Tony said it, and the people like Tony want to believe it. Brian, you have just made me realize that Tony Khan did learn everything he knows from me, only he's taken it to new heights. He's magnified it. He is, it's, it's exponentially grown from what I taught him to what he's done now. Because what's one of my favorite homilies about the wrestling business? Uh, if you can't stand the heat, stay out of the kitchen. No. You know the easiest way to make $5 million in the wrestling business? Start with $10 million. <laughs> And he's taken it to a whole new level. He did learn from me. And we can say that without fear of contradiction now. Well, there it is, Jim. And we will now end this very, very long segment. We didn't even get to review everything CM Punk talks about running into Vince McMahon. And then gives but, his opinion. But opinions. not in his car, unfortunately. And says more about Vince McMahon in a negative light than anyone else who's been interviewed about this from the company has so far. And says he ruined his life by ruining the lives of others. And that's a pretty good way of looking at it, I guess. Yeah, well, and the one comment he made also that was the first thing that I thought was, obviously, you don't, you knew Vince was weird. We, we've said this. We, you know people are weird, but you never imagine somebody's going to do that, right? But he, Punk said the first thing he brought up that he was shocked about was that Vince McMahon, no matter what you think of him, having known the guy, was stupid enough to put all that shit in writing. And that's, I mean, but, you know, he said, and, and I agree with him, Vince McMahon ruined his life, his legacy, the way he'll be remembered. He ain't going to live long enough to redeem himself with polite society. And he did it to himself by ruining other people's lives in the process. So, holy fuck. Well, there it is. What will certainly be a very, very busy week, week and a half with WrestleMania and all the other things happening around the world of wrestling. CM Punk on Ariel Hawani's MMA Hour. Check it out wherever you find your favorite uh, MMA Hour. But we will now return 
back to your normally scheduled drive through And my time machine's off. So we will return with Time Machine on the other side. <laughs> All right, we have returned from the past. Oh, Jim. good heavens. Brian, have you thought about starting a new line of work instead of the, the music thing? It may not be working out for you there. Maybe you ought to sell things on the internet. No, Jim, this is not work. This is love. What I'm doing here. Well, this is a music. This is a time machine. I don't, I don't know what the hell you're talking about, actually. Yeah. Who, I don't, who, where am I? Who are you? Who are you? Where What's going I? on? Uh, you know, I'm just confused right now. I don't know what's happening. Uh, what? Is it lunchtime? <laughs> well, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned I may want to start a store. Is this yes. what you think will be a good thing for me to do right now? It's the only thing left. <laughs> <laughs> well, I I'm very interested in uh, this. I'm entrepreneurial. <laughs> and this sounds like a wonderful opportunity that you're presenting me with. How can I go about doing this? <laughs> See, you got me on the other one, so I've got you on this one. <laughs> Well, see, there's a way you can do this, Brian, because obviously you're not going to make any money playing your time machine out in public. I, the only money you might make is for people encouraging you to move down the street. But what you need to do is you need to mass market those time machine instruments, and you need to get a store online, and you need to sell them to people all over the world that can make their own kind of music and sing their own kind of song. And that's where you need our friends at Shopify. That's where they come in, over at Shopify. You know the people at Shopify. We've talked about them many times. That's their trademark, because whenever you hear the word Shopify or mention them in any way, people make money. I don't know how it just happens instantly, because Shopify is, of course, the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every single stage of your business, all the way from conception to inception to contraception, all the way to bankruptcy, from the start to the finish, well, Shopify is with you there every step of the way. What? I, I don't know about all, any of that. I just want to stress that it was your own personal tagline. That is not anything they've applied to themselves. You're just coming up with your own things. Well, right I'm, I'm praising them because they're there all the way with you. As long as you're making money, and you're in business, they're with you. Whenever you stop making money, you get out of business, well, they wouldn't be with you anymore, would they? Because you wouldn't be in business anymore. But as long as you're doing well, they're with you. And they can help you do better, folks, because they turn browsers into buyers with the Internet's best converting checkout. They have the, the various means and methods to uh, Im import to you Shopify magic which it makes you sell more with less effort. And they power 10% of all the e-commerce in the United States. But one of these days, one of these days, they're going to have 99%. And they're going to leave that 1% over on the side just to make it look good so they can't be accused of a monopoly. So jump on these, these guys' bandwagon now because when they get big and start telling the, the AI machines what to do and you know, which of the humans that will be retained here to be slaves and do the bidding, you want to be in with these people. Of course, I'm not sure that Shopify is actually people. They may be the AI themselves because they, they know this stuff so well because they, they, can, they can literally help you sell anything around the world. So they can't be human. They must be artificial intelligence. So get on these people's good side right now. It could be the best thing for you later on in the coming post-apocalyptic. I, I don't know prince. what the hell you're talking about. Let's talk about what's the best thing for everyone's business. Yes, it's and a business you it, want to start at Shopify. Yeah, you need to mind your own business and get in good with Shopify while there's still time. <laughs> no, you don't have to get in good with anyone. Well, you just have to. Well, you at your own peril later on. Don't be on the side of Shopify, of Shopify, or Shopify. You say don't be on the side of Shopify. At your own peril, you're not on their side. Grow your average order value with the Shopify Bundles app, where you can create and sell product bundles with ease. They send you a roll of duct tape and a bunch of products, and you make a big bundle. Tape That's them up and sell the whole goddamn <laughs> That's thing. That's not how it works. No, it's, it's not. Your, Shopify is your no excuses business partner. They have no excuses whatsoever. You ask what went wrong. They got no excuse. Sell without needing to code or design. 
Just bring your ideas and Shopify will take money from people for them. And, you know, you can, with that Shopify magic, you yeah. can whip up that captivating <laughs> content that converts. <laughs> yes, with that Shopify magic, you can yes. seemingly do anything. You just twinkle your nose, just wiggle it from side to side and boom. And once you start selling, Shopify makes getting paid simple because they accept every type of payment. Let's say some farmer out in Nebraska can't pay you in cash. They'll take a cow. You will end up with a cow on your front no. porch, but that thing will give milk every goddamn morning. Yeah, I'm pretty Bessie sure that's not how it works. Her, the educated no. cow. In the morning, she gives pasteurized. In the evening, it's homogenized. Bessie, that Bessie will be on your front porch courtesy of Shopify. If that's the only thing that fucking farmer has to come up with to pay you, they'll take it. They'll take the skin off a hot dog to settle a debt. Anyway. What the, hell, what the hell are you talking about? Shopify. Yes. Shopify. We were right so now, close to you, the end, and then you just dragged us back to the oblivion. You can sign up for a $1 a month trial period at shopify.com slash JCE, all in lowercase, a dollar a month. If you have no idea what they do for you from this spot, you can only spend a dollar and you can find out because you can get a trial period for a dollar a month. And then they'll show you what they can do for you. And by cracky, I bet you're going to be selling more stuff and making more money because right now, you know, some people out there, they're just, they're, they're, they got their hands out. They're just starving. Well, get in with the big boys and the money will be rolling in. You'll be farting through silk. You could sell anything with it. You could sell ice to Eskimos. <laughs> you could, you could sell cocaine to Tony Khan. No, well, come on. No, no, could. no. No, he doesn't call it that. He calls it Shopify magic. Ah, that's the Shopify magic for Tony. Well, you can go to shopify.com slash JCE now to grow your business no matter what stage you're in. And you can make some money. Shopify.com slash JCE. Well, Jim, we are going to get to AEW Dynamite. We're going to close the show here this week with AEW Dynamite. Again, a big week, a lot going on, a lot of things to cover, still to cover, to watch, everything else. But a story that kind of got snuck in there in between all the other drama and usual garbage, AEW, a list of releases. Classically, famously, AEW doesn't release talent. Anybody. Tony Khan has used that as almost a, a chip against WWE. You know, we don't do that to people. We want to treat people better here. Now they've done it. Any thoughts before I go through this list on the idea that Tony Khan, is this necessarily a bad thing? For the people that are just acting like he went back on his word, he should never release well, anyone. That's <laughs> ridiculous too. Well, no, because when you're gonna, I've I've seen this list of names. We're gonna go through them, but when you look, you were like, well, why in the world would he've been paying these people to begin with, and why we haven't even seen some of them uh, ever, maybe if if not in a long time. Uh, so it would naturally be a logical business decision not to employ these 10 people when you've got like what 150 people or more on the roster we're not saying this is he what he shouldn't have done he should have been doing it a long time ago and it was to the point where many people were saying right when punk comes out does the the interview and says it's clown show not a business then he releases people like a real but like a real boss I, 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 I can't believe he just made that decision in 12 hours or 24 hours to tell these people they probably were working on this. I, I think it's maybe coincidental, but it still speaks to the point that for the first time, he acts like an actual business is being run there and people are like, oh, he's reacting to the, the fuck. He should have been doing this all along. Who, who are these all-star names? that were making some living from this company for so long and have now been released that people are like aghast about. Yeah, we have a few things here. Let's go to the names. These are the names AEW has released as of now, so far. Anthony Henry. Who? Anthony Henry. I believe he was one of the work horsemen. Well, did we lose the horse or the work? Didn't they just put out a new t-shirt? Well, whatever. Who knows? The Tate Twins 
also they, they, might, as, they might they might have put the fucking t-shirt out on their own bodies who's gonna buy a work horseman t-shirt the tate twins also known as the boys as in dalton castle's boys yes they're two kids i think they're from knoxville and they're two young br- brothers that uh look very similar they're they're very small they're very nice kids i believe i met them a time or two and when do we, when have we seen them? I can't believe that that he had these people on contract instead of booking them on a per event basis. Then how many more people has he got on contract that just get a check every week? We never fucking see. Well, Jim, on that uh, topic, there also released Stu Grayson. <laughs> he left and came back, didn't he? He had left and come back, and he was a and member of the Dark again. Order. That's yeah, right. Th- yes, he was the he was one of Patient Zeros in the Dork Order. The uh, the Super Smash Brothers. The what was their name? Uno and Dos or whatever. Um, instead of you mean the fat guy in the pleather shark mask is still there, but this guy was somewhat of an athlete. They couldn't figure out anything to do with him. They let him go, then they re-signed him, and then and he was we never bar- saw him again. He was barely used ever again. He was working indie shots. All right, well, that was uh. Well, Stu they didn't Grayson. want it. They didn't want him to go. He went away mad the first time, so they what didn't want him to go away mad. So they brought him back and paid him so that he could go do whatever he wanted elsewhere. Well, we're about to find out if what goes up must come down. Also on the list, Jim Gravity. No, they repealed the law of gravity. Gravity has been repealed from AEW. Oh, wait, hold on. I'm floating to the ceiling. Brian, <laughs> Brian. <sighs> he was on contract? <sighs> I guess now he can, he can go back to NASA and start moonwalking again. They own the name, so he's going to use the name Newton's son. <laughs> Jim also released, this one was surprising, I must say, Dasha Fuentes who is the, I guess you could almost say, the Mike McGurk to Justin Roberts's Howard Finkel, although that's a disgrace to Howard I Finkel. I was about to say, I don't know you did either one of those folks any good, but she was one of the girl interviewers in the back, along with Dallas Page's daughter, right? That's right, and she was also ring announcer. And ring announcer. And, you know, they've got to make more television time for Officer Barb Brady. He's got to be on more. We don't see him nearly enough. So, I mean, this girl did a fairly good job, did she not? I thought she did a very good job, and I thought it was a nice change of pace from Justin Roberts. You know, that, well, I, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what else uh, to say about this. I'm not sure what caused this. Uh, potentially, she was too good. They couldn't have that. Also on the list, Jim Slim J. Who? Slim J. Who's Jay? Was he slim because he hadn't been getting enough work to eat? What? Uh, I, uh, help me. Who was he part of? Uh, slim Jay has issued the following statement. I'm grateful for the opportunity to have worked for AEW. Unfortunately, yesterday was no April Fool's joke. <laughs> I appreciate Arya Davari for always bringing my name up and believing in me. Caprice Coleman, you always put me over. As did William Barons. Bill Barons, wow. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you to the fans that supported me. My gimmick was trash. I get that. I knew that. My work wasn't, though. <laughs> That's a weird statement. I worked my shoot job through both contracts with AEW. Wait a minute. Well, then what were they paying him if he had a contract and we never really saw him? He couldn't have been working that much and he had time to work another job. Why was he working another job while he was on contract with the... Okay, never mind. My role there was to act rich. I've always been far from that in real life. Promise that. All I wanted to do once I was signed was to get my wife and daughter out of the shithole we live in. (laughs) They're my everything, by far. I failed. Does it mean I quit? Wait, what? He's been on contract with AEW for two years while still working another job and he's still living at a shithole? How did he not get all of Tony's money like everybody else did? Maybe he didn't get to give this story to Tony. Does it mean I quit? Not at all. Mouths to feed. 
and I'm broke as fuck. So I'm looking for a second, second job. Stop sleeping on me. So there's a statement. We don't know who Slim J is, but very, uh, very passionate statement there. A lot of emotion. And you feel bad, actually, when you hear about yeah. that. <laughs> What's he under contract for? Just he, Is he on contract just to make appearances? What would that contract be that he's not making any money? So we hear stories of guys making, and girls, making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and millions of dollars a year. And we hear stories about the friends of the buckaroos having contracts for all this time for legitimate money and doing little or nothing. But maybe he's also signing people up and starving them to death just because he's collecting wrestlers. Who kn- I, I don't know. And we'll finish this list in a second. Here is a statement that was released by... Uh, let me just make sure I got the name. Anthony Henry, the workhorseman who was tagged up with J.D. Drake as the workhorseman. The amount of support I am receiving during this very difficult time is amazing, and I appreciate all of it. I don't know what is next for me. I don't know if wrestling is something I still want to pursue. I am devastated. Regardless, I am always a hashtag workhorseman. <laughs> I I don't know if the workhorseman thing is the thing that I'd hang my hat on for the rest of my career. What are your thoughts in general of talent that are released putting out these emotional statements on social media? I, I it's become a thing that everybody does. I don't really know why. Um you know I'm going to call attention to the fact that that you know they released me after I've never been seen on their television or only in a minor role, but I'm going to thank everybody. But I, I don't know. Go on. Uh, uh, put out, announce that you are ready to be fucking booked and your, your talents utilized. Yeah. If, you know, but I, I don't know about all of the thank you everyone for firing me. It was great while I was there getting paid. Eh. Well, Jim, three more names on the list. Parker Bordeaux. Okay, was he... He was the the amateur that was with the WWE for a while, and they had initial high hopes and then released him. And then he went there, and we saw him a time or two with the tattooed-faced guy and oh, yeah. something else, <laughs> and then they all disappeared. The moguls, they were the original mogul affiliates or mogul associates or, before it was yeah, an embassy. Before it was an embassy. When they, before they went worldwide, they were just domestic. And well, he's, been, he's, he's gone? Well, that's terrible. Also, Jose the Assistant. Oh, Jose. Certainly he's going to find somebody else to assist in the near future, isn't he? Who was he assisting? He was... Because he wasn't Alex. Because Alex assists most of the luchadors. Well, no, and Alex Jose only... Was, Jose Alex was assisting... Well, no, he was with Penta. He he was with Phoenix. He was with he was with all of them for a while there. No, Jose was with Andre. He was with Andrade, maybe, but he was also with Roosh, and he was with right. Wasn't he with the whole thing where Preston Vance got kidnapped and tied up, taken away and held for ransom? Yes. Did, uh, by the way, where did that go? What kind? What was the budget to film that? Where did that go? It went nowhere. I, d- I don't know. And I'm, where did Rush go? We know Andre went back to the WWE. We do, where did Rush go? I don't know. Someone he told was me in he, a, he was in a real hurry. Someone told me he was on Twitter tweeting out positive things about WWE. So I, don't <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't seen it myself though. But um, well, and finally, Jim. Back. The last name on the list, Jorah Joel. What? I don't know who this is, if it's male or female, but Jorah Joel. I, I, J-O-R-A, as in Jorah, J-O-H-L, Joel. But I'm, that's the thing is, have you ever even seen that name written on the internet in relation to wrestling I've, I've that's a complete mystery name I, I 
I don't, uh, I wish them all the best, whoever it may be, man, woman, or child. Well, just to wrap up the segment, here's a previous quote from Tony Khan, I'll read, about not releasing talent. <laughs> There's not a lot of loyalty at times, and there should be. And this is a family business. We're not a public company. Even if I get punched in the face with circumstances, it doesn't mean I'm going to take it out on the staff by cutting 100 staff or laying off 30 wrestlers. And I really care about the people here. I would do anything I can to protect the jobs and livelihood of the people that work here. And that's a family business. And that's the difference between a family business and a public company in a lot of ways. And not every family business has those principles, but we do. And that's just how I was raised. Yeah, but here, that was what he said before. And you know the old saying, the less a man makes declarative statements, the less likely he is to be proven a fool in retrospect. However, at this point, what is the, he's got 150 something wrestlers, plus he has producers and agents, he has TV people, he has announcers and referees. Whose family is this? Nick Cannon's? How big can a family get before the redheaded stepchild or the unwanted cousin has to, you know, fucking go find another place to live? How it, you can't just continue to hire these people that he's paying all this big money to and continue to pay people that we never see and that are not matter mattering that much in this equation any amount of money. It's business. But you know, some of those guys, remember, that, that were there from the start, that contracts expired. He paid guys for three and four years in some cases that mattered little or nothing to his, his program. So I'm not surprised he's doing this, but you can't... I, to, to be fair to Tony, he was saying, well, the pandemic... Or, well, you know, a, a big deal. I'm not going to lay off 30 guys or fire 100 wrestlers or whatever, but sooner or later, somebody's got to go, and I can't believe they stopped at 10. Well, those are the releases as of now. We will stay on top of this story going forward. But, Jim, earlier in the show, we talked about the CM Punk interview on Ariel Hawani. You wouldn't think it would be something that would be talked about in AEW TV, and they didn't really talk about it, but it felt like some of this show was geared just towards addressing that. And it was a puzzling decision. And it was a puzzling opening 15 minutes or so of the show. Let's talk about AEW and Dynamite. Well, when we, when we were about to go on the air with this, this show, I said, it was like Tony divined himself here. And you said, well, what do you mean? And I started to tell you the story, and I thought I'd told it to you before, but you didn't remember it, so maybe I hadn't. Yeah. But what they did here was like ICW Poffo-like, in that it became the opposition promotion that was reacting to the big company, and not only reacted, but obviously bothered, obviously pissed off, obviously offended, whatever, reacting to the big company more than what their fans necessarily, I think, needed. Because here, for the people, I've said this a million times, for the people who like that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing those people like. For the AEW fans that really enjoy the program, like the program, the tribalistic behavior, we want to kick the WWE's ass, whatever. They knew what Punk had said, and they don't really like it, and they they didn't need reminded of it. But for a lot of people, it kind of probably would have gone by them, because still, remember, people in this audience didn't know why Punk was gone after any of the incidents where he was gone with no explanation, both times. They had to be told they found out in the arena, whatever. So the internet doesn't even reach every single bit of this audience. So instead of maybe having one of their top guys make a veiled reference to anything, and in the course of their story they were telling that it was involving AEW's own programming, or maybe even 
just having one of the guys talk about what wrestling means to him, one of the baby faces give a rah-rah speech about we're all fans, we all support wrestling, and we, we but they made it personal. And if you didn't know what he was reacting to, you would have thought that Edge was out of his mind. <laughs> and, if, and if you did know what he was reacting to, you thought, my God, this hit a nerve with them because Edge was trying so hard to give a rah-rah speech that it, it he lost it enough to where it was almost like he was trying to talk himself into it too. And it couldn't have been worse that as soon as he starts trying to cut this live in-ring promo at the top of the program about how great AEW is for wrestling and how it's given everybody a, a, a chance or a career or happiness or whatever, and it's not just a clown show operation, the microphone won't work. He's getting feedback. He can't uh, several times before they got that calmed down. But did you notice, Brian, when he initially said there's been a lot of negative BS spewed this week, nobody in the crowd reacted. Nobody, then when he said, well, I'm happy to be here, or whatever, well, they react at that. But I don't think they knew or cared, because like I said, those people sitting there, they got their own opinion of the company. It's all the people who aren't sitting there that agree with CM Punk. But even they still did, you know, so he had a good heart with this, Edge did. I don't know whether Tony instigated it, saying, Edge, you're my baby face, you're a great talker, go out there and try to talk people out of listening to what they fucking listen to. Or whether Edge came and said, I'll give a the rebuttal. The opposing viewpoint, Tony. But it, he was trying to fire the crowd up. And like I said, was trying so hard, it, it came off bad. But to re, rebut that it's a, the, the comments that it's a clown show business that's only meant to, you know, employ the guys to have fun with their friends and they're not worried about making money. He talked about all the dream matches that he could have <laughs> with all this talent on the roster and said he's having more fun than he's ever had in his career. That's kind of an acknowledgement or an agreement, isn't it? That it, you, re I'm, I'm just saying you rebut the charge of this is all about having fun with your friends and uh, playing wrestling and getting five stars with, well, look at all the dream matches I can have, and I'm having more fun than I've ever had before. How is that a, a, an opposing viewpoint? Yeah, and if Punk says AEW is a joke, Tony's a clown, he's not a boss, and then you come out and say, I can do whatever I want. He's the best boss I've ever had. Yes. <laughs> That's the problem. The people that are like <sighs> mad at Punk or mad at anyone for saying the real stuff, the truth about Tony... Yeah, because they don't want the gravy train to end. And don't worry, it won't. Don't worry, it won't. But come on, this was pathetic. And this was pathetic. Even if his heart's in the right place, this was pathetic. He was stammering. The mic went out a couple of times, was giving him feedback. And it came out of nowhere. The fans didn't react. This is going to make people oh, want to watch the you, show. Did you see when they did react? He said, I'm... I'm proud of and respect everybody that started the company and he mentioned by name the bucks and kenny and cody and cody got a pop and then tony Co cody is the only one that got a pop from that crowd when he mentioned those names and you can tell that he was really offended by these i don't know what edge's personal relationship is like with punk but it was all he was offended because he, but then he came out and said the same thing. So it's kind of like this guy's trying to fucking knock this company where I'm having all this fun, having matches with my friends. This was a backstage rah rah speech for the other wrestlers. Yes, in front of the fans for no reason. For for no reason otherwise than 
they, the powers that be, Tony, the top wrestlers in the company, were so taken aback by Punk calmly and pretty rationally and reasonably explaining what's going on over there that the story that was so believable because it wasn't over the top, because it echoed and mirrored things that we had heard already and was delivered in an articulate way. It's true. Sorry. But the guys over there need to hear from one of their locker room leaders that, no, it's okay that this company is built on having great matches with our friends and getting paid a lot because we're having fun. <sighs> the fans, did, they didn't need to hear any of that. They should have. They should have let that slide off their back without a lot of comment because there was no rebuttal to make to Punk's statement. He, what's the what's the saying? Truth is an absolute defense. This was one of the more minor league moments in the history of AEW because in front of the fans, you're defending the company. It's obvious that it's only because CM Punk did an interview with Ariel Hawani. What percentage of the fans watched it? A lot of people checked it out. Don't get me wrong. You can see on YouTube, a lot of people checked it out. But what percentage of the fans overall watched it? They didn't react to it. Because if you... You got to also remember, not every AEW fan hates CM Punk. And they all could look around and see what's going on. Dwindling crowds. Everything is less energy. The booking has never made less sense. For the people that want to say, Oh, the, you can't say AEW doesn't have stories. No, they do. Every story sucks. They go nowhere, and the momentum is dropped every single time. And there are still people out there that want to pretend and not call out Tony Khan because they want to keep giving him advice. So they don't want to call him out. But <sighs> that's what this is. Yeah. This is one of two things. This is him going out there to defend the company for the fans, which doesn't make any sense, or this is him going out there to give Tony Khan an on-air hug because yes. he needs it. That's what this. Is. This is his version of Janelle Grant's Christmas letter to Vince. Well, those are your words, not mine, for the <laughs> record. But this was it. It was funny because of the awkwardness of it. But I thought this was pathetic. They should have never mentioned anything about the punk interview. Move on with your own no. programs. Yes. But they had to. They had to because they can't help themselves. And then Edge gives the big introduction to the new multi-million dollar man, Will Ostrich, so we can get a great match in the ring. And out he comes, and this match was uh, Ostrich versus Powerhouse Hobbs, both members of the Don Fallis family with Don on color. And still there was no explanation or reasoning whatsoever why Don is pitting his men against each other, except that iron sharpens iron and we want to have great matches. I'm the heel manager, so I want to give the fans the best matches I can. Yes, against my own men to create ill will in my stable, which they will do here in a minute, but not enough ill will, but some queasy will. But <sighs> I got to say to you, Brian... This is actually legitimately the first time that I've seen a sunshine or a ray of sunshine beat down on our boy Will Ostrich. This was not only the best match that I've seen Powerhouse Hobbs have start to finish, and a lot of people are going, well, of course, he's in there with the great worker of Will. No, this was the best Will Ostrich match I've ever seen because this was the first time that we have ever been able to see Will work with a, a real wrestler instead of another Cirque du Soleil performer where they were trying to outdo themselves with the gymnastics and the flips and the Japanese stylings and the no-sellings and whatever the fuck. It was a wrestling match. And Hobbs is a monster. He's not going to do that flipping, diving bullshit. He's a wrestler. So that meant that when he, and you can tell he's a heel because he looks and works like a heel. So now Ostrich had to be in the position where he was a smaller, more athletic baby face that had to use his quickness against the big overpowering monster. 
and it had to move more slowly because Hobbs ain't going to be out there fucking running around like goddamn gravity or whoever. So they had a good match. And at one point, Ostrich hit one dive and it worked because he was a baby face trying to fight a bigger heel that he'd got a momentary advantage on. And then Hobbs give old Willie boy a suplex on the steps outside the ring. But he didn't nearly paralyze him like the rest of these marks they've got in tights. He did it right. He rolled him across the thing and Ostrich sold. And then, you know, throughout the match, Ostrich proved he could sell. And, but then when he fired up and did some of these quick moves, it made sense. There's the bigger guy. So Ostrich does the foot to the chest, does a backflip, sticks it, and lands a jump up in Zagiri. And so quick. That was great. Then they sell. They don't just jump up and run and German suplex each other 15 times. And uh, in some cases, he was no selling, or Hobbs was no selling. The chops, but like you should. Like, you can't hurt me, little man. And when Ostrich slapped him in the face, he said, do that again, I'll kill you. And Hobbs was right there for everything. He was in the right place. And then finally, they're almost there. And I'm thinking, wow, no flips, no furniture. They've done this thing. Hobbs even caught Ostrich on a Cody cutter one time. and. Ostrich had to duck around and go and do it again. But then finally, Hobbs goes to shoot Ostrich off and goes for a spine buster. And Ostrich is going to turn it into a DDT. And I, I, gar I wasn't there, but I can see it. They, they talked this match and this finish over. I bet you they even walked through it half speed in the ring. They didn't do this move ahead of time, and I'm not saying you should. Why take fucking bumps in rehearsal, right? However, nobody caught one thing. I think this is what happened. This is my mind reading. When Hobbs shot him off and went to give him the spine buster, Brian, imagine in your mind's eye when Jake Roberts goes to give somebody a DDT. What arm does he put over the opponent's head before he drops him? What arm does he put over the opponent's head? The right arm? No. The left Think arm. Think about it. Put it in your mind's eye. The left arm. Every time you see somebody give a DDT, what arm is around the guy's head that's taking the DDT? The left arm. It's, it's kind of universal, right? Well... When Hobbs shot him off and picked him up for the spine buster, Ostrich's right arm was over Hobbs' head. And Ostrich was going to spin his legs around and DDT him, and I guarantee you they walked through it, and, and Hobbs said, or Ostrich was calling this match, obviously, said, when you pick me up for the spine buster, I'll hook your head, spin me around, I'll give you the DDT. But when they got in the middle of it, and again, if anybody that was backstage wants to write in anonymously and, and validate me or tell me I'm full of shit, I believe what happened here was that as Hobbs was spinning him and about to go down in a DDT, he subconsciously or just by rote tried to go down on the side of Ostrich that you would normally go down on for the DDT. But it was the other side, because he had him by the right arm, and they fell in a heap. But they fell with Hobbs over the top of Ostrich, because he, he just, he, he tried to go to the normal side without even thinking about it, just what you do, and it didn't work. That's what I think happened. But you saw them crumple in a heap. Or are you speaking to me now? Oh, I, I mean, I thought you were speaking to the audience. I did see yes. him crumple in a heap, and then I saw, of course, what appeared to be Osprey landing on his head. Yeah, well, that was next, because here's the thing. Yeah, I, was so, this, I was so focused on that, I forgot about the first one you mentioned. They had this great match that Jim Cornette is trying to praise, and I'm really liking it. I'm thinking, okay, there's fucking light at the end of these guys' tunnel. It was the headlight of the oncoming train. They crumple in the heap on the DDT, then uh, immediately Ostrich goes to the top rope, 
and does a flipping, twisting something off the top rope that is supposed to, I think, land on Hobbs as kind of like a senton type of thing or a swanton. And he landed right across the side of his fucking head. And it quickly whispered something, I guess, to the effect of, are you still alive? And then went over in the corner. And then when Hobbs gets up on his knees, Ostrich runs across the ring and throws that shitty elbow right over the top of his head, whiffed him completely. And that was the finish. So now all of these guys have finishes that are predicated because Danielson's about to do the same thing on the guy being on his knees where he can't even take a fucking bump. And this is every time I've seen Ostrich do this elbow, he goes over the top of the guy's head. It misses, obviously, visually. So this, this is a guy that does all these impressive athletic things and he's goddamn, it's like the buckaroos. They do all that shit, but their finish is a shitty double knee lift with a guy on his knees who can't take a bump. Bobby Eaton used to hate that. If a baby face would shoot him in the corner and then drop kick him, like these some of these guys do, he'd like, what the, where am I supposed to bump? You can't take a bump. He wouldn't say it that clearly, but the, the meaning was there. So... Anyway, the last three moves were a complete disaster, and this was the best match I've seen either guy have up to that point. Explain that one to me, Lucy. Can't explain that to you. I really enjoyed the match. I like Osprey. I've liked a lot of his matches so far. And Will Hobbs never gets used right, so why not have him do a job to the guy in his stable and in the process get his face crushed? Yes. Good match, though. It went a while. I mean, I worry about... We've been watching a rating story... Osprey's good, but he hasn't really been presented the right way for a star to be introduced to a new audience on TV. The ratings keep going down. They open with the Edge Rara speech. <laughs> this is going to be an interesting episode. Let's win one for the sniffer. Who's the but sniffer? Then, Tony. Oh, very then. good. Very good. You know, Tony Clown has become very popular ever since I slipped and accidentally <laughs> said that. On the show, a lot of the listeners have been sending that back at me. Tony Clown. But now we let's not overlook that after this match was over with, Hobbs was mad and went to shove old Willie, and Don Fallis had to get in and separate him, and they didn't seem too happy. So are they? But again, there's no explanation for why this hated heel that they were doing the same thing to Don Fallis a few months ago, they've been doing to Dominic. They boo him out of the every time he tried to speak, boo, cover it up. They hate this guy. He's evil personified, but he's managing the newest, most high-priced baby face that is smiling and shaking hands with fans and the people are cheering, but he's wrestling other guys in his stable. And the reason he's doing it is because the manager of the whole group is setting it up on purpose. And, and this, I don't know that this is a what the fuck is going to happen in a good way because you're confused by the whole goddamn thing. You don't get... I just want to find out what's going on to get it over with. But it's not like I'm hanging on the next development. And then, as uh, Ostrich is on his way back through the entrance, here comes Danielson, and they pass. So now they're watching Raw too, And they pass in the entranceway and they're wrestling on the pay-per-view in what less than three weeks and instead of having some kind of tension or issue they smile at each other and ostrich says top that and the reason they're wrestling on the pay-per-view is they're going to have a classic match apparently without doing any kind of angle to actually get people interested in seeing them fight with each other so we got that going for us. Should I continue moving on to Mr. Danielson? Yes. Because Brian Danielson wrestled the formerly MIA Lance Archer. And thankfully, I wrote at the top, Lance came out with no Jake the Snake to get in the way and stand there and look larger and older than everyone else and do nothing. And Jake just announced he re-signed. 
Oh, yeah, he re-signed a contract, but he, that doesn't mean he has to come to work now. And then he, Archer didn't come out of the entranceway beating up a production assistant or some job guy, because that's, as we mentioned before, so fucking phony and stupid. So he didn't do that. So I thought maybe we'll have a good match here. And they jumpstart, uh, Archer jumpstarts before the bell and kicks the shit out of Danielson for about two or three minutes straight. And then Danielson starts fighting back and they go to the floor and then the break spot is Danielson's down on the floor and Archer grabs some crew member standing there by the fucking railing and picks him up and body slams him on Brian Danielson. And that was the break spot. And at that point I said, all right, I'm just going to again, skip to the finish because what the, Lance Archer is, is a good talent. I'm not thinking he's the next rock or stone cold, but he could have been used well as a heel, especially in this land of Lilliput with these midgets and goddamn embryos on the card. No Jake Roberts to get in the way and detract attention from him. No goofy shit with the crew members, a sustained and focused push. And you could have had something, but you could say that about a lot of guys on this roster, and it's too late now for Lance Archer like it is for most of the rest of the other ones. And this wasn't a bad offensive match. There was no furniture. There was no flips. Everybody worked hard. The fans liked it. Uh, but finally, Danielson, <laughs> Lance Archer's on his knees in the middle of the ring, and Danielson three kicks to the head and a running knee while Archer's on his knees and pins him one, two, three. It's a rotten finish. Is flat. It's no way for Archer to take a bump, all those things. But in this case, it's Danielson's gimmick, and Danielson has been over in the past. So the people there liked it, and it wasn't as stupid as it would have been if some just jack-off did it. But Danielson didn't top it, except for... They didn't botch the last three consecutive moves. Danielson did not top Ostrich versus Hobbs with him versus Archer. Did you think he did? I didn't. I haven't been a big fan of Danielson's matches in quite a while. I thought the first match was much better. Well, in that case, we will move on to Chris Jericho with Rene Moxley Good. And another interview with Hook, where Jericho comes out last week. I offered to be Hook's mentor, but he said something that stuck in my craw. And he brought out Hook to talk about it. And I'm not sure dressing like a juvenile delinquent uh, going to court is possibly helping Hook, but nevertheless, Jericho was upset because Hook said, I know who you are to him last week. And Jericho, of course, says, well, Hook, when you play the game at a high level, the rules are different. And I'm not asking you to trust me 100%, but believe in me as much as I believe in you. And Hook says he does believe, and that's why he got him a tag team match on Collision, which we're not going to watch. Nobody else will either. And Hook finished with, but I'm going to be keeping an eye on you. And then Jericho's like, that's the way I want it. So at this point now, can Jericho possibly turn on Hook and not bury Hook? Or are they going to fool us and Hook turns on Jericho? But they want to like Hook, so he shouldn't be a heel. And I don't know if they want to like Jericho anymore. And they maybe don't. he should be a heel. They don't. They don't pop for him. They boo him. Ever since he lost Judas, he lost his entire reaction. And when Jericho said, hit the Hook signal, and they put it up, that's now getting a smaller reaction. Because well, because he's in, he's in the Jericho periphery right. there. The he's vortex. under the Jeridome. The Jericho vortex. <laughs> or tornado. You don't want to be in the path of that thing. But that was the first hour of the show. I mean, that, think about it. The Edge promo, the Osprey hobbs match, the Danielson match, and this. That was the first hour of the show. Yeah. Oof. But they're going to save us because 
Remember I've been asking why the fuck did they try to make Jay White, the old light switch himself, a top heel, a single heel? Why were they giving him 20 minutes to talk and to work and to beat everybody? Well, now they've come to their senses. He got the shit kicked out of him by a 62-year-old man. Yeah, what was this match? This was something. It was a grudge. Apparently on some show that they they do... The B show, C show, whatever. Jay White invaded Billy Gunn's home last week. How many home invasions have we just seen lately in wrestling? Yeah, LA Knight did it on SmackDown. What show was that on? Yeah, this this was on Rampage or whatever. Jay White showed up at Billy's house. I don't know. But this is a grudge match. And did they say that it was... No holes barred, anything goes, lazy booking, or did they just do it anyway? Did they ever say this is a no disqualification match? Oh, I don't know, because it was jump-started, so I don't remember, uh, I don't listen, the commentating, let me just, I haven't said it in a while, Excalibur is so awful on commentary, I don't think anyone there truly acknowledges how much he turns off the viewer. Yeah. You can't listen to him. And then the Shivani just goes out there and says nothing. Just Tony Khan putting words in his mouth brings nothing to the table. The most mediocre commentary team, and they do more to hurt AEW than anyone wants to acknowledge. But when you tune into a wrestling show and the commentators are garbage, they're worthless, they can't do their job properly, it hurts the wrestling company. And then there's Taz sitting there in the middle going, yeah, the check is cashing, but I used to be on a real show. Yeah. Exactly. Anyway, what happened, for those of you who missed this piece of excitement, Billy Gunn jumpstarts this match and takes him outside, Jay White, out into the arena, on the floor, through the stands. They fought for what on my time counter on the DVR was seven minutes all through the arena without using the ring, rolled into the ring and rolled back out and went to break. And during the break, they pretty much, they were on the goddamn floor most of that time. When they came back, they were in the ring fighting for the first time on television in 10 minutes. And there, and of course, Aubrey Ed was the referee, and there she was standing and staring the whole time. You know, like I think she's ready for the glue factory. She has lost all of her authority. So then... Jay White got some offense for the very first time, but then Billy Gunn took back over, and suddenly on the screen, the acclaimed Caster and Bowens are in the locker room in the back, laying on the floor, writhing in pain, as one of the announcers said. And once he saw that, Billy then continued beating the shit out of Jay White and went out and got a chair. And as he comes back in with the chair, his sons, the gun boys, come in to cover Jay White up, and they're begging Billy, don't hit him, don't hit him. And then, while he, uh, Billy Gunn stops and pauses for a minute, you know, trying to get his kids out of the way, Jay White comes in with a nut shot. And then the referee rings the bell. She went, nah, you can't do that. They have fought in the arena for seven minutes straight without using the ring. Then the guy comes in the ring with a chair. Then people that are not even involved in the match come into the ring. None of that's a disqualification. But once the guy gets hit in the nuts, fuck it. I got to ring the bell. She is the shit. She's worse than Knox. Because it No, least, she's not. Come on. Yes, she is. No. Because here's the thing. Think about this. Knox, between the fact that he's rotten, but he's also so skinny and pale and bald and looks like a desiccated corpse, that he, he's almost translucent. You can see through him. He doesn't stand out. You can ignore him. But you can't ignore this fucking little filly of Aubrey Ed because she's always prancing and dancing and taking her stances and flipping her mane about and making her faces and gestures and pointing and and stomping her hooves. You can't ignore her. So she's worse than Knox. But anyway, the bell rang, and then the heels got on Billy Gunn, but the acclaimed, who were 
writhing in pain on the locker room floor on the screen a couple minutes ago, hit the ring fine and make a save. They have a sloppy fight. They throw the heels to the floor, tear up the desk, and are about to put Jay White through the desk when the guns save and the heels run off. And this was a mess, but more importantly, my God, they beat the shit out of Jay White, or Billy did. And then when the heels tried to get some heat, the baby faces came back and kicked the shit out of them, ran them off again. What the fuck was this? Atrocious, awful, bad use of the nine o'clock hour. Oh, there's a bunch of things I could say. Billy Gunn is his age. He probably shouldn't be in singles matches. He, well, he was he was the best worker in the ring. That's the problem. <sighs> this whole he was still was the problem. best worker in the ring. You know, I don't really care too much about the acclaimed Bang Bang Gang feud. I hope Juice Robinson, when he comes back, is not with any of these people. That's the problem. Every time someone leaves AEW for an injury or something, you're always like, when they come back, I hope they do something completely different than everything they have done so far. But what happened? To, does he need a kidney transplant, Juice? What happened to him? It was his back, I think, wasn't it? Oh, boy, I don't know, but it's not... Uh, not promising anyway that's that happened there and then i've got to admit maybe you can fill me in because i didn't watch the first of this i just watched it when the money came out but renee moxley good was on the stage there with willow nightingale and chris statlander who doesn't speak at all just stands there why is she there um please break her out of the please send her to the performance center so she would have a career anyway and stokely hathaway and i started fast forwarding this because i don't give two shits about what these people have to say but then here came mercedes moan out to join them so i stopped so what was willow saying did willow explain in any way brian what the bad blood is between her and Mercedes Moan since Mercedes has not wanted to give us any details. It's Mercedes Monet, or Monet, as you well know already. No, what Willow did, I wish you would have seen this, was she is an yet another person to give an acceptance speech. Oh, boy. To give their valedictorian speech, to talk about all the struggles they've been through and work in small shows and... Mm. It's the same thing everyone's doing. You don't want... Wrestlers never did this. Now everyone does it. I want to talk about the things I dreamt about growing up. We never heard about childhood dreams until Shawn Michaels. Yeah. And now it's all we hear about. And it wasn't even probably really his childhood dream. Vince loved that tagline. Vince loved that statement. Well, she gave... You know, she's very... You know, seems very happy. And uh, they shot it differently so you could see the crowd behind them. Well, they shot it differently so you could see the people behind them. I don't know if I'd call it a crowd. I think that's the only shot they could take. I mean, again, that fucking camera was tighter than the fucking skin on a hot dog on that crowd. But go ahead. That was really it. Well, then Mercedes came out, regardless of how you want to pronounce it. It's money, all right. Outgoing money. It's an expenditure. She stood next to Willow, three, four feet away, right, with the announcer in between them, without looking at her in an unnatural, but she wasn't looking at the camera either, she, and she was turned. It looked like she was staring to the people in the building. She was staring at the empty entranceway, because they're on the stage with the people in back. So Willow is just staring at an empty, or Mercedes staring at an empty doorway to the people in the building. And she, again, gave a recited, prepared set of comments with no emotion and not saying anything other than whoever wins the title match between Willow and whoever the fuck at this pay-per-view, she wants a title match at the next pay-per-view. And then she did her little stripper dance and, and she was gone. Millions of dollars, Brian? What the fuck is going on here? I was told by someone in AEW that she's not getting paid anywhere near what the rumors are. So we can 
Is she getting paid? That. Is she getting paid more than fourteen dollars an hour? See, now you're being ridiculous. Now you're just being silly. Of course. So far, what I've seen, you could get a cashier at fucking Target dressed up and have her do the same thing. 14 bucks an hour, maybe in the big cities. She has not. It's been the law of diminishing returns each and every week. It's a month now. The first promo was in her hometown and got a good reaction. This is just up the road. Worcester, Mass. Got a nice reaction, but she's not moving the ratings. She can't explain anything. She does, she's everyone's still talking about her on commentary last week, saying nothing. Not not good things about her on commentary no, either. No, so the women's division still remains a problem, and I think you know it, it's hard to compare the two. But she has, at least to me, the positive momentum of her went away a lot quicker than it did off like Paige when she came in. Where's Paige? I don't know. Collecting her check. What do you think? Oh, my God. Well, whether it's millions or hundreds of thousands or whatever it is, at this point, it's it's TV time that's being taken up. Is it not for no good reason or purpose? But that's a pretty good transition to the next match, Brian. The tag team tournament match. This is the semifinals, apparently. Uh, the Lollipop Guild versus the Puddin' Gang. The Buckaroos, Maddie and Nikki, against Pockets and Trent because Muffin Top Taylor is still, well, he's always been unable to wrestle, but now he's not medically cleared either. And the baby faces came out with Trent's mother, Sue, who bakes the cookies and drives a minivan. How much do you think they have to pay Trent to put up with being portrayed as a complete bumbling fucking idiot on national television. I don't know. If you had tried to pitch this angle or program to any other babyface in the recorded history of wrestling, they would have quit on the spot before they would have their mother drive them to the show in a minivan or second them at ringside and, and give a fake slap to one of the EVPs. Oh, but... <sighs> Anyway, the idea that that this of all weeks, where the comments have been made about this company and that they are clearly defensive about, that they would allow this, not only these immature, emotionally stunted, egomaniacal pricks to present this exhibition of mud show wrestlers and bad comedy, when the WWE's on fire and the prevailing opinion of their company is that it's a joke company run for the benefit of its indie level wrestlers. And if you're friends with the right people, you can get jobs, whether you're ready for television or not. And then they put this match on TV. Does Tony Khan have no clue what this looks like to adult impartial wrestling fans? It's like, I can see the rock on one channel and I'm watching kids play with their mother on the other channel. For the tag team title? is and, and big surprise, the Buckaroos won. They beat Trent, who's still, again, the only guy in this ring that's worth a shit. But he's been buried long ago. And then, so now the finals, by the way, surprise, surprise, are going to be the Buckaroos and FTR. The Buckaroos will beat FTR and then since Moxley did, did, you know, basically refused to be in the tournament so they wouldn't have to do a job, then the Buckaroos can fight the other guys that haven't been beat yet. And FTR does another job. But having said that, here the Puddin' Gang goes for their big hug, and Trent ran and leveled pockets with a big knee. And Taylor stands there with just a blank look on his Pudding filled face, like I don't I don't know what to do, so I won't react at all to anything, even though my friends are fighting. And Trent walks off on the whole thing, and his mother is standing there at ringside. This match of all matches on the week where they've been accused of being nothing but a vanity project for people's friends. And they do. 20 minutes of national TV that's a vanity project for people's friends. 
There's not one motherfucker here that deserves to be on goddamn national television on a wrestling show or any other kind of show. Whether it be Maddie and Nikki, Pockets, Trent, Muffin Top, or his cookie bacon fucking mother. Is that, can you tell me I just told a lie? Which one of these motherfuckers deserves to be on a nationally televised wrestling program? None of them would be on my program. So they did that. Did I miss anything discussing it? I guess the only other thing in note, some of the listeners sent this over. I missed it when it first aired because I usually have it on mute. The Bucks, when they came out, I guess shouted out the scapegoat. Jack Perry, again, of all days <laughs> to do it, they shout him out here, and it's just, again, it's... Okay, but now, now wait a minute, and, and, and their boss, Tony Khan, is mad at Jack Perry and won't bring Jack Perry back, so his direct underlings, his EVPs, are shouting out the guy that the boss is mad at on the boss's TV that the boss pays for? Unless Tony's not that mad at him anymore. That's the other thing you have to take uh -huh. into consideration. But, you know, that's the thing. They got what they wanted. Everyone always makes like the, the Bucks wanted to do this and change this. No, they just wanted to get as much money as they could for themselves and their family. And their friends. And their friends. But really about themselves. It's always yeah. been and, about themselves and well, they try to pretend I, I, like it isn't. I don't, wanna, I don't necessarily want to say their friends as much as their stooges, the people that prop them up, the people that write them the love letters on how they hung the sun and the moon and the stars and... Hey. But it's bad. It's minor league. If you tune into this show, it's like something you would have seen on the worst moments of TNA. The Bucks putting on wacky outfits and wacky personas to pretend they're vice presidents, even though they are, doesn't even seem like it. And just wrestle matches that don't do it anymore. Everyone can get a pop when you do a flip and you land on your head. But to actually tell a story in your match, that's always been an issue with them because they always have to like break every rule. When we say the rules, the things that make wrestling wrestling, like a referee enforcing rules, no, everything just happens nonstop because otherwise we can't get our great ideas out there. That's yeah. bullshit. And now they get less reaction than ever before. Because you've seen it. And they don't draw any... They're, they're getting paid more than any tag team in history. They mean less than ever before. <laughs> and no one would pay to see them. It's incredible. And but, they, but that's what they wanted. They were just all... They were in this for the money. A lot of people want to pretend it's not. When you hear Adam Copeland go out there in the opening and say, we're all here, there's a reason, and he starts listing people, there's a reason we all came here. Yeah, there is. Yes. Tony gave you a whole lot more money, Adam, than they were going to give you in WWE. Tony let you do what you wanted instead of pushing you down in the mid-card because you weren't drawing as a main eventer. Work one day a week, have fun with your friends, and do mostly whatever you want. That is the... And like we said, that's either the, the wrestling legends exit plan and retirement strategy or the guys who have never been on television of any repute whatsoever are happy to be on big time TV. In between, he, his, he's running out of options. Nobody with a valid career and choices to go to the WWE or even maybe do their own thing in other companies that won't be where they, they, they won't hand their careers to Tony Khan just for the sake of getting on television, those people aren't going to want to go there if they're serious about their fucking career. There's too many intangibles. You can, you can be talented in this environment and still be hidden and buried because of the bad show, the bad creative, and whose friend are you? How did Maria May get to be in contention for the number one contendership for the title held by her idol and boss and reason for living Tony Storm. Because now it was Mar Mariah, Maria, is it Maria, Mariah? Mariah. And they called the wind Mariah. Mariah May versus Thunder Rosa. And the winner gets a title, is the number one contender to get a title shot at Tony Storm. Why does Maria May want a title shot? Mariah, we just established Mariah. that. All right, well, whichever. Why does she want a title shot against Tony Storm? Tony is her idol. 
Have we explained that? How did no, none and of this how makes any go, sense. Nothing's been explained. How did explained. she go from an unknown fan who was idolizing Tony Storm to the goddamn number one contendership in twelve weeks? Uh, Thunder Rosa, however, won with her finish. So we've been saved against that potential conflict of interest. Does this make any sense? Probably not. But again, I don't really watch a lot of the Tony Storm segments because they started to make me hate them. Did do Would you have put Maria May and Thunder Rosa on right in front of your main event contract signing angle for your world title match on pay-per-view? No, I think the problem is that the women's segment, no matter who was in it, whether it's Mariah May or Thunder Rosa or anyone else, you've trained the audience that when you get to that segment between 9 and 10 o'clock, you could tune out. And usually they do. So that's the bigger issue. It's not even who's in it. It's the entire division. Well, and the problem is this time they didn't have a big match to come back to at the end. They had a big contract signing. And by the time they came back for this thing, for the entrances for Swerve and Samoa Joe, there was six minutes, five minutes left on the air. So they did Swerve's entrance, then Joe's entrance. Then both of them sat down. Joe signed the contract. The fans chanted Swerve's house. And Joe started speaking at 9.59 p.m. And he said, Swerve, I'm going to give you some advice before you sign that contract. You're working on bad information. The truth is signing that contract is going to be a big mistake. And my DVR froze. <laughs> so apparently what happened afterwards, and Brian, tell me if this is accurate because I tried to read the recap, was that Swerve said he's going to win the title and blah, blah, blah. And then they started fighting, and Swerve got busted open, but he made a comeback and signed the contract in his own blood, and then Joe came back to the ring and kicked the shit out of him again. Well, Joe kicked the shit out of him, bloodied him up, and Swerve bleeds tremendously. We've seen it a few times now. We've seen even people drink it. And then Swerve got up all it's, bloody. I understand, I understand it's excellent with, with a shot of bitters over ice. And then Swerve got up all bloody to let Joe know that he's not worried about him. He likes this. So that's the big setup for the big match. Did, did, did Joe come back in the ring and kick the shit out of him again? Now I don't know. Now I'm not sure. On the recap I read, he came back and kicked the shit out of him again. So it's fine if you kick the shit out of the baby face and make him bleed, but then he gets up and signs the contract in his blood and said, is that all you got? I've, I'm ready for some more. That's fine. But if Joe goes back and kicks the shit out of him again, then that baby face is a goddamn idiot, isn't he? Yeah. Well, let, hold on. Let me find the goddamn article that I was reading. If I can, it's already been moved off the page. My God, a lot of news going on in the world of wrestling these days. Let me click up here. I've clicked, and now... Yep, it clearly says right here, Brian. I found it instantly. Took me only seconds. Joe leaves the ring, swerves, grabs a mic, swerves, grabs, swerve, grabs a mic, yeah. says he loves this stuff. If that's all you got, I'm going to take the title from you. Signs the contract in his blood. Right. Joe returns to the ring and puts Swerve through the table. Oh, see, I tuned out. <laughs> after Swerve made the comeback all bloody on the mic, I tuned it out. I missed the okay. last minute or so, I guess. Yeah, he came back and ran him through another fucking table. So what the... <laughs> God damn it. You know, the other thing, too, it's important to note, the ratings have gone down. and Everyone has different things to blame, but you can look at other things. Things that are hot, the ratings don't go down like this. It's because the product's cold, the TV's cold. The more they've introduced shit after 10 o'clock, and again, this is a DVR for a lot of people like you, like me, if you set your DVR for Dynamite, it's not going to record the thing after it. It's not going to record the overrun that's not in the schedule. More and more people started missing that stuff. The ratings keep going down. If you're yes. doing main event stuff and it's after everyone's DVR work, don't assume everyone's going to go to YouTube and seek it out. I guess that's the other thing. 
Well, and that's, you know, at least they've got time. They can play this back if they think of it. They can play it back next week on television, but it would be better if they, if they didn't not only, you, you can advertise a match. You can advertise Samoa Joe versus Swerve Strickland. Stay at it to the end of the show here. You're going to see this match. But when you advertise a contract signing, you can't come out and say, now, you know they're going to fight. You pretty much know they're going to fight. But then when you fucking not only do that, but you run it over to the allotted time period of the program and, and into the next time period of the next program, the DVR people miss it. Plus people are, what the fuck? I, I almost thought, because I try not to pay attention to the announcers, because as you mentioned, they're bothersome. But when I saw Maria May and Thunder Rosa at 20 minutes till, I'm like, this is the fucking main event. I forgot they had the contract deal because we only got five minutes of it in the regular time slot. So if you're doing all kinds of great business, that's one thing, right? Are you there? Yeah, that's one thing. I, I'm sorry. I heard I heard a swoosh. Oh, a thing oh. swooshed into my screen. Yeah, it wasn't me. I wasn't swooshing. I have a notification of a swoosh. I don't know. It made that swooshy noise like I'd got disconnected. But anyway, that... <laughs> It, 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 the ratings continue to go down on the program. The farther down, the farther into the program you get, the farther down they go on most normal weeks. And the only reason the overrun has a bump is because there's a bunch of people tuned in, think they're going to see, I don't know, it's howdy duty time, whatever the program is. You're not probably not going to sell them the pay-per-view. They're just like, can we get this bullshit off so I can see my movie? So anyway, that was dynamite. I'm ready to blow my nose. All right. Well, that was dynamite, and you can blow your nose because we will return in the future with the AEW Dynamite Ratings. Did this one stop? All right, stop. Oh, it didn't stop. We lower it. We are in yeah. the future. Yes, friends, he was a great man, gone too soon. Well, we are in the, are you talking about the AEW ratings? I'm not no, sure. I thought, I thought that was, we were stepped into a funeral there when we got out of the time machine. Well, it may be, actually. We're going to talk about the AEW Dynamite ratings for April 3rd, 2024 in a moment. But Jim, we have to reference something from a little earlier. Well, talk yeah, I, I realized when we were taking our intergalactic journey through the space-time continuum and hit the left turn at Albuquerque on the warp that I'd alluded to a story that I was going to tell that you hadn't heard or couldn't remember, and then we never fucking did it. And I thought we ought to clean that up before we go any further so if the people got to the end of this program and didn't hear it and had actually given a shit, they wouldn't be saying, what the fuck, right? So what I was trying to say earlier was with Edge cutting that promo in defense of Tony and the company and its uh, raison d'etre for living, and it, it, I understand Dax cut a promo off the air after the show saying, well, if it wasn't for AEW, I wouldn't be spending time with my family. I mean, okay. I'm not sure that's a defense for the place that everybody wants to go and work with their friends and have fun. But the point, I said, they are, they're divining themselves. And divining yourself is a phrase that I coined in TNA back in 2006, 2007, whatever it was. It's to unnecessarily, through your own mouth call attention to bad shit about you that a lot of people may not have heard and except you brought it up or stooging yourself is what it could be shorter for for those of you smart to the wrestling lingo and do you remember johnny divine he was the one of the canadian guys was with scott demore's canadian group i remember the name more than i remember the actual wrestler but i remember uh, well, the name. Nice guy and, and a good good worker and etc. But it was the night the TNA pay per view that Scott Hall no showed and Kevin Nash and Samoa Joe got in a fight. And when I say fight, a very sharp, loud, profane, pointed, 
verbal confrontation and I think Nash pie face Joe and it was in front of a lot of the guys and that fucking the, the trailers that served as locker rooms it, because Hall had no showed the tag match main event of the pay-per-view surprise surprise and Joe was supposed to give a a promo at the start explaining why that whatever the reason was it was going to be changed to whoever the fuck was in it right and in the process of doing that, Joe pissed off because his fucking guy no showed what it was. It, again, these young guys were doing the work and carrying this thing, and it was the impression that the WWE guys just came in, made the money, jacked off, vacation, whatever. There's something to that, but nevertheless, Joe gets fucking pointed on a promo about Hall at the start and pisses Nash off without even, I think, really knowing that he had done that. He was just venting at the guy that no showed the pay per view and fucked his match up. And then afterwards, Nash goes in, starts cutting a promo on Joe, and that's that it gets heated and ugly or whatever. So the next day, at TV, they call a meeting because Joe does, Samoa Joe prides himself on being not only a professional, but an adult and conducting himself in a certain manner. And he felt he wanted to apologize not only to Nash for things he had said, but also in, in front of the, the, the company and the group, the boys. And, you know, for his behavior in that setting. And every, from Dixie was there on down, Jeff and Dutch, and then, uh, you know, uh, the producers, the referees, all the wrestlers, Joe stands up, gives a very impassioned apology to everybody for conducting himself in that manner. He's a professional, and he doesn't want to set a bad example for that. Very well received. They gave him a round of applause. I think Dixie gave him a hug. And and the meeting was over, right? And suddenly, swept up in the fucking emotion of this cathartic, soul-bearing journey that Joe had taken us on, or maybe just seeing, well, he got a round of applause. Maybe I can, yeah, you know, I don't know what was going through his head. Johnny Devine stands up and raises his hand. Uh, but I'd just like to apologize for my behavior also. Oh, my God. Fast forward, re rewind to the previous night, right after this fucking pay-per-view, Hall no-shows, main events, chaos afterwards, me and Dutch are always the last ones out of there. I've, got, I've taken a shower because it's always fucking hot in Orlando, whatever the fuck. It's like one o'clock in the morning now, and I've got to eat. I'm going to Wendy's. And I, as I go down in the elevator at the Double Tree, and I come out of the elevator, there in the lobby is Dutch Mantell talking to two or three uniformed police officers. First time I've ever seen uniformed police officers in the lobby of the Double Tree in Orlando, so I know it's not just a chance meeting. I duck behind one of the columns because I want to see what's going on, but I don't want them to see me. I don't want to be called over for conversation here, but if Dutch breaks and runs for it, I got the car keys in my fucking pocket and I'll scream Dutch this way. But they're just, it's obvious. It's not a confrontational conversation. They're talking. So I'm thinking, ah, oh, there's some trouble with one of the boys and Dutch is finding out what's going on because he's the, the representative here, I'm sure Shitstain was asleep in his bed somewhere, potentially about to wet it, uh, dreaming of, you know, writing his TV the next day. So I go on to Wendy's because I'm hungry. And when I come back, there's no cops there. Okay. So the next morning I picked, I'm meeting Dutch in the lobby and I get the story. What did that Johnny Devine had gotten out earlier, whatever the previous night, and they they put the the main event guys and the main event office people in the double tree, but they put the underneath guys over at the down the over around the corner at the Holiday Inn Express. Johnny Devine has gone into the Holiday Inn Express, and it, the lobby is like the size of my bathroom, right? It's a night, it's a little fucking. And somehow he's made enough of a stink about something to the front desk girl that he, she's not only, he's made her cry, but also the police have been called because he was pitching a fit and don't you know who I am. And then they, the police have been directed to his 
supervisor over at the double tree where Dutch could try to talk him down. I think maybe he had come over that direction and they had followed him over there. So anyway, the point is it wasn't a big goddamn deal. No one was injured. They, he offended the girl at the desk and was told in no uncertain terms to apologize and wasn't going to get TNA kicked out of the Holiday Inn Express. Dixie didn't know any of this happened, right? She was, He stood up, he said, I just also like to apologize for my behavior. And you saw Dixie turn to Jeff, like, what behavior? <laughs> and I really, I, I shouldn't have conducted myself that way also, and I wouldn't mean to bring any shame or embarrassment on the company. And again, you see her turn, what shame? What embarrassment? <laughs> <laughs> and he apologized to everybody and he's standing there waiting for the fucking round of applause that doesn't come because everybody's buried their face in their hands like you fucking idiot you've just stooged yourself we half the boys didn't really know about it and and it didn't go any farther i think dutch told jeff and jeff wasn't going to tell dixie and then the meeting broke up and and you know, you remember you said you remember Johnny Devine's name? I don't think he's wrestled in the United States since then. Oh no, really? I mean, no, I, I he wasn't there long after that, and I hadn't seen or heard of his name in a long. Johnny Devine, are you out there? I liked him; he's a good kid. But goddamn, that was hilarious. After, especially, it was like trying to follow the Gettysburg Address with a goddamn C-SPAN fucking speech. And he, and again, he, he stooged his own self for something that had already been covered, covered and dealt with. And it all ties back to AEW because if you're an AEW fan or just a wrestling fan and you have not watched the CM Punk interview or read wrestling newsletters or anything or websites, yes. you have no idea what's going on. And all of a sudden these wrestlers are like, I'll get back to the wrestling in a moment. I want to tell you how happy I am to be here and why you should all be happy that I'm here. <laughs> They're jumping up and down, calling a attention to something that maybe just could have blown over if they just give it a week or two and go on about their business. But they had to jump in. And and when your whole thing is, you know, don't say anything bad about Tony. You got to love it here because they pay me and give me the right to feed my family. You know what? You could say it about any boss at any job <laughs> anywhere in the world. Don't say anything bad about Mr. Smithers. He may torture people, but because of him, I can put food on the table for my family. Yes, it, it, they, it, they eat only the finest gruel. Farm-to-table gruel. Well, let's talk about farm-to-table gruel. <laughs> AEW Dynamite in Worcester, Massachusetts. Worcester, by the way, do we have, before we get to the numbers, do we have a crowd? Did anybody even ever, was there a crowd there? Actually, I do have Have something here, uh, and this is... uh, Was this the uh, Worcester, was this the, what's the name of the building there? The DCU Center. Center. The DCU Center is what it says here. That's one of those new places they've built in the last 40 or 50 years. I haven't seen those. Well, I have information here from WrestleNomics as well as WrestleTix, and the last three shows in the market... Uh, for both companies, April 15th, 2022, SmackDown, 6,738. 72722 for Dynamite, 6,143. Comparable. October 2022 for SmackDown, once again, 6,261. About the same thing they'd done before. And AEW Dynamite, April 3rd, 2024, 3,252. Ouch! All in the same building. About half of what they did before. Yeah. Okie dokie. Well, what, what's the number? Certainly they're, they're up this week with the appearance of Will Ostrich and Mercedes Moan. And who's that? Oh, Okada went back to Japan. So he's collecting whatever. If he's a couple million dollars, he's collecting 50 or 100 grand a week to stay home. Well, you can't blame him. That was the <laughs> that was the offer that Tony said. He goes, I can go work for WWE and move to Florida, or Tony will give me all this money. I got to fly to Japan for a month. <laughs> Jim, and there's a truck or something in the background. It'll pass. AEW Dynamite on TBS Wednesday, April 3rd, 2024, 8 to 10.05 p.m. On average, 752,000 viewers. Oh, boy, howdy. What? What happened there? 
Uh, and for the record, this is up 1% from last week, which was 747,000. And it is 4% under the trailing four week average of 781. Everything is trending down the crowds, the ratings, everything. So that was not an anomaly last week. It's the, it's the start of a, uh, a fashion trend. Let's not watch AEW. Well, Jim, let's go to these trends right here. Yeah, but did, did they start lower? Did they start significant? Did the, did the air come out of the Big Bang? I would have to double check. I almost think it may have been around where they started last week, but you may remember better. Quarter 1, 8 to 8.15 p.m. These are compiled by WrestleNomics. The Adam Copeland Live Raw Raw promo, followed by Powerhouse Hobbs versus Will Ospreay. 933,000 viewers. That's about where they started. Uh, well, that's about where they've started uh, numerous weeks and still stayed above eight. Quarter two, eight fifteen, eight thirty p.m. The continuation of Hobbs versus Osprey with picture-in-picture picture ads, and the post-match with Don Callis, followed by an ad break. Seven hundred and sixty-one thousand viewers. Oh, there's what's gonna happen. That's not normal. Um. I can't do this math. 130, 160. Wait a minute. Uh, 139 and 33 is 172. 172,000 people after the first 15 minutes. You have to think, even if you were tuning in, that edge speech may have run some people off just because what it went on for a while and what was it? It went nowhere. It, it was frantic almost kind of uh, panicked please don't pay attention to the burning deck of the ship it almost was like a plead for people to please come on come on i'm here you like me that's i'm just i'm telling you so that and and will osprey uh eh. and by the way tony khan was asked today on the media call for the uh for for something or other about the cm punk comments he won't comment on it so he can't comment on the comments? No, he can comment. Tony is scared to comment on anything that doesn't portray everything in a glowing light, and it's hard to do that when someone else is telling the truth. Jim Quarter 3, 8.30 to 8.45 p.m. Brian Danielson versus Lance Archer with Picture in Picture. 756,000 viewers. Oh. It, Brian Danielson's one of their big names, but... No, he's not. It, well, <laughs> on he paper, used to he, be. Should, he should be. They booked him like shit, and now he's meaningless. Now he just works long competitive matches with everyone. So Brian Danielson means less than he ever did before in AEW as far as being a draw, because you've seen it all already. Remember when he was given those great live interviews in the ring, and we were like, oh, that's. And you'd never hear him speak unless it's a pre-tape or you know he did those great interviews for a few weeks and then he disappeared and then he was a baby face and then he put him with the blackpool combat club and that was it he's just been in limbo ever since nothing happening quarter four eight forty five to nine p.m the ending of danielson versus archer an ad break the chris jericho hook ramp promo <sighs> the shane taylor promotions backstage promo and the start of billy gunn versus jay white Seven hundred and forty-three thousand viewers. Ooh, so we've what we've done here is we've lost a hundred and ninety, right? Nine thirty-three to seven forty-three. One hundred ninety thousand people in one hour. That's right. And again, a lot of people are telling Tony that nothing's being done wrong. Ratings are down for everyone. Don't worry about it. They're not helping Tony. They're denying the reality, which is he's doing a horrible job as being a promoter and a booker right now. Quarter five, the big nine o'clock hour, nine to nine fifteen p.m. The continuation of Gun versus White. <laughs> it was that. Was that a continuation or was it a fucking evisceration? I've never seen a motherfucker get beat so bad. He was beaten like he owed Billy Gun trans. Well, it also had picture in picture ads, and then a post match with the guns, the acclaimed. Uh, or just that, the guns and the acclaimed. The Young Bucks' best friend's backstage angle, followed by Willow Nightingale's ramp promo. You know, I thankfully, I believe I zipped through that. I saw them and didn't bother to watch it. Yeah, I must have missed that too. I don't remember what that is. But then the, the uh, beginning of the Nightingale promo on the ramp, 780,000 viewers. So, okay, so they picked up 37,000 at the top of the hour. 
brand new shot at retaining these people, yeah. new viewers. Let's see what they and then, what they do from here. And how would you run off the audience if you had if someone said, Jim, run off the audience as quick as you can? You put the women and the young bucks out there. And that's what they did. Quarter six, 9.15 and 9.30 p.m., the continuation and the uh, appearance of Mercedes Monet during the Nightingale Stokely Hathaway Statlander ramp promo and ad break and the start of the Young Bucks versus Orange Cassidy and Trent Beretta with picture in picture, 697,000 viewers. Oh, my God. You know... <sighs> I mean, it's hard to deny that the buckaroos are a ratings drop, and it's hard to deny that the general women's segment and the second part of the show is a ratings drop, but when you put those two factors together, they're unstoppable. I mean, people can't... St you, you could tie people to the fucking television, they wouldn't stay. This is only going to get worse. <laughs> For those who don't realize it, the more you put the bucks out there, they're not going to ever cause more people to tune in. They chase people away. The women's division, the same thing. Jim Quarter 7, 9.30 to 9.45 p.m. The continuation of the Young Bucks versus Cassidy and Beretta, the post-match with Chuck Taylor, an ad break, and the start of Thunder Rosa versus Mariah May, 711,000 viewers. So they got back 14,000. So, you know, should we give them a round of applause for that? Probably. They're, they're, they're 222,000 down for the show. But wait, there's more. <clears throat> Quarter eight, and I remind you, we have a five, uh, it says here six minutes, it said hope before five, but a six minute overrun. Quarter eight, 945 to 10 p.m. The continuation of Rosa versus May with picture and picture ads. Penta El Zero Miedo's backstage promo. And the start of the Swerve Strickland Samoa Joe Live contract signing for the main event of the upcoming pay per view. 655,000 viewers, <laughs> as well as the low in the key demo of 278,000 viewers. Six minute overrun, continuation of the angle, 708,000 viewers. Oh boy, howdy. So, in regulation, not counting overtime, they lost 278,000 viewers from the start. Is that what, uh, did I do that math right? Well, taking out the first quarter and the overrun, 729,000 is the average. So that's their new, uh, their new base audience this week is 729, taking out the artificial insemination of the beginning and the, and the overrun at the end. You know, one or two things, because it's not, you know, just two things being equal because of the differences in the shows and differences in the audiences, but NXT is one or two things away from passing AEW Dynamite in the ratings. You know, they're always in the sixes. AEW is coming to there to meet them. AEW Dynamite's ratings are coming to meet Rampage and Collision. Wait. You know what? That is actually a, a wonderful olive branch for AEW to offer. Hey, we'll meet you in the middle. <laughs> if you can't get any more viewers, we'll run some of ours off. That way it's more competitive. Listen, no star power. I think Will Ospreay, who I've enjoyed in the ring, and I think the fans like him on the promos, I think he can be a star. He has not been presented well as a star in AEW so far. Adam Copeland? Again, he returned to WWE. They thought we have another main eventer coming back in Edge. The fans really didn't see him that way. And now he's in AEW. The enthusiasm's obviously down. And he gave just a rambling, sweaty, you know, almost like, you know, he's, he couldn't think of what to say. And the mic started going dead. Just that segment was death. Danielson means nothing right now. The BCC and the booking have killed Danielson. Billy Gunn versus Jay White was the nine o'clock hour match. <laughs> Someone just said. That, well, the nine o'clock hour was the biggest quarter it, it number except for the, the open. It was. And to see Billy Gunn beat the complete teetotal shit out of. Chris Jericho's dead on arrival right now. They're going to drag Hook right down with him. There's nothing they could do that will repair that. The women's division, they spend whatever amount of money on Mercedes Mer Monet. Mer 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 <laughs> Mercedes she Mermaid. F.W. Murnau's third wife. Mercedes Mermaid. And, uh, 
They spent all this money. People are like, oh, they'll give more time to the women's division now. Why would you? Why would you? Why would you put more time into something that always makes people leave the TV? Well, she can't fill two minutes of time without going blank. Uh, speaking, why would you give her more time? How far is Boston from Worcester? Oh God, nothing as far from. Uh, is it? Is that the one that's like uh, Springfield is fifty miles or whatever? Well, it's not that far. Nothing's that far up there. Just like because it they, is in normal states. They drew that good house in Boston for her debut. They're in Massachusetts. You would think there'd be some kind of rollover or something. Well, well, it, four it, weeks ago. Well, but wait a minute. That was her debut, and it was in her hometown. Have you been Boston traffic? Not a lot of people in Boston are going to Worcester to see their goddamn kids graduate college much less to see Mercedes come out and moan again. But uh, so I don't expect a lot of crossover there, but what reason? I bet people in Boston, except if they don't watch the TV, they didn't even know this show was taking place because of their promotional efforts or lack thereof for the live event portion of these things. Then you got the Bucks versus best friends. The Bucks are dead. The Bucks drive viewers away. The Bucks cause people not to want to watch the show. Now, wait a minute. Do not single them out when everything you just said applies to the Puddin' Gang, too. Well, you know what? I don't Be even fair. think... I don't think it applies to the Puddin' Gang because I think they're not entities. Orange Cassidy is different than the rest of them because he's been pushed all over the TV. The other two are just bodies that are there. Orange Cassidy, even if you're a fan of his... I'll give it to you, even if you're a fan of his. The law of diminishing returns. Why would anyone after five years still want to see this guy? They don't. The women's match. And then Swerve and Samoa Joe's angle. Swerve was the hottest babyface in the company a few weeks ago. Does it still feel that way? Does it still feel that well, way to you? That he's the hottest babyface and the one person there who has something happening. Something going I on. I love the idea of doing an angle at the contract signing to heat up the pay-per-view main event, but at the same time, again, like we said earlier, when he gets beat up and bloodied and then gets up defiant, signs a contract in his, in his own blood, and then the heel comes in and just lays him out again, they went one step too far. That's how they cool people off. And that's AEW Dynamite. So where's the star power that's going to help them? Where? John Moxley's been off TV for a while. He'll probably reappear after the tournament. That's not going to help anymore. Those days of Moxley really being a help and a mover are done. MJF? If done right, an MJF return could mean a lot. Here's the problem. Who's he going to work with? Who? You got Adam Cole. He's still getting ready to come back. Nobody wants to see Adam Cole ever again at this point in time. It's that's a, a tragedy how they presented him and that whole black scorpion fiasco. Kenny Omega. They brought up his name on the last several episodes. Kenny Omega is one of their top guys in the history of their company. And now we're hearing that he is probably going to have an operation on his intestines. He ain't coming back anytime soon. Abushi, He's been a non-entity <laughs> in AEW. Can't Wait a minute. Him. No, no. Remember he's comfortably laid up with double ankle surgery. Right, and I was going to be out for at least a year. Well, he's not going to be there for a long time. But even before that, my point was he was a non-entity. They signed him and made a big deal out of him. He looked awful in the ring and the fans didn't care. Tony's now saying he's going to be in there with every free agent that becomes available. <laughs> All he could do is throw money at them because if you want to be treated seriously, if you want good booking, if you want structure, if you want the ability to rise up, momentum to be captured, what show do you want to be on right now? You know, there are two ships that go in different ways. I, you know, bad. It, didn't, Just bad. it didn't have to be this way. All he had to do was recognize that you can finance whatever you want and be a hero if you don't sabotage it at the same time by doing multiple things that you don't have the experience or the capability for. There's a difference on it. And impressing your friends with your e-fed booking and doing a national tv show in an nba arena fuck how did anybody not see this from the god that's that is what i saw from the start and nobody believed me and 150 million dollars or so will delay the inevitable for some time but it's still a guy that won't listen because he thinks he's an expert and has never done this before and shows no 
capability to learn if anybody's there to teach him or if he gets to be petulant if anybody criticizes it or just if he doesn't listen. See, that's the problem right there. The people that Tony turns to, the people that he wants to hear advice from, the people that he's been reading for a long time that he turns to to hear what they say, none of them have helped him. Because, again, if you're pretending that Tony could fix things and that the problems aren't Tony, if you can't acknowledge all the real issues, you're part of the problem. And these are the people Tony turns to. Tony wants to hear what Meltzer is going to say or how Meltzer is going to word things or all these things, and then he runs with it. Meanwhile, look at the Observer. You want to talk about out of touch? The Observer is a dying thing. People don't talk about it. People don't subscribe to it the same way they used to. Well, and it, it, it's, Dave has to blame himself because of his behavior over the last few years and just this ridiculousness of defending, you know, Mount defending Surabachi the person who he has access to. All, defending yes. the person he has access to. That's what it is. That's what it is. It's dishonest. And it's been wrong. And Tony's problems are his own fault, but it's also the fault of the people that he's been listening to who won't just tell him that he's not good at this. Those are the ratings. This was the drive through. Any closing words? Yes. I would like to have a lot of money to work very little and spend almost all of my time at home with my family. Wait a minute. I already do. I didn't even have to take a job with Tony. That's right. You have the Tony Khan plan, but without the uh, benefits of... Uh, without the Tony Khan. Without the Tony Khan. Well, so I'm good over here. How about you? I'm good over here, and we got a lot of audio to do and a lot of editing and a lot of things happening, so we're going to wrap this up pretty quickly. This has been the drive through We'll be back on the experience. WrestleMania reviews coming for Jim Cornette. I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho! Ouch!